Good morning. Good morning. Testing. Morning. Um, sorry for the delay in our meeting start, but it is 9.05 and we will call um, our, our November 16th through 17th, 2022 board meeting to order. If you would all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, agenda item one is to review and approve the agenda. Are there any comments that it's the agenda? Director Mitchell? Um, yes, I would propose that we move um, agenda item 5A. Um, you all know that we just sent that out. The, that's the financial projections and cash management report to the end of today. Um, and then um, I would also like to make a suggestion uh, on agenda item 15B, number seven, regarding um, the Arkansas Valley conduit. Uh, and um, with Southeastern Colorado Water Conservancy District, um, those the the project proponent is able to attend today um, rather than tomorrow. So I would actually suggest that we move that item um, because it is so important. I think it's important to hear from from um, Southeastern um, to after agenda item six today. Okay, Madam Chair. Yes. May I just clarify? I thought it was consent agenda 5A. Oh, excuse me. Not, sorry. Okay. Yes. My bad. Yes. Thank you. So I think we'll be moving consent agenda 5A to the end of the day, not regular agenda item 5A. So the technical assistance for federal cost share grant? Yes. Okay. Sorry. No, Jen. thank you. So that'll still be on the consent agenda, but it'll be moved to the end of the day. Okay. I think just 5A is being moved to the end of the day. Thank you. Okay, my bad. Anything else? Seeing none, uh, we will, I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda as edited. Hello. Director Sakata, thank you. Director Anderson with a second, thank you. Any discussion? Uh, we have a motion to approve the agenda uh, as edited. Why can I not think of a better word than that right now? <laughs> Um, all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, please indicate by saying nay. Motion carries. Thank you. Agenda item two, review and approve the September 20th and 21st board meeting minutes. Any comments? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion. Director Anderson, thank you. Thank you. Director Bruchet with the second. Thank you. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, please indicate by saying nay. Thank you. Uh, we are now on to the consent agenda, item three. We have um, already moved agenda consent agenda item 5A to the end of the day. Uh, so that is off the agenda for this item. Any other comments, edits? Okay, seeing none. Is there a motion? Thank you, Director Felt. Amended was the word I was looking for earlier. Um, second. Director Bruchet, thank you. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, please indicate by saying nay. And the motion carries, thank you. Uh, board meeting dates in 2023. Any comments, Director Mitchell, on this or is just purely informational? Uh, that is purely informational at this point. Okay, <clears throat> moving along. Uh, we'll start with Director Gibbs for number four, agenda item four, excuse me, director's reports. Welcome, Director Gibbs. Thanks for coming. Yeah, great. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Great to see everyone. And um, Director Brody, thanks so much for hosting us here at Denver Water. It's a really amazing facility. I was here, I want to say it was last year when Secretary Holland visit, visited and um, really extraordinary complex. So thanks for hosting us, really great. Um, so first of all, um, how many of you are relieved that the election season's over, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> well, in some respects. <laughs> But um, but with that, um, we, um, you know, I know who my boss is and, and I just, uh, I also, yeah, I'm happy to share good news too. The governor asked me to stay on and, uh, as the DNR director. So I'm really, yeah, thank you. I'm really, um, really excited about that. And as you all know, my position's at will. So you just never know, but I feel like we're doing great work all together. And you as board members are really doing amazing work and and you and your individual capacities are doing great work as well so i'm excited to get to stay on and a lot of challenges ahead you know obviously with with water wildlife parks oil and gas um, the dnr is involved with so many different aspects of of what i think uh when people think of colorado they they think of right um our, our natural resources in so many ways so um so thinking of of moving forward the governor uh, in November uh, announced uh, the budget, which includes really amazing historical um, resources for, for water. And just yesterday, the governor presented the budget to the Joint Budget Committee. And within that committee, I don't know if you saw, but you have a lot of new members there. And I think the only maybe returning member is Senator Rankin. Everyone else is, is new. Um, and so that meeting went quite well. Um, but you all know that the Colorado River system is really facing many challenges due to dwindling water supply and um, some of the worst drought in, in history ever recorded. So stakes are high. So I want to just highlight a one key element of the governor's budget, and that's um, to request 13.9 FTE uh, to allow the DNR to establish a Colorado River policy and technical support team positions that would be housed within CDBCB, Division of Water Resources, and the DNR. Um, so while these requested FTEs are embedded within their respective divisions, their collective body of work would contribute to the common mission to meet Colorado's interstate obligations while advancing its position on Colorado River. Um, the most notable um, change of this creation is creating a full-time Upper Colorado River Commission position as well as a Colorado River communication specialist. Those two positions would be housed within the executive director's um, office, so within my shop. Um, separating the role of CBCB director position would allow um, the, the commissioner, and we'll just name Becky, <laughs> to, to focus all of her time on the responsibilities of, 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 of leading Colorado River issues, being the lead negotiator of the state. This would also allow a CDBCB director um, to focus full time on running the agency, implementing the water plan, setting policy direction, uh, working closely, obviously, with you as CDBCB board members. Um, so, um, also, I'll just say that this commissioner position that would be um, not really kind of created, but it's 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 more or less. Um, I'm trying to think how to describe it, but it's um, more or less created within within the EDO office would ensure you know, direct communication between the commissioner, myself, and the governor, as well as um, ensuring that there's coordination between all the different departments within uh, the Department of Natural Resources. So in my opinion, this is really elevating Becky's position right now, recognizing that stakes are extremely high, uh, especially with Colorado River, and, and creating the, the best support team that she can have the most success um, and, and just you know, more or less creating, I like to say, almost like a Navy SEALs of the water world uh, that Becky is, um, <laughs> but but a total support network that, that helps, you know, give her all the support she needs to make sure that Colorado is positioned in the best um, available way. As you all know, I think Becky was originally appointed by the governor on August 2019, and she just does an amazing job. It's really, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about our lower basin tour, but it, it was Really, it's always great to hear such positive feedback um, that she does. So, so that work will obviously uh, continue. Uh, the communication specialist within that um, is really a great. We're seeing more and more need on, you know, whether it's statewide or national 
uh, communications coordination with intrastate stakeholders and partners. Um, as you all know, you know, everyone's asking what's going on with Colorado River issues, and this key like comms person would um, help support Becky, um, but also be the lead person on everything Colorado River, um, which I think is is really exciting and and very much needed. The request also includes for FTE for the CDBCB um, interstate federal water and information section, including a federal policy and legal specialist, two technical modeling positions and administrative support, um, which is much needed to help support Becky, Amy and the whole CDBCB interstate team. It also includes um, 8.5 FTE for the Division of Water Resources, which is always needed in Kevin's shop, um, especially since they're general funded, um, they're not cash funded. So, you know, when there's hits to the budget, unfortunately, we always have to look to Kevin to say, you know, hey, how can we cut this or that, which has always been challenging for you and your staff. So thank you so much, Kevin. But um, we recognized, um, you know, since I've been in this role that that he needs more help. And so this will help. So two FTE for the, the river operations coordinators for divisions five and six. 4.5 FTE for um, hydrographers um, to operate the growing number of stream gauges and measurement devices in divisions four, five, and six. One FTE for GIS specialists to keep pace with the GIS data and modeling needs related to Colorado River water users in the state. One FTE for a program management support for the state engineer and deputy engineers. Um, and then additional um, items that I think I want to share with you too that are you know water related but separate from this Colorado River package is five million of general fund to add to the 12.6 million expected through sports betting so that was through DD and so that brings for water plant implementation grant program a total of 17.6 million dollars and then um, you all know you know when you look at um, water plant grant programs just the 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 4x return that we see um, locally is just amazing. So every dollar into the water plant grant program normally leads a, a 4x return on investment. And the fiscal year 21-22 CBCB awarded 23.5 million in grants that supported projects totaling 107.7 million dollars of total cost. So that's pretty amazing to see. Um, additionally, this budget includes one FTE for the CDBCB um, water plan data and mapping specialists to increase scientific ex expertise in water resources management to further conservation, agriculture, and equity in prescribed, um, as prescribed in the water plan. Um, so actually, before I move on to other key components uh, of the budget, I just want to see if there's any you know, questions on um, the, the budget in terms of water, because because there's other items in terms of our, our co swap program and so forth. So, uh, um, thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for your report uh, so far, at least. Yes, and yes. Um, I will say I'm really pleased to see um, the governor's desire to invest in this area. I think I, I don't want to presume to speak for everyone, but I, I would think we would all um, agree with the need to invest in this area and pleased to see the governor wanting to put more resources in. The, the one question I would have is how do we maintain that close coordination um, with these separate roles and I'm um, short of, you know, cloning Becky. Yeah. <laughs> I could imagine that being a challenge. We've been, I think, really fortunate to have Becky um, willing to serve in, in these dual capacities um, and I I recognize that's taken, you know, an incredible amount of time and Herculean efforts on her part. Um, but I do think that there has been some benefit uh, to having that that close coordination um, between the commissioner role and the CWCB staff and board. And I'd just like to hear your thoughts on how to how to maintain that. Yeah, um, that's a great question. And I think that's extremely important to make sure that that continues in the fashion that has continued. Um, so, you know, I, I expect Becky to be a participant in CDBCB, you know, board meetings in the future. Um, there's there's a long way to go too. I just wanna share with everyone. So this is just the, the start of the budget process. There'll be deliber del del deliberations and discussions at the state capitol. And then the, the budget really doesn't, the funding mechanism really doesn't start till, um, till summertime, July 1st. 
Um, so there's definitely some time, but um, I would expect Becky to participate in executive sessions. Um, uh, I, don't, I don't know, we can discuss, you know, maybe maybe having a seat at the table to ex officio role as well, uh, maybe non-voting, but um, it's really important to have that linkage for sure, and that's not going to go away. Yeah, but yeah. thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. yeah, Robert. Thank you. Thanks. I'm Dr. Dibbs. Um, first, I want to take first dibs on Becky's clones if she does take it. <laughs> <laughs> I know she's had to have a bunch of clones with everything that she's doing, and really thanks to all the CWCB staff, because I know it's been an, all, an extra load for everybody, so thanks to everybody. And thanks also, too, for your clarification on uh, Division of Water Resources, FTE, because I think that there was some concern expressed in our Basin Roundtable about, you know, we appreciate the fact that a lot of tension has to be on the Colorado River, but, you know, as the South Platte is so overappropriated that we really see the need of the Division of Water Resources needing to get staffed up across the state. So thank you for that clarification in that area. Yeah. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah, and as I mentioned, this is really the start of the process, and I'm happy to have side conversations with any of you, too, and kind of talk more in detail. I do want to say, too, it's um, the budget, you all play such a critical role with, with CBCB, and I know some of you probably feel like, wait a second, these are big deals, you know, for CBCB, and it is, and for Division of Water Resources and water in general. But when the budget is is um, kind of developed, it's very um, there's only a few folks really that are part of that process, and, and it doesn't go live to even like really close stakeholders like you all until the governor presents it, um, and then and then now you know obviously uh, since yesterday the governor presented it to the J joint budget committee. Now that's really the time when I think when a lot of people will you know dig a little bit deeper to figure out hey what does this really mean, but. Um, you know, I uh, if I had a magic wand, I would have loved to give you all individual calls to kind of talk more in detail about what this looks like, but I just can't. Um, it's just the rules. <laughs> but. Thank you. Any other questions? And you still have more of your yeah. Report, if I could correct? just yeah yeah, yeah thank you thank you, Madam Chair. Um, let's see here a few other items I want to share with you. The budget also includes a wildfire package. That includes five additional million dollars for the COSWAP program. I think you've all heard me talk about that. That's a Colorado Strategic Wildfire Action Program. It also includes four million dollars to support the public outreach efforts for the fire smart building practices, mitigation efforts, and home hardening initiatives. So that's really encouraging and providing some resources to um, to homeowners to really look at, um, for example, replacing uh, wood, sh wood shake shingle roofs to, to have class A roofing, you know, stuff like that. And, you know, as I mentioned that uh, the budget will, will really not, um, you know, it's a long process and the funding wouldn't become available until July 1st, 2023. So let me just move on a, a few other items here. And, and again, I'm happy to discuss, you know, larger items of the budget in particular, you know, if you're curious about oil and gas or parks and wildlife, but it, it's actually one of the most significant historic budgets for the Department of Natural Resources ever this year. So really exciting to be sitting here and uh, at this time that we're really creating some amazing initiatives in the Department of Natural Resources. Um, with some of you, what, a couple of weeks ago, we were down on the Lower Basin Tour. I know some of you will probably share that on your updates tomorrow, but since I have the mic, I just want to share how wonderful it was. As you all know, my life in particular, sometimes I'm coming and going so often, and to be able to spend, you know, three full days immersed uh, learning from, from folks, uh, being with the folks uh, that were there was, was very special, to say the least. And... I'm a visual learner, experiential learner, so I remember when I first got this job, and that was, you know, when there were still discussions on whether or not, you know, the DCP was going to pass Congress, and I remember hearing about, you know, lower basin issues and the Imperial Irrigation District and Metropolitan, all these big players down the lower basin, and, and actually um, now be able to, like, be down there and, and meet some of the key players and just kind of see on the ground, uh, it was invaluable for me and and which is really special to, to spend some time with with you all that were able to go on that trip so um really enjoyed that and then also on a side note that was really kind of cool to to meet barbara o'brien the former lieutenant governor's um brother who is doing just really amazing 
uh, innovative work on drip irrigation. He uses um, Netafin, which is a company based out of Israel. And that was kind of cool to see that, I thought. So, uh, next, I want to move over to updates on IBCC. And for the folks that were able to make that, our last meeting was October 25th in Winter Park. It was at the Headwater Center, which if you haven't been there, uh, it, definitely visit, it's really amazing. We welcomed our new member of IBCC, Ernest House Jr., who replaced Paul um, and uh, as a governor appointee. And the IBCC discussed a range of topics, um, including uh, creative solutions to building capacity in each basin. Uh, we, we heard from folks on a panel. We heard from uh, Greg Peterson from the Colorado Ag Water Alliance. We heard from Carol Acarius, Arkansas River Headwaters Collaborative, and CDBCB's own Heather Dutton, who uh, each kind of spoke about some of the challenges and opportunities and helped building momentum and getting important work done in their uh, respective areas. I thought that was really, um, really great to hear. We also had some, some good conversations about IBCC's work moving forward, um, really encouraging this momentum where I've challenged all the IBCC members to really look at moving one project forward um, through to the grant making process. And so it was, it was great to hear kind of the progress that's, that's going on with that. And I've tried to stress like, you know, those folks as IBCC members, you know, they're, they're elected, uh, most of them, unless you're a governor appointee, they're respected in their basins. And to have them really take a lead on getting projects, you know, off the ground is, um, is very important to say the least. We uh, also landed on some future dates for IBCC meetings next year, and those dates will be February 15th, 2023, June 8th, 2023, and October 17th, also, of course, 2023. We're working on um, getting those locations set up. A couple more updates. Um, as many of you may be aware, um, CPW's Director Dan Prinzler retired, effective November 1st. Moving forward, Heather Dutton will continue as acting director until a new director. <laughs> oh, I was, oh, excuse me, Heather, Heather Dugan. <laughs> Heather Dutton. <laughs> Heather Dugan, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> for folks that are online, I'm right across from Heather Dutton, so I looked up at Heather, and yeah, but Heather Dugan um, will continue as acting director for CDBCB until that director position is held. Uh, we're also working collaboratively with the Parks and Wildlife Commission on that um, hiring process moving forward, and we'll let you all know once, once that's announced. So with that, I think that's it for me for right now, and happy to answer any questions or or not thank you director gibbs and thank you for all the work that you've done and your leadership over the the new positions and the budget we appreciate it and congratulations <laughs> <laughs> normally you're not great at keeping secrets uh, yeah. i mean this was a big one to keep <laughs> just kidding congratulations to heather dugan on that acting role uh, we'll move forward to direct, is it you, Director yeah. Mitchell, is it your turn? Yes. All right. All right, thank you. Another board meeting and um, thank you to Jessica Brody, or Director Brody for, for hosting us here. I, am, I love the building and, um, and you've made it easy. So Iola has given a good report out. So plan on more meetings at Denver Water at some point. Um, I wanna do a few updates and highlight some of the, the big things that are obviously happen, happening in the agency. Um, I say this frequently, but I wanna make sure to say it again, um, not just for the board, but um, for those folks online or listening now or listening later. Um, when you look at uh, the board agenda, there is a link that talks about um, the director's report. And Anna puts that together, Anna's sitting back over there, and um, she she's really the one that does the heavy lifting of coordinating um, what all the sections in uh, the agency are doing. And 
when we talk about these board meetings, they're two days and they're they're full of um, a lot of good news, some rough discussions, but there's so much day-to-day -day work that happens in the agency and that director's report really captures a lot of that and, and focuses on all the work within the agency. The, the amount of conservation work that's happening, um, land and water nexus work, um, the flood, the work that's happening on the, the flood section, um, the in-stream flow section, things that may not be on the agenda really capture our day to day. Um, our work is not just about working to the next meeting and and presenting, but our, our work is every day. And um, I think it's important to focus that this the agency, the staff of the agency really feel like they are part of the stewardship of of Colorado's water future. And the work that we do is really fulfilling that mission. And so I don't think that it's just light reading and fun. I really think that it's important and um, staff names are associated with that. And so often you don't see the people in this room that are, are doing the things that we do every day. So much of it is working with the legislature, working on budget stuff, um, but it is on the ground, um, working with people that are, are doing projects on the ground and those connections are made by the staff that you see in that director's report. So I wanna make sure that we highlight how important that is because the really big stuff rises to the board me to the board meetings where we need approval, but so much happens on the day to day. So, speaking of really big stuff, the water plan update. Um, uh, you all know the water supply planning section has been working um, day and night on this alongside with with you all, and and I, I um, appreciate the efforts that the board has put in to um, really looking at the input from the, the water plan. I also wanna recognize that um, the water plan is really the state's water plan. This isn't just about CWCB, it's not about staff, it's not about the board, it's about um, really the greater vision for the state. And, um, and that's always been the intention of the water plan. Um, and that will continue to be the intention that no one person owns this. Um, it is really the, the push to, to move Colorado um, into the, to where we need to be. So, um, but staff are really responsible for fulfilling that, right? And so they're working through the 500 plus pages um, uh, of and 2000 observations that have come from the public. Um, sometimes separating the statements from questions is a bit of an art, but they they have really, um, I think, mastered that art and and are dialing in on some of those suggestions. Um, there, there are things that, that we cannot do, but there are many things that we can, and I think we focus on what we can do. Um, and I, I think that, they're still working on the remaining things. I think we all know that you don't write at this speed without some typos here or there, and um, and maybe there's some needs for enhancement. I, I think there's still work to be done on that, and, and we will get there. Um, I also want to recognize that, that so much of the, the, the public input makes changes, and, and we're, we're seeing that there's, there's going to be a lot of changes that come from that public input. We're thinking about... Um, 50% at least of the suggested edits will result in some change. And, and I think seeing how you changed the water plan, the state's water plan um, is a big deal. So um, I, I, I wanna make sure we honor the work and effort that's gone into that. Um, th there will be um, the, the laying out of that later on in the beginning of the year. I, I believe you just got an email kind of talking about what that will look like um, and where we go from there. Um, I don't wanna to spend too much time on that because we have about a three hour agenda item on the water plan. So I wanna leave them something to say, I won't make my director's report three hours, um, but um, you, will, you will be happy to have three hours later to work on the water plan. So um, in terms of what's happening on the Colorado River, um, where we are across the seven basin states, our work with the federal government, um, I, I wanna give a little bit of an update uh, you re recall the five point plan that came out of um, the Upper Colorado River Commission. Um, one of the pieces of that five point plan was a system conservation pilot program. Um, 
while we still see some stalemates in the lower basin in terms of uh, making progress on the Bureau of Reclamation's Commissioner Tootin's um, demand for reductions from two to four million acre feet um, annually, um, there there's still some stalemates in the lower basin, um, and that I the upper basin really took. A leadership role and stepped out with that five point plan um, while we watch some of um, the concerns and the, the struggles to really meet that that goal of two to four million acre feet we're still moving forward um, the one of the points was that system conservation pilot program um, reauthorization that work began before the the five point even plan even came out. Um, we're still hoping that um, the system conservation pilot program will be federally reauthorized by the end of the year. And we're really working on finalizing the agreements that um, are going to be needed to hit the ground running once that's reauthorized. Uh, uh, in other uh, work that the UCRC staff are working on, um, they're working on a report from the interstate demand management investigation. I want to make sure to clarify that is different from the work that we have done or are doing in within the state of Colorado. This is really focused on the interstate piece of uh, what a demand management program would look um, look at. We're going to be discussing this with the board at a later date. Um, I believe um, there there will be some information going out about that. Um, in other news, I, I know if you open up your new water news at all, which we we make sure gets to all of you. Um, on October 28th, the Bureau of Reclamation published a notice of intent to prepare a supplemental environmental impact statement, which will include um, proposed alternatives to re uh, revise uh, the December 2007 record of decision associated with the Colorado River interim guidelines. Um, that notice of intent outlines that reclamation may need to reduce Glen Canyon Dam downstream releases in order to protect Hoover Dam operations um, um, and may also need to reduce Hoover Dam downstream releases. It, the, the notice of intent really contemplates potential consensus-based approach to uh, adjusting operations. It's also open to unilateral actions and a combination of consensus-based and unilateral actions along with a no action alternative. I think we can all agree that no action is not an action. Um, and what we need right now is action. Um, so I, I just wanna put that out there. Um, as we think about the work that's happening um, and kind of the, the, the current crisis that we are in on Colorado River, I don't wanna lose sight of the, the work that we're doing within Colorado. And so again, I look back at that director's report and urge you all to, to look at the success that we have. And the UCRC is working on really documenting each state's day-to-day uh, -day actions of what we do in terms of conservation, the way that the upper basin states are leading. The director's report that you see in the agenda highlights a lot of that. There is not a director's report where you don't see a water efficiency grant being approved, a water efficiency plan or drought plan being approved. You don't, there's not a director's report where you don't hear about the work that's happening on the land and water nexus and the work on watershed health. So um, if, if you look at those, you can see the way that we are leading. We're gonna be also focusing on how do we advertise more what we are doing? And I think that really goes to um, one of the efforts in the governor's budget is how do we really showcase the good work that's happening on the ground? Um, there, we are so busy, I think you know that. The staff, um, there is not an idle staff that is um, sitting and, and wondering what to do. Um, when, when you look at position descriptions, um, the other duties as assigned gets fully, fully utilized. Um, and, and I think it's important to remember that much of the people that you are seeing online are sitting behind us. Um, this is a passion. Uh, you don't get into water um, if you don't love it. And so oftentimes that, that work is happening behind the scenes, but we need to be able to showcase it more and showcase how much of leaders we are in Colorado. The, the, what we have done, um, not just at the state, but all of you represent something 
across the state, whether it's agriculture, whether it's a utility, whether it's a, a district, whether um, it's an energy provider. There, there is, there is um, work happening all of the time, and we need to make sure that that message gets out, the innovative things that we are doing across Colorado. So we're going to continue to do that. Um, speaking about great things, um, and we're sitting here, and so I have to, I have to say, um, even more kudos, not just to Denver, but um, I want to make sure that that um, you hear about the continual awards that the the um, Kevin Houck section gets. Um, the uh, uh, one of our CWCB funded projects um, won the Colorado Association of Stormwater and Floodplain Managers um, Award. It was the we were the winner of engineering excellence award this is the most prestigious award this organization gives out um, and it was announced to be the cherry um, creek corridor improvements the reason i mention it while we're here is that um, the project's located in the city and county of Den denver but also unincorporated Ap arapahoe county um, it represents a uh, comprehensive ri river restoration of 5.3 miles of nine severely eroded stream um, reach um, miles in the heart of the Denver metro area. This is a big deal. So um, two of the key contributors to the project were Denver, um, who donated a large a Denver water that um, donated a large um, parcel. Um, and I, I want to make sure that we acknowledge them for that. So um, that that um, partnership was able to leverage a CWCB grant for 500,000. So um, it was a small portion of the $16 million total project cost, but um, a key component to attracting funding from other partners. So Barbara Biggs, who you you all may know, a former um, CWCB director, um, was uh, participated in the project, and and there's a, a video if if anybody wants to see it. Um, in terms of staffing and things that have, have been changing in the agency, I think we you have heard us all talking about um, that the new four on the ground positions across the state, and that's new, that's innovative. It, it is the way that we're doing things, the way that we're doing things differently, the way that we're doing things under the leadership of um, the administration, Governor Polis, um, Director Gibbs, those people are have been named um so we're adding the the new staff to support the water plan grant program it includes four regional water plan grant managers um, and a contract administrator for the program so i want to make sure you all know who those people are some of you may already know them i've already gotten in trouble for some steals from um, really good organizations so um first uh in the arkansas basin we have lauren duncan um, she started November 14th, I believe that was two days ago, um, in the Rio Grande and Southwest Basins. We have our friend Laura Spann, um, and how exciting is that? Um, in the South Platte Metro and North Platte, we have um, Jackie Doust. Um, I think I'm saying that right. In the Colorado, Gunnison, Yampa, White, Green, we have Ashley Garrison, and our contract administrator will be Dean Johnson, Jr., um, and then we also have a new administrative assistant, Rosie Major, who will be starting um, later in November. Uh, with all those news, we have to have a SAD. Um, and I, I, I will not end with this. Um, I'm, I'm going to end on a, a high note. But um, our, our saddest um, loss uh, this month would be Sarah Leonard who you all know and has done such great work for us for, um, as our marketing and communications director. The good news is she's engaged. Um, the, um, <laughs> the bad news is she's uh, going with her partner um, back to DC. I think you know we, we, um, she, she came to Colorado from DC. She had a wealth of experience. Uh, we're gonna miss her, but it also provides yet another opportunity to bring um, someone else in to the agency and really um, build up the future leadership um, in water in Colorado. So, um, Sad and good news all at the same time. I wanna to touch on the governor's budget, recognizing I'm directly involved um, or implicated. So I wanna be careful um, on, on how I speak about it. But I think um, echoing Director Brody's comments about the leadership shown by the administration of really recognizing 
the important place that we are in now. And um, we do not know what's going to happen as we move forward. I, you heard me mention about um, the notice of intent, what's happening at the UCRC, the, the work in the other states, the work that we're doing in the state. We do not know what's gonna happen, but we need to be prepared for that. And really being prepared means making sure that we have the right people in the place when the time comes and and that is what this effort is i think we know what the colorado river means to the state of colorado and to the 40 million people that rely on it it would be um it is the most appropriate thing to be ready for whatever comes and to really lead and be prepared um, i think this is an effort to um uh really make sure that that is happening. So I applaud the leadership of the administration for, for acknowledging that this is an important issue. This doesn't um, mean that any other issues are less important, but what it does mean is that we have folks that are focused on this. It also means that the staff that have been split on, on multiple issues can be focused on things in the South Platte, in the Arkansas, in the Yampa, in the Colorado, um, in the North Platte, in Gunnison. Um, that means that we can all be focused where we need to be focused on the most important issues. And again, I talk about the other duties as assigned. That means we work where we need to work in in what we need to do. So um, I, I really think that it's important that we have the right people in the right places. And I think this is an effort to do that. So um, I, I I, it does not mean if this goes through and, and Director Gibbs talked about there is a process, um, that process will be adhered to. Um, I don't think that um, this, this, I guess, um, May meeting would be the last time I sit at this table. Um, I, I would imagine I may have even more work to do. And so I don't think you'll also see a hiccup in um, the work that the CWCB does. I think you know um, the effort that's been put forth on the Colorado River thus far. Um, I think uh, we have not skipped a beat. And the reason we have not skipped a beat is because of the people sitting behind us. I, um, Lauren has done a, an amazing job as deputy director. I'm often on the road traveling. Um, we are very in sync. And while we may be different in personality, she's much more subdued and professional. Um, and I am very excited all the time. Um, it, it's, it has been a perfect mix um, to, to really continue the efforts of the agency um, and not and with, with not, no hiccup seen um, by the general public and, and the board, I believe. So um, I just wanna make sure that you, you are not nervous about this. I believe that um, I, I, the, the right choices will be made and the, we'll get the right people in the right spots um, to continue to move Colorado forward in this leadership role. So um, that is all I have. I'm open to any questions. And uh, again, I appreciate you all and all the work that you do on the day to day. You covered a lot of ground there, Director Mitchell. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions, comments, Director Mitchell? Director Sakata. Thank you. Thank you, Director Mitchell. And thanks for your director's report. Um, I, that, what is it, the Colorado Stream Corridor Construction Guide? Great, great diagrams in there. And if you haven't taken a look at it, the disclaimer is really cool because it's got a picture of a backhoe that's buried like up to halfway up the gap. <laughs> Don't do this at Don't all. Don't do this, exactly. <laughs> so. Uh, and I, I see you're taking comments to that, so I think that's great. I, I really do appreciate your director's report. And then also I saw in there a recognition for Kevin Reedy for recognized Water Star Award as well. So again, hats off to the staff. I didn't mention it because Kevin, like, Kev, the Kevins get awards almost every director's <laughs> report. Yeah. Between Kevin Houck and Kevin Reedy, somebody's getting an award, if not both. Yeah. And also really I appreciated in the report uh, uh, the update on the technical technical assistance uh, program and I know that was a heavy lift to get that going so quickly but I you know looking at the awards on there uh, again thanks so much and I really encourage let's give us a round of applause to the staff because I think they've done a great, great job thank you other comments director felt Chair, um, Director Mitchell, I 
appreciate your report too and all your work. And um, just a couple thoughts. One is I really want to uh, affirm your words about Lauren. She's doing a fantastic job from, from where I sit, uh, stepping into your shoes on the day to day and um, really haven't, from my perspective, we haven't missed a beat and she's been very available and just really helpful. So I did want to reinforce that. And the other thing I wanted to tell you, I could have said it at the last meeting, I guess, <clears throat> but it's come into more focus for me, is when, when the Commissioner of Reclamation issued her 60-day uh, request or mandate or however you phrase that, um, you know, not only did the lower basin just appear to be tongue-tied and unable to come up with anything, but under your leadership for Colorado and the upper basin, not only did we have a five point plan, but you turned it in like 30 days early or something. <laughs> and I can just tell you that as I've gone around my part of the state and explained what's going on to our different conservancy districts and things, um, that's actually been a powerful piece of, of the explanation that we weren't, you know, sliding it under the teacher's door Mm -hmm. at 501 p.m. or something we were we only took half the time needed and had a really coherent plan and so it just speaks volumes about both the upper basin but also your leadership um, in terms of you know you're always fired up and getting it done and it just reflects well on our state cwcb and uh, and you so thank you um, I appreciate that. It, thank you, Director Fell. Uh, I th I will consistently say this. Our goal, not just in the state of Colorado, but I, I think we've really pushed this goal to the upper basin states too, is that we under promise and over deliver. And, and that is, is what I think we're doing, not just on the Colorado River, but uh, across this agency. The first water plan was delivered early. Um, I, I think that that, you know, there's no reason to hold on to something um, to a due date. I think when we're when we're talking about the importance of water, we need to get things done and we need to get things done now. So when it's done, we're not waiting for the deadline. It's it's the way we do business. So thank you for acknowledging that. Uh, Director Sakata. Yeah, Director Felt, that's a great point. And uh, Director Mitchell, you mentioned this yesterday that you know, you took a big risk by putting it out early because it ended, it, it was a target then on your back. And so I think that's where it did take a lot of courage to do that. And it really showed that your motivation is to get things done. It's not to hide from it, the process, but it's to advance the process. So thank you again. Thank you, Director Fell, for bringing that up. Other comments? Okay, well, one of the great things about being chair is that people cover the topics that you <laughs> we're going to cover, but I will briefly just um, super excited about the technical assistance yeah. for federal cost share. When I read through uh, those projects, I'm just really excited in particular, um, you know, those Western Waters partnership is really interesting. And I love that we have um, been able to change our agenda to have a little bit more time to talk about the big issues. Um, but it certainly does not mean that these things buried in the director's report are not, I mean, they are the bread and butter of what we do. And so thank you for pointing that out. It was what came to mind when I was reviewing my notes last night as well. And so um, we must be in sync there. And then the second thing, uh, just so impressed with Lauren and her work. Uh, she did the director's calls uh, this month and you know, I constantly call her because I know how busy you are and, and she's really stepped up to the plate and I appreciate that. So wherever she is, thank right you, Lauren. You. Oh, she is. <laughs> what? I didn't even think you were here. <laughs> no, never mind. <laughs> um, so now we'll move on. Thanks, Lauren. I can't really turn my head all the way back there. Um, we, by the way, are taking a big risk by having our backs to the door. This is yeah. not at all what I like. It's very, I feel like I should be in the Sopranos. Somebody should be watching. I hope you guys are watching out for me because anything could happen back there. 
Um, all right, so where are we at? We are going to move on to uh, Commissioner Greenberg, and she's online. Okay, great. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person. It's one of those weeks where uh, splitting between multiple board meetings. I'm down in the Springs for our uh, state fair board retreat. And just as a reminder, it's never too early to start making your plans for Pueblo uh, in August because we're getting ready for the 151st state fair next year. Um, but I've just so appreciated as always uh, hearing Director Gibbs and Director Mitchell's reports. It, I think listening in, it just reinforces how um, wonderfully symbiotic our agencies are and how much we work together on, on the issues that we're all facing. Um, first and foremost, of course, being water. Um, so I just want to say thank you to, to both of you, Director Gibbs, Director Mitchell, and, and to the board and staff for just ongoing collaboration between our agencies. Uh, I, I couldn't imagine doing this job without that kind of collaboration because the work that we're doing is so integral to one another. So thank you uh, for that. Um, so at CDA, um, you know, plenty going on as always. We've been, I think my, a lot of my recent updates, like so many of us have been kind of what we've been doing around recovery and how we've been building new programs and advocating for funding. And that continues to be the case, but we're in this phase now of really rolling up our sleeves and, and digging in with our communities to, to help implement. Um, Cause we know that uh, the challenges, especially for rural communities to, to implement uh, the dollars that are coming their way and to build the programs and, and receive the funding. Uh, that's a challenge in and of itself, not, not to mention meeting the challenges that we face. Um, so we are squarely focused on you know, our four big wigs. Um, our first one, uh, economic resilience, that has always been a priority for us, but uh, just given, again, the uncertainty that our ag producers are facing, the challenges in global supply chains and the cost of doing business, a uh, lot of uncertainty, a lot of difficulty right now. Um, we have put in the last few months, $6 million into local and regional processing support, really with the focus of expanding our local and regional food system, supporting uh, those businesses in the middle of the supply chain that help producers access uh, more local and regional markets. But we want that to be diversified. There are a lot of states that are really just focused on uh, meat processing. We are focused on meat processing and all other types of processing that help expand uh, market diversification for all of our farmers and ranchers. We've also really been focused on Colorado Proud marketing um, through farmers markets, through um, you know, radio, print, um, billboards, TV, really telling the story of Colorado Ag and getting consumers to, to feel connected to farmers and ranchers. Um, when it comes to the federal grants that are out there, we also have federal uh, grant writing assistance, especially for our livestock uh, industry and those processors who are looking to expand capacity. Uh, we wanna make sure we help bring those dollars here. And then in addition to our local and regional food systems, we continue to push our work across the globe. Our international team has really never stopped working. And I will say that, you know, in, in our conversations, you know, we've had a delegation from the UK here recently. I was in the UK in March. I've been to Mexico and, and a few other places. Um, you know, I asked them, you know, why are you engaging with Colorado over other states or what makes Colorado stand out? And the answer I have gotten from all of those conversations is that, um, we are a state that's innovative, entrepreneurial, and we're taking our work on climate and conservation seriously. And so we're seeing these market opportunities emerge at home and abroad that really value up and down the supply chain, value conservation, value climate work. And we are doing that and building that here in Colorado. And that ties in with our second wave, which is advancing voluntary stewardship. Um, you know, I've, I've, I think I mentioned soil health every single time I'm on because that is, has been our bread and butter when it comes to really building this work. Um, we are at the end of our first pilot season for our STAR program, Saving Tomorrow's Agricultural Resources. I'm sure, I know there are folks in the room today and, and probably folks listening in who have been a part of this. We've had 130 farmers and ranchers and 17 conservation districts uh, partner with us in this pilot season. So really excited to see what we learned from this year. I mean, it's remarkable the diversity of work going on all across the state from corner to corner. So we're gonna be learning a lot. Uh, but the, the other reason why that program and that pilot has been so important is because it, it helped us get that $25 million USDA grant to expand the STAR program massively across the state, 
work with eight other states and their land grant universities across the arid west for much more of an arid west solution around climate, smart agriculture, and then also see what we can do to build this the STAR program and the STAR brand beyond that across the country. So really, our goal and my goal is setting Colorado, Colorado up to be uh, a leader in this work and for our fellow states and our partners across the world to really recognize Colorado for um, our, our leadership in, in conservation stewardship. Our third big wig is, um, and I'm, you know, you all know wigs, but I'm trying to get away from the jargon of that. But our big focus, right, is supporting future generations. And, and in my mind, you know, we can't do any of the work that we're doing in a, uh, with integrity without asking ourselves, what are we leaving our our grandkids and their grandkids? And that's one reason I so uh, respect this board and the work of the CWCB is because you are thinking long term and doing the work now, I think, to make future generations uh, have the tools they need to better address their challenges. So for us, uh, we're continuing to, to grow our Ag Workforce Development Program. That's our paid apprenticeship program. We also just launched a brand new uh, grant program, Next Gen Scholarships. So we're working to get uh, dollars to young people for ag education and leadership development. It's really for them to connect with organizations that already do that work. So if they're looking to attend a conference or go through a training, get hallway time with folks who are decision makers in their field, um, what have you. It's a really broad program, but again, the goal is to, to reach more people and help reduce the barriers to entry for young people looking to build a career in agriculture. And then our last big goal or big wig is around animal health and welfare. As you all know, we um, handle every uh, foreign animal disease incident in the state, um, every outbreak uh, that comes our way. And this year has primarily been focused on highly pathogenic avian influenza. Um, we are following a number of other foreign animal diseases uh, around the globe, luckily, knock on wood, that we're not dealing with now. But uh, something like African swine fever uh, is a real big deal. Um, is not uh, on North American soil, but is in the Western hemisphere. So we are doing a lot of work, understanding our own capacity needs, working very closely with USDA. We have a phenomenal relationship with our USDA partners, which is not necessarily the case across the country, but our working relationship is pretty phenomenal, but making sure that we are as prepared as possible for those kinds of outbreaks. And then also continuing to support our local governments and local law enforcement in um, issues of animal health and welfare. A few more uh, exciting updates from the department. As I mentioned, we're in this building phase, but also rolling up our sleeves. We brought on two um, new positions who I think I've mentioned before, but they have started now. So we have a full-time ag emergency coordinator. This is our uh, first ever full-time position for this role. So somebody who now is dedicated to planning, response, and recovery for uh, all hazards events that impact ag. I've also brought on a brand new role is the manager for our community food access program. So this is the program where we're gonna be able to help food retailers actually expand their retail capacity for fresh food. So whether that's food safety training or buying cold storage, the goal is to get more food insecure areas connected to local food and fresh and healthy food. And then lastly, very similar to what Director Mitchell uh, mentioned in terms of the, the regional staff across the state, um, I took sort of the deputy model. I was searching for a deputy and I since you know I've hired uh, Hollis Glenn as my deputy of operations and Jordan Beasley as deputy of external affairs. So they're really my internal team, but I still needed more ag voices um, that I wanted to bring into the department. So I've actually taken a vacant position and broken it up into four very part-time positions that will be regional assistant commissioners. So these will be uh, positions that are built for working farmers and ranchers. It'll mean they don't have to come to Broomfield every week. They stay where they live and keep working on the farm, but they're going to be our liaisons in the field. So hopefully that will expand CDA's presence, um, reduce the amount of time it takes to get an answer uh, when you're out in the field, and also help communicate all that we're doing um, out to our stakeholders and have that two-way communication. Uh, last few things, you know, we have, um, of course, as all agencies, you know, big focus on the budget and the upcoming ledge session. Um, we have a pretty uh, light legislative agenda, really focused on some tweaks in our existing statute. Uh, one is to expand or extend, excuse me, our Ag Workforce Development Program, which sunsets in 2024. Another is to uh, expand eligibility in our loan program, just to make it uh, a little bit more flexible for folks, especially folks who don't yet own uh, or manage a business. 
Um, and then the budget item, our, the, the one I want to really highlight is our number one budget request is for a climate marketing specialist. So we've been, as we've been building our climate work, you know, we have our Ag Drought and Climate Resilience Office. We have our STAR program. We've built our Acre 3 Renewable Energy Program. We've really been asking, well, where's our niche? And I think our niche is really around doing business on behalf of our farmers and ranchers, especially on that climate uh, marketing side. So really excited about being uh, able to build more of a bridge between our markets and conservation teams and hopefully proving that there is a bottom line benefit to all of this climate and conservation work that we're doing. Um, lastly, I've been on the road per usual. I want to say thank you to uh, Director Sakata for um, trusting me to uh, MC a panel that he was on at Water in the West. Fantastic panel and really interesting discussion. Um, we then, Denver hosted uh, the Regenerate Conference, which is Kibera Coalition, Holistic Management, and American Grass-Fed. It's the first time in 23 or four years that that conference has been outside of Albuquerque, so it's a really exciting time. Um, we were also, I'm, I'm lucky enough to get to celebrate the um, Colorado Uncorked, which is part of our wine industry development board. So uh, that's another thing to note. Every November we, uh, or late October, we celebrate Colorado wines. And then I also uh, was just down in Los Animas County for a two-day tour last week. And just want to say thank you to the farmers and ranchers who uh, hosted me down there. This week, we cut uh, coming up RMFU convention in Greeley and then the Colorado Food Summit, which is a big, uh, a big food summit. We're getting a lot of young people there through our sponsorship program uh, and just really excited to keep building on that momentum. Um, and with that, that's the end of my report for this morning. Thank you, Commissioner Greenberg. Any questions, comments? The Commissioner, uh, Director Boucher. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Commissioner Greenberg. Your updates are always so fun. Um, will you expand on the four part-time personnel? Are they all hired working? What are their locations? Give us a little bit more information. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the, the four are will be paid staff for CDA and will work approximately on average 10 hours a week. Um, I've left that very flexible because there's gonna be some weeks when you're on fall run or it's harvest and I don't expect to hear from you. And so that's the kind of relationship we're setting up just to make it as reasonable as possible for a working farmer or rancher to be in that role. The, the hours that the, the regional assistant commissioners will be working will be you know, um, helping us uh, determine our strategic policy initiatives. It'll be helping uh, us determine if we're, you know, hitting the mark on the programs that we're building, who's not at the table, who haven't we reached. And then we'll be going out into the field and really communicating that work, attending events, speaking at events, representing the department across the state. Um, but really it's that two-way street. Um, in terms of region, I was not specific on region because I've, so I also have my nine member ag commission and they represent, you know, many regions in the state. Uh, these these four, up to four regional assistant commissioners will be working symbiotically with the commission. So I want a little bit of flexibility to say, where do we have a gap? You know, where do we need expertise? But it's not just the geographic expertise. It's also trying to get a cross section of Colorado agriculture, which is very hard when you only have four people. We're much more diverse than that. Um, but making sure I'm thinking through, you know, geography, experience, background, how do we build a di diverse and dynamic team that helps flesh out the expertise we have in the Ag Commission uh, and represents as much of the state as possible. Thank you very much. It's really creative. Um, I'm really excited for you about that and for Colorado. That's just a really unique idea. Thank you. All right. Well, unless you have anything else for us, we'll take you off the big screen. <laughs> Enjoy your day. And we're all looking forward to next August 151. Thanks for sharing that. You do a good job of especially keeping Director Sakata's calendar full, which is hard to do. <laughs> um, all right. Well, thanks again for joining us. And we will move forward to State Engineer Ryan. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, everyone. I have a few more comments for us today, and I wanna say thank you to Director Mitchell, Director Gibbs, Director Greenberg for those updates. Just real quick, Kevin Houck, uh, Director Mitchell, known him personally and professionally for many years and admired him, and it seems to me that the, the great leaders always seem to shy away from the limelight, and that's, that's Kevin, so I appreciate you highlighting these things, because otherwise he would, he would shy away from it and we wouldn't know about it. So thank you for that. 
I want to talk about the Rio Grande compact and the lawsuit quickly. I had a compact commission meeting last week. It was a special meeting. And this was the Rio Grande compact commissioners meeting to approve two resolutions. As you know, we've been in a lawsuit since 2014. In 2014, in original action number 141, Texas sued New Mexico for not complying with a compact. And New Mexico, <clears throat> through a counterclaim, sued Texas. Colorado was not named as uh, not complying with a compact, but as a compact state, we were joined in the lawsuit. And we we're also in it to just protect our interests so that any settlement or any decision would not adversely impact our operations. The, the reason for the compact meeting last week, as I said, was to approve two resolutions. And the basis for the resolutions was that after these eight years, the three compact states have come to a settlement agreement in a consent decree. And the three states would like to offer that and are offering that to the special master to recommend to the court uh, settling the case. The case would be settled. And this meeting that we had was for the compact commissioners to officially agree to those resolutions and offer them. Uh, the one resolution, pardon me, was to settle the case under certain terms and conditions. And the second resolution was to settle a longstanding accounting agreement, disagreement in Elephant Butte Reservoir and Credit Water. Very positive actions by the three states working in collaboration together after eight years. And we hope to file that with the special master, that motion to do that. But of course, there's always other legal issues that will take time. And that is what I'd like to say about the Rio Grande Compact and the lawsuit, knowing that Director Dutton will probably touch on it and give you a different flavor than, the, than I can as the Compact Commissioner. So I'll leave it at that. <clears throat> Management rules, Division 6. I update you every meeting, but this is an exciting one. On October 28th, we filed those rules with the Water Court in Division 6. When I say we, it's that, that flattering collective we, but really it was our, our attorney that filed the rules with the Water Court on October 28th. This was a about a 10-month stakeholder-driven effort to develop these rules. And, and that included 10 different stakeholder meetings. The, the stakeholders were so engaged and well-informed and reasonable and constructive that I believe that led to us getting a good set of rules that we could file with the water court that we'd like to think there won't be a large number of protests or substantive protests, but that's out there to be seen. So I wanna thank the stakeholders, but I also wanna thank our DWR staff, Mike Sullivan and Aaron Lyatt, who, who worked with me and the three of us uh, worked on these rules. But I can't say any of that without giving a nod to the Attorney General's office and Lane Leoniak's unit and Paul Bennington's unit for being that not only legal guidance on the rulemaking, but also the, the other good eyes and good minds. And uh, it's very important to have as many minds engaged as you possibly can. And, and that included, like I said, a lot of engagement from especially our lead attorney on that, Emily Halverson, who put so much work into this. And, and when it came right down to the wire, she had to do all that extra work of making sure this was just perfect. Every comma, every period was perfect so we could file these for the water court. But in addition to that work in the Office on the Rules, I just want to mention that um, 10 stakeholder meetings in Division Six was a lot to do. And, and it's sitting in meetings, but it's also um, going out in the field and jumping over flumes and climbing over cattle gates. And sometimes it even means that you might find yourself driving over Loveland Pass in 12 inches of snow and 10 foot visibility with a state engineer at one in the morning. So anybody that wants to sign up for that, think twice. But it, it, our attorneys were just great on that. So I want to thank um, Scott Steinbrecher, I, I'll just say it to you. Um, I don't see Lane or Paul here, but thank you so much for this expert staff and lending them to us. On the South Platte Compact, w once again, there's not much for me to say. We continue to have dialogue with Nebraska officials and, and they are being constructive about 
trying to tell us what they're doing and giving us more detail. We know that they have a feasibility report that they're doing that they'll submit to their legislature by December. We know that they've contacted our Colorado landowners that would be impacted by this canal to discuss possible land acquisition options. And, and that has caused some interesting feelings for Colorado landowners and some consternation. And, uh, th but that is the status of that right now. We're, we're waiting to hear more and waiting for more to develop. <clears throat> two more, uh, I don't wanna make you think I'm almost done, but I, I have two other major topics. First of all, in division two in the Arkansas River Basin, as you know, it's been a rough year for us. Uh, we lost in a very untimely way two star players down there that uh, passed away before their time. It, that's been very difficult. And, you know, we had that, all of our other stresses in trying to administer water in a, in a very busy state when it comes to water administration. The other piece I need to add to that, it's, it's a mixture of good news and bad news, because the good news is we, we get to see someone we really care for and admire having the opportunity to retire. But the bad news is just what I said. Um, you see this person retiring, and that is Bill Tyner, the division engineer. He's been the division engineer for four years, but he was very much like a division engineer for a couple decades before that. For those of you that know Bill Tyner, even just a little bit, and Director Felt, you know what I'm talking about. He's He's just such a solid technical and administration resource, especially on the compact. But when we talk about uh, Bill Tyner, we need to just really remember that it's, it's also his demeanor and his approach to, to the way he does his job. He can calm a very agitated room with some good, even advice and um, suggestions and bringing people together. And so much of what we've done in Division Two, and again, that was that flattering collective we, but so much of what DWR has done in Division Two has been because of Bill Tyner and his knowledge and his demeanor. And I'm thinking of things uh, Director Felt, like irrigation improvement rules and the work he did on that. Something near and dear to your heart, the voluntary flow management program on the Upper Arkansas that, that makes things work for so many different entities in such a good way. And I, I really need to talk about a personal favorite of mine, following leasing pilot projects, something that this board was able to authorize after some 2015 legislation, in the, uh, 2015, I think, following leasing pilot projects. That is a shining example of how Colorado water users find very resourceful and innovative ways to solve problems, and this one's an alternative transfer method. But I remember that that uh, couple days of day long meetings approving this first following leasing pilot project and the role Bill Tyner played in that and making something seemingly unworkable suddenly work. Um, so I, I just can't say enough about Bill Tyner and his retiring and I just wanted to recognize him. But when I talk about that, it causes, and this is my last topic, it causes me to reflect again on what we do in Colorado to solve problems and to develop our water resources and to meet needs and challenges. And we are innovative and, and we're always trying something new. So I mentioned irrigation improvement rules, the voluntary flow management program, following leasing pilot projects. Uh, we also do things like reservoir trades. Uh, Director Felt, again, that has its roots in Division Two, and we do uh, we, we've got recent legislation for protecting flows in the river, especially along the Poudre. We have two examples of recent legislation that allows Northern and some other water users to, in, in their work with CWCB, to protect flows along the river. Each one of those things, as I said, is innovative, it's, it's sophisticated, but it's also complex and, and time consuming for our staff at DWR. So I want to recognize our staff at DWR. You'll often hear me talk about how, yes, water administration is, is happening to a greater degree in terms of volume, but also complexity. And that sounds a little vague and intangible, but, but to put a more tangible view on that, I want to get back to Director Sakata's comments earlier and then Director Gibbs' explanation of the budget. And Director Sakata, your, your comments about needs around the state 
especially in the South Platte Basin, are not lost on me, not lost on us. And, and I know you know that, but we've we've heard of it before. And to me, it's a little bit heartening to hear that the, the people's view of that is not that your guys aren't just measuring up and, and your, your men and women are not measuring up. Uh, you need more or different. You, you see that they're doing a great job, but they're stretched and, and they just can't possibly meet all the needs. So we, we deal with that and we try to work through that. And probably now is the, the wrong place for me to, to lobby for more staff might be poor form, but, but um, we recognize that need, but that's why I want to thank Director Gibbs for his support on this budget issue and these additional staff. Because when I talk about this additional complexity, sophistication, and the way we do more changes of water rights, more exchanges, more reservoir trades, and we move water up and down physically and on paper, not just within one district, but from the lower end of the river up the main stem to sometimes the headwaters. And, and that takes a great deal of coordination. It takes a lot of measurement, it takes a lot of data, and, and that's what we do at DWR, but we're doing it to a greater and greater degree. That's important, and it's a need we need to try to continue to try to meet. But getting back to the budget, when it comes to the Colorado River, I wanna go back to the five point plan, and I think by now we can all almost by memory go down that list. If you look at each of the items on that five point plan, it requires good, diligent administration oversight from DWR. It requires data, it requires measurement. And that becomes more critical for each of those items in the five point plan. It becomes more critical when we talk about the prospect of additional developments on the Colorado River and the compact. So that's why those 8.5 FTEs are so important to DWR in the context of this Colorado River request and team. So I, I just want to thank uh, you know, Director Gibbs, but Director Mitchell and, and other EDO staff for working with us and recognizing that need and supporting it. That is my report for today. Madam Chair, thank you. Thank you. Any questions for our state engineer, <clears throat> Director Felt? Sorry, Madam Chair, this won't be a question again, but um, Director Ryan, I just want to tag on to your comments about Bill Feiner. Um, and that was, you really encapsulated him well. Um, he's such a humble guy that I know he won't allow us to have some kind of going away celebration. So I thought I would just take this opportunity on behalf of the water users of the Arkansas Basin to just say thank you, Bill. Um, you've, you've been phenomenal. And he has, because of his sort of humble approach to things and his just straightforward reliance on data, he, he has incredible credibility, if you can say that, <laughs> about someone. And he, um, he left us with a really great parting gift, I thought, which is a series of presentations that he did over the last year at Southeastern in particular, maybe other places too. But the, the sort of, as he pulled all those together, what he really demonstrated for us without telling us what to think, but just giving us the information, uh, he really helped, particularly I think the lower basin understand the impacts and benefits of the Friar project water and just how much um, the success of agriculture relies on that supplemental water. And probably in many times and contexts, that information might have led to sort of increased tension across <clears throat> basins, you know, sort of that renewal of, oh, we have this and it came from there and other people saying they took that from us, that sort of thing. But what it's really done has is to educate and energize the lower basin, you know, Otero, Bent, Crowley, Prowers, Baca, to all understand their connection to the West Slope and to probably better unify us mm -hmm. 
around our friend here as we take a statewide approach to these Colorado River Basin negotiations. So it's a remarkable thing that he was able to do, I thought, was to educate us and also help direct us in a path that's really constructive with that information that we would, we would uh, you know, fight, I guess you would say, or persevere, not just for our needs, but for the good of the whole state, because we're all in it together. He really demonstrated that. So really appreciate you taking time to call him out. It's been a great help. Thank you for that, Director Felt. I'll pass that along. And you and I recognizing that he doesn't want to hear it because he doesn't <laughs> like to be celebrated, but, but I'll pass that along. Sorry, I have to give kudos to Bill also and pass it along, but I'll probably just call him myself and, and, <laughs> and say something. But um, just, just so you're all aware, um, you know, we work on multiple interstate protection um, issues within the CWCB and DWR, and I've had the pleasure of working with Bill as we work on the Arkansas um, River Compact Committee. And so um, he has been more than a help to me and has lifted me up um, through that process. And, and so I will, um, I'll be reaching out to him and, and making sure I, I say some, some nice words and, and some jabs too at the same time. So thank you for honoring him. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. And we will go ahead and move forward to uh, the Division of Parks and Wildlife Director, and I believe today we have Robert Harris virtually attending. Uh, Hi, thank you, Madam you Chair. Uh, you can hear me great. I, uh, Acting uh, Director Dugan sends her regrets uh, that she and le the leadership team are on the West Slope today, and uh, and I'm home because I've got uh, my daughter's uh, cold that she brought home. So, uh, so I apologize that I can't be there in person. Um, so uh, as uh, Executive Director Gibbs mentioned, um, uh, former Director Dan Prenslow retired effective November 1st after 36 years of service to CPW. Uh, CPW anticipates that the search for a new director will take a few months um, and the search will be national. Uh, and in the meanwhile, Acting Director Heather Dugan uh, will continue to lead CPW uh, while the search for a permanent director continues. Um, in other news, um, we've got our uh, Keep Colorado Wild Pass launch uh, for the upcoming 2023 vehicle registration season. If folks don't know, this is going to be an option that you'll have when you register your vehicle to um, basically get a parks pass uh, that, that will scan in with your license plate. Uh, CPW is sending out or has sent out 2.7 million postcards, one for every household in the state. Uh, to promote the new pass uh, and we've also got a website uh, with information on it on in English and Spanish so I uh, definitely encourage folks to check that out. Um, another big thing coming down the pike for us is we've got our uh, draft wolf restoration management plan uh, coming. Uh, CPW wildlife experts are going to be presenting on the draft um, to our Parks and Wildlife Commission and the public on December 9th in a virtual presentation and that's going to be open to the public. And again, you can go to our website uh, if you're curious about more details about that. Um, and then last, uh, just have a, have a shout out for the uh, in-stream flow uh, section, um, uh, just particularly for agenda item 22, which is gonna cover the topic of making uh, CWCB's in-stream flow rights consistent with the US Secretary of Interior's Order 3404. If you don't know what that one is, it identifies a derogatory name associated with certain geographic features uh, and directs their replacement. And you know, we just the CPW want to thank uh, CWCB and the AGO staff for spotting this issue, as some of our in-stream flow water rights relate to that issue, uh, and protect proactively taking it uh, through uh, taking action through uh, judicially renaming these water rights. It's going to be a big lift, but um, you know, we appreciate folks seeing that and moving forward. So yeah, thanks to Rob Veal and, and uh, his team for that. And with that, uh, unless there are any questions, I'll conclude the CPW uh, director's report. Thank you, appreciate it. I hope everybody gets well soon in your household. Great, yeah. thanks. Yeah, you bet. Um, we'll move on to Keith McLaughlin with the uh, Water Resource and Power Development Authority. 
And I know we have his, oh, there you are. Hi, Keith. Hi, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Um, my executive director's report is attached to your file. I'm just going to hit some highlights there and then ask if there are any questions. Um, we had three specific drinking water bill or bipartisan infrastructure law uh, loan applications approved in October. Um, the big one there was Denver Water. They're doing a, a, as many of you probably know and have even been impacted, they're doing a big lead service line uh, project that's about 76 million. The other two bars were the town of Buena Vista and uh, Pagosa Area Water and Sanitation District. They're doing upgrades and, and Pagosa Area is doing a brand new treatment plant for about $38 million. Um, hard to get a handle on the cost of projects these days. If you go out for any kind of project bid, um, we're not finding folks you know, having low bids. In fact, it's quite the opposite. It's not uncommon for a lot of the projects that we're working on to, to actually double in, in scope. So it's made you know, funding these projects that, that much more challenging. On the wastewater side, we approved two bill applications in, in October. One was for the city of Fort Lupton and the other one was for Meeker Sanitation District. Um, Fort Lupton's project is a tap in to uh, Denver uh, or into Metro's uh, recoveries wastewater facility. And then Meeker's project is just repairs to their existing wastewater treatment facility. Uh, those two projects were, let's see, 25 million for Fort Lupton and then Meeker uh, was about 700,000. I think the way to think about the bill funds, which is really taking up um, the majority of our time at my office, is it's really an extension of existing funds that we already have under the program. And so we get typically about 35 million a year in federal dollars. We have another 20 or 30 million revolving from existing loans. Now, in addition to that, we've got 120 million plus a year coming in uh, specifically under bill. So while there are some differences between bill and our base program, it really is an extension of that program. Eligibility for projects are the same. Um, a lot of the requirements are the same. So. Um, I think that's probably the, the best way to think of it. In total, um, this year, and this really just since August, we've approved nine bill projects for $174 million. So while the program, I think, started off a little slow, in part because some of the rules were uncertain, we're waiting on uh, EPA to provide some additional information, um, it's gaining traction, and, and I think we'll probably double the number of loans and maybe triple the dollar amount of loans that we do this year and it'll likely go up from there. Um, a couple of things we're working with the board on is uh, we're trying to think a little more strategically about the bill funds while we opened it up very broadly based on um, not a lot of demand initially. We're then we're now relooking at resetting those caps and, and limits appropriately. And um, then the last thing I want to mention is something that's sort of come into favor is the congressional earmarks. And those congressional earmarks uh, allow entities to apply directly to essentially the governor's office uh, for funding for water projects. Those earmarks are coming off the top uh, of the SRF program funds, our base program funds. So um, we ended up losing about $11 million in funding um, this year based on, uh, on those congressional earmarks. So it's something our board's working on with our senators and our congressional representatives. Um, and I think that uh, concludes my report. And I apologize, I, I, my dog's barking in the background. And uh, I swear I took care of everything before I got on this call, but apparently not. We can't hear him, so that's kind of miraculous, but um, we'll let you go take care of that unless there's any questions. Yep, Director Sakata. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Director McLaughlin, thank you for the report. You mentioned it and I was gonna ask you anyway, and I don't, I'm not really familiar with your requirements, but are, are you changing any type of um, amount that projects have for a contingency plan because of the unknowns of project costs, it seems like these days? I'm sorry, Director Sakata, I'm having a little trouble hearing you. 
I was wondering if there, you're changing any requirements for contingency on, on loan applications. Yeah, um, we are. And some of it's how we set the dollar amount so that projects can come back. Um, but we're seeing even original estimates coming in, you know, 50% higher and then actual bids coming in higher beyond that. So it's something that we're trying to address at, at sort of the, the board level in terms of our parameters, but it's, it's a continuing issue. And while, you know, a $20 million project is very difficult, particularly from, you know, medium sized projects or communities, you imagine when that project doubles, um, you know, they're already being stretched thin at, at 20 million. And if a project comes back at 40 million, that causes them some real issues. So we're doing what we can there, including looking at scope or roping in other partners, um, you know, whether it be Department of Local Affairs or USDA role development um, to try to help us, you know, get the, the cost down on these projects. Yeah, thank you. I think USDA real, role development, you know, when I was on the Water Quality Control Commission, we really tried to get those that involved, that program involved. So thanks for all your efforts in that. I appreciate the comments. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for joining us today and enjoy the rest of your day. We're going to. Thank you. And I appreciate having this hybrid option. I've got a, another meeting at 1030. I'd love to be there in person. I've got a meeting uh, starting up here at 1030 with our federal partners. So, so thanks for allowing me to participate in this format. It is appreciated. Of course, it's making all of our lives a little easier, even though it has its downfalls. Enjoy the day. Thank you. Um, we will move to morning break. We're running just a few minutes behind schedule. So we'll go ahead and shorten that to 10 minutes, please. And we'll see you back here at 1045.
So whenever Southeast shows up to the party, you know it's going to be fun. Um, we will move forward to agenda item five, financial matters, and hello and welcome. Good morning. Is this on? Good morning. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would have introduced myself as Kirk Russell, but I think I'm going to change my name to Kevin Russell because <laughs> Kevin seems to get a lot of attention nowadays. So I'll be the first staff member to announce their new name. To the board, um, the agenda item, let's see, we're on item six, five. Uh, agenda item five this time has two subcomponents, and that's because it is the end of our fiscal year uh, presentation of the financial statements. I'll start off with uh, the normal routine uh, agenda item 5A, and that is the financial project projections and cash management report. And no, understand this, that we are only three months into the fiscal year, so mo most of the things uh, that we go through are starting to develop as money comes in from severance tax and uh, federal mineral lease and loans, obviously, in repayment at the start of the year. Um, and so we'll, we'll look at the uh, construction fund balances first. And I, I guess I need to point out that uh, as staff changes, the uh, finance team uh, lost our accountant. And it was unfortunate because she'd only been with us about eight or nine months. So we have reset and we are uh, we're getting close to uh, making an offer and hiring a replacement of Wendy cheek and so there will be a little bit of a lapse on some of the stuff that we've been dealing with but uh we're in good shape still so um this report is she had did a lot of the work up to the point where uh this report was finalized uh, i want to highlight um you know the the things that have moved um, through you've got the september projection on line four the 15 million dollar fml coming into the construction fund is stayed pretty consistent from June's projection to September. Um, as money comes in uh, and money goes out, I've, I've used about a $22.3 million estimate out of the construction fund for new loans. And that's just based on our global interest in targeting about 40 to $50 million each year. So I'm looking at about 20 million coming out of construction fund. To date, we've only done 1.3 out of that fund. And then the last item I wanted to highlight on that first page is the CWCB NRI budget on line 19. That's $15.5 million that uh, this board's finance committee heard back in September. And that would be reflected in the 2023 projects bill, assuming uh, that all of the projects that will be presented tomorrow um, are approved. Moving on to the severance tax trust fund page. Um, the, the big number to look at is uh, line number four is the eight, projection of $82 million from severance tax. You hear me talk about the, the volatility of that um, revenue coming in. And so it appears to be still a big year for severance tax. And there is a potential for additional money coming in from the operational spillover. Um, it's just so hard to predict that I'm just going to leave that until we get closer to the end of the year and have more knowledge whether that 82 million will be uh, even larger uh, and line 10 shows that uh, we will be requesting the board about 4.8 million dollars in new loans uh, when cole steps up to present on agenda item six and with that i will wrap up uh, agenda item 5a unless there are questions any questions for kevin <laughs> <laughs> no okay <clears throat> uh, chair oh thank you sorry go right ahead director hawkins thank you chairwoman um thank you kirk if we're attending virtually i don't know that we have the document that you were referencing i believe we do for the next items but wanted to let you know my apologies. I guess I forgot that uh, we had the virtual option. Sorry about that. I will email that as soon as I get done presenting. Thank you so much, Kirk. Okay, go, go ahead. Okay, agenda item 5B is uh, also an information only item, and it is the um, annual financial statements that are prepared by Clifton Larson Allen. If I got that name right. 
Um, these are uh, these were prepared under Wendy Cheeks' uh, direction as our accountant, and tradition has it we present these to the board at the November meeting. A lot of times you'll see information from these in the September meeting, but they aren't finalized until shortly after the September meeting. They are uh, there and available. In the past, sometimes we have invited Clifton Larson to um, to attend, and it, it it just seemed like there were there just wasn't enough um, questions and an opportunity to to have them respond and have them sit here throughout most of the day. So I elected to not bring them in, and hopefully I didn't make a major mistake in doing so. So um, the only thing I may want to highlight on these um, financial statements back to severance tax. So if you were to go to the severance tax document page, page five um, of the severance tax one, it'll show you at the top of the page that uh, fluctuation in severance tax revenue. In 2020, it shows it was 29 million. 2021, it was negative 3 million. And then last year it was close to 78 million. So again, that's just that movement of the revenue coming in from severance tax. So with that, you have the statements in front of you. If you were to come across um, a request or a need to ask a question, feel free to email me or we could address it at the next board meeting. So with that, I'd be happy to entertain any question. Any questions for Kirk? Anything online? <clears throat> nope. All right. You're off the hook, my friend. Thank you. I've seen a few. Okay. Well, it's always a great pleasure to have our guests from Southeast. Oh, nope. Nope. It's not we time. Have. Oh, Cole. I'm sorry. Come on up. <laughs> it's a great pleasure to have you too. <laughs> After number six. All right, well, uh, good morning. Uh, for the record, I'm Cole Bedford, CWCB staff. Uh, these are agenda items 6A and 6B. Item 6A is a loan request from the Special Improvement District Number 3 of the Rio Grande Water Cons Conservation District. And item 6B is a loan request from the Groundwater Management Subdistrict of the Trinchera Water Conservancy District. And uh, there are two separate items, two separate loans. Uh, but they're both components of the Alpha Hay Farms augmentation project. So I'll first talk about the overall project, and then I'll dive into the two loans um, and make two separate staff recommendations for your vote. So to start in the San Luis Valley, like in other parts of the state, uh, there are a large number of both surface water rights holders who divert water from rivers and streams, and there are also a large number of groundwater well users. And historically, those two sources were um, managed in the valley separately and but that that was obviously that was not the case so in the early night or in the early 2000s it was recognized that some of the groundwater pumping was reducing the amount of water available uh, in some of the streams and thereby they were creating a an injury to the surface water rights holders there so around 2000 the Rio Grande Water Conservation District took the lead on creating the sub districts and the idea behind the subdistricts was that they would be a collection of groundwater well users who would collectively work together to maintain the aquifers and compensate injured surface water rights holders. So the Rio Grande Water Conservation District created subdistricts one through six, and those are the colored areas on the map here. Subdistrict three is the borrower for item 6A, and they're the orange area at the very bottom in the red. And then after the Rio Grande uh, created their subdistricts, other organizations followed suit. And one of those was the Trinchera Conservancy District with the creation of the Groundwater Management Subdistrict. And they're the second red box just to the right of Subdistrict 3. And so all of these subdistricts do a couple of different things um, to try to protect the groundwater well users in their subdistricts. But one of those is to purchase surface water rights, which can then be used to replace uh, surface stream flows. And it's important to point out that in doing that, uh, they sometimes take agricultural land out of production, but the result is the preservation of other ag land and other economy driving water uses in the same community. So it's not a transfer of resources out of the local community. So that brings us to the Alpha Hay Farms project. Alpha Hay Farms is a farming operation in the far south part of the valley. It's adjacent to the Caneos River and the town of Antonito. And it currently consists of 15 quarter sections center pivot irrigated fields and those have been historically rotated between alfalfa and small grain crops. 
four of those 15 fields, the ones closest to the Kneos at the top there, are numbers 11, 12, 13, and 14. And water to those fields come from both surface water diverted from the Kneos and a single groundwater well in field 12. So this project will consist of purchasing those four circles and their associated water rights. Subdistrict 3 will purchase fields 11 and 12, and the groundwater management subdistrict will purchase fields 13 and 14. Both subdistricts will go through the process of changing the water rights from irrigation to augmentation, and then they will use that water to replace stream depletions uh, by diverting water through an augmentation station and then returning it back to the river. Subdistrict 3, in addition to that purchase, will construct an 18-inch augmentation pipeline connecting the groundwater well at field 12 to the river, and the estimated cost of the total project then is just over $5 million. So borrower number one, which is item 6A, is a loan request from Special Improvement District number three. Their requested loan amount is $2,580,550, $2, which will cover the vast majority of the subdistrict's costs on the project. And the loan terms will be 30 years at 2.5%. They are a strong borrower and their collateral will consist of a pledge of revenues. Borrower number two, item 6B, is a loan request from Groundwater Management Subdistrict. Their requested loan amount is $2,251,290, and their loan terms will be 30 years at 2.1%. Their financial ratios indicate that they are also a strong borrower, and their collateral will also be a pledge of revenues. Uh, and so here's staff recommendation for number one, and I think we have Amber Pacheco online. She's the uh, uh, program manager for subdistrict number three. Welcome, Amber. You have the floor if you have anything you'd like to say. Good morning. I just wanted to thank the CWC board and the staff for um, allowing us an opportunity to be able to apply for this loan and to work with your staff um, through this process and um, and helping our, our sub-district in meeting um, our requirements under the groundwater rules. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yes, Director Dutton. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would also note that you guys saw him, but Nathan Combs is, is on the screen as well with Amber. And I did notice Leroy as well, just like Madonna. Um, I'm assuming that's Leroy Salazar. Um, Nathan and Leroy are both members of the Subdistrict 3 board and have been you know, huge champions for this project and, and bringing this to fruition. And so uh, Nathan or Leroy, I wondered if you guys had anything to add before we get to the staff recommendation. Um, I was just gonna say, appreciate the opportunity as well. Um, we've been working really hard to, to correct our groundwater, surface water interactions. And uh, the state has been helping us a lot on getting this plan done. And this is a huge step forward for these sub districts to be able to accomplish that in paying back depletions and having some sustainability. So like Amber, I really appreciate you taking the time and the opportunity to work with your staff on this. And this is Leroy Salazar. And I likewise, you know, we're dealing with uh, trying to make up depletions to the river systems caused by well pumping. And we're trying to build a sustainable aquifer. And uh, uh, this is a project that will go a long ways towards helping us to achieve that goal. Thank you. Great, thank you guys for, oh, sorry, Madam Chair. I thought we had eye contact. Um, <laughs> thank you guys so much for, for taking the time to join the meeting and Cole, thanks for your work on this project. I just wanted to highlight for the board that, you know, Cole comes up here all, all nonchalant and talks for five minutes and, and did such a great job of summing up a really complex project. But, you know, everything that he talked about is the result of months of work of staff you know, helping helping these two boards put together what is a very complicated project. And you all have, have heard us talk about how the, the major challenge in the Rio Grande Basin is just balancing our supply with our use. And so this will will go a long way towards that. And while, um, you know, those of us that, that grew up on farms, we hate to see farms dried up. We recognize that we don't have a choice. We have to figure out how to how to balance our, our water use. And so I just applaud everybody for 
putting together this great project. And again, thanks to staff, thanks Cole and, and Matt for your work on this. And um, I think it's pretty obvious that I am supporting this project. So I would move staff recommendation on agenda item 6A. <coughs> Director Sakata beat you to the punch. Sorry, <laughs> Director Felt. Uh, thank you. Any discussion? Go ahead, Director Sakata. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, and also I'd like to thank you all again for that hard work. And then also Nathan, really thanks for all your leadership on the round table down there. I mean, all of you guys, all your work on the round table. And I, I know it takes a lot of extra time, and, but you guys do a wonderful do job down there when I have the opportunity to listen in virtually. It's always wonderful to see all the participation you guys have down there. So thanks for all that hard work as well. Thank you. <clears throat> Further discussion? Seeing none, uh, we have a motion to pass agenda item 6A and is it A and B together? Uh, just A. A, thank you. Okay. Um, all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, please indicate by saying nay. Motion carries. Thank you. And thank you, Nathan, Amber, and Leroy for coming to visit us. Okay, cool. Oops. Uh, I just need that last slide there yet. Uh, and so I've got one more staff recommendation for item 6B is to approve the loan request from the Trinchera Conservancy District. And we have Monty Smith online, who's the director. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'd just like to say uh, thank you so much uh, to the CWCB board for uh, considering this. Um, it's extremely important to us and these the Trinchera uh, subdistrict has a has a huge debt uh, or uh, we we owe a lot of water to to mostly the the reach three the lower reach of the Rio Grande and the proximity of this uh, particular uh, property and water just fits what we need you know perfectly and uh, so I just thank you so much for your consideration and it's been wonderful to uh, to work with everyone with Cole and everyone else and uh, I have uh, with me a couple of our team members Jason Lorenz with Agro Engineering who uh, serves as our subdistrict engineer and then Judy Lopez also uh, has been assisting us in in this uh, process. So with that, uh, we'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. And, and thanks again for your consideration. Any questions on agenda item 6B for Monty? Thank you very much for joining us. Go ahead, Director Dutton. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks, Monty and Judy and Jason for being here. Good to see you guys. And um, you're welcome to stay the rest of the day because it's nice to have some friendly faces up there on the Zoom screen. Uh, again, you know, I this this is a pretty neat relationship here. I think you guys have heard a lot about the sub districts and especially under the leadership of the Rio Grande Water Conservation District. But where Castilla County wasn't included in in the <laughs> conservation district, the Trinchera Conservancy District really stepped up to help figure out you know groundwater management over in their area. And so here we've got you know, a conservation district and a conservancy districts and then two groundwater management districts within them working together. And so just really applaud you guys on this complex project and all your leadership and figuring out ways that we can really make this water work harder. And, and I would note from my earlier statement, um, you know, we hate to see stuff dried up, but this is an example of by working together, hopefully we can minimize the impact on ag in our area. And so uh, thanks again, guys. So good to see you here. And um, with that, I would move staff recommendation on agenda item 6B. Thank you. Thank you, Director Brody with a second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, uh, we have a motion to approve agenda item 6B. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, please indicate by saying nay. And the motion carries. Thank you so much, Monty, Jason, Judy, uh, Nathan, Amber, Leroy, and Cole. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now you are back. 
for 15B7, correct, Kirk? Okay. That's correct. Am I back on track here? 15B7. Okay, and before you get started, um, I'm going to ask the Southeast Conservancy, Conservancy District um, to come up. We have five seats, and I believe there's four of you, so we should have plenty of room. Let's one, two, three, four, right over here. Please join us and welcome. Thank you for coming in person. <laughs> oh, that's the one right there. <laughs> Okay, Kirk, if you'd like to introduce our guests. Thank you, Madam Chair. Kirk Russell, Finance Section Chief, for the record. Um, this is agenda item 15B7, and uh, thank the board to, uh, for moving this agenda item up. The uh, Southeast District Board is meeting tomorrow, and uh, the request came in that they would really want to uh, speak to the board, and I, I think this opportunity is, is perfect. So I would like to welcome the, uh, the members from Southeast District, the President Bill Long, Jim Broderick, the Executive Director, um, Chris Wootka, the uh, Project Manager for the, the Arc Valley Conduit, and Christine Arbogast, their uh, Legislative Liaison. And I, I will share with this board that, that I've had the fortunate maybe unfortunate to work on this project for many of the years I've been employed at CWCB. And, uh, you know, you get, you just feel like you're with family when, uh, when you're together with folks that you spend that much time with. And so I know that uh, for me, the movement that this project, this Arc Valley Conduit, Conduit has seen in the last couple of years has, has felt lightning fast compared to the, the glacial speed it was moving back 15 years ago or so. I can't imagine this group They've been working on this uh, for many, many years prior to that. And so there's a lot of excitement that some progress is being made and the opportunity that this board has to participate in the project, um, not only now, but in, in prior uh, legislative actions, I think is, uh, is very fortunate. And so I'm gonna do a quick introduction of the project and turn this over to uh, Bill Long to speak to the board. Um, this. Uh, Act, this item will be an action item tomorrow when we do the entire um, spectrum of projects bill items. So I would like this to just be a, um, a non-action item at this point, and we'll address the um, action tomorrow. Could I have the slides put up, Anna? So a quick introduction of the project and a little bit of history of, of where we've been, the CWCB, with this project. Um, in... Uh, House Bill 20, 1403, uh, this board, along with the sponsors, put forth a $100 million loan grant package, and it was $90 million in loans and $10 million in grants, and that was to the Southeast District's Enterprise Fund. And it had a caveat that the, the district would come back to CWCB to, to talk about how they were going to divvy up the $10 million in grant. I think at the time there was, they weren't quite sure where it would be applied. Things were in flux with the, with the Bureau and the Bureau's design of the main trunk line. And so we requested that they come back and identify before we end up contracting for that $10 million. And at the time they had asked for close to $20 million and we were only able to fund 10. I think this board would have been um, willing to go higher if we had the, the money available. And so, um, the request now is to increase the $10 million grant portion of that package to $30 million with an additional $20 million. And this, uh, this additional money, along with the original 10, so that $30 million is proposed to be used for finishing the design of all of the spurs. And so the, and Bill will probably get uh, into this deeper, but the trunk line is designed and constructed by the Bureau of Reclamation. So if you can imagine the spine that runs down the Arkansas River, and then all of the uh, connecting um, pipelines that go to the municipalities and water users along the system are to be funded by the local entity, or in this case, they're uh, coordinated with the district. And so that $30 million will be used to finish the design of all those connections and the construction or a majority of the construction of the cluster type um, pipelines. And so with that, I. I I included the feasibility study, and you probably see several pages under this agenda item uh, that starts to outline all of the details of where the money will be spent on those connection points. 
and there's about 100 miles of those spur and delivery lines. The main trunk spine is uh, pipeline is about 130 miles. So um, with that, uh, this, the, the momentum that we're seeing from the federal government in assisting here, um, they're looking at uh, getting some uh, water delivered, maybe even as early as 2028. And so that is uh, that's great news. The schedule is, uh, is much improved. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, President Bill Long. You can stay there or you can come up here either way. You're fine there and there's a button on the mic. Is it on? Thank you. It good? is. You're okay. good. You're great. live. Great. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, and I do apologize that we had to request a, a or yeah, a request to do it today rather than tomorrow. Not only is it our regular meeting, but it's our publicly noticed budget hearing tomorrow. So it would have been a little bit difficult to make that change. So again, thank you for accommodating us today. I want to begin by um, reinforcing what Kirk just mentioned in regards to the previous um, commitment you folks made to the Arkansas Valley Conduit. Jim and I and Christine have worked on this project for the past 20 years. The first 17 years, we maybe um, obtained appropriations of between five and $10 million over that 17 years. But after uh, the state of Colorado, CWCB, made the commitment to provide a $90 million loan and $10 million grant, it did in fact completely turn things around with the federal government. We now have approximately $111 million uh, for construction, uh, which is a, again, a big change over the past or previous 17 years. You folks absolutely made the difference in this project becoming a viable project. Uh, Chris Woodcuss provided to you um, previously or to the staff, and I think he's shared it with everyone, or Kirk has shared it with everyone. Um, more information and background on the project itself, how, how it impacts each and every community in the Arkansas Valley. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, hoping that maybe you've had a chance to see some of it, but we do have staff here that can answer the more technical questions if you have those. Um, nearly all of the water systems in the Arkansas Valley, or, or approximately half of them, have drinking water enforcement orders. What we haven't talked a lot about is many of those same communities, in addition to other communities also have, that are participants, also have wastewater discharge problems as well. This project will also address that as well. So not only are we addressing drinking water standards, we will be able to be in compliance with the water we return back to the river, which in our view is uh, environmentally friendly and, and what we need to do and what we should all be doing. Um, this area of the state, as you, I think you well know, is one of the most disadvantaged, similar to the San Luis Valley in struggling with economic development. Uh, another benefit of the Arkansas Valley, we've always been challenged with being able to deliver wa additional water and especially additional clean water to um, any enterprise that wanted to move into the Arkansas Valley. So this too will help in our efforts in attracting growth and development in the lower Arkansas Valley. Um, today's request uh, of the additional $20 million uh, for, in grant um, will help these disadvantaged areas meet the different goals that we've set for ourselves. I want to especially thank Kirk and his staff and, and the board and Becky uh, for all the work you've done. Um, in this effort and your support. I don't think I have anything else to say. Uh, we'd like to answer questions if you have them, but uh, Christine Arbogast uh, has a couple of comments she would like to make regarding uh, our federal funding. I don't see any comments yet, so we'll let, go ahead, Christine. Thank you. So just very, very briefly, um, as Bill said, the last action that you took on a very tearful evening <laughs> was a turning point. And this additional action will, I think, further spur the administration to cut loose what now is a lot of available money. Um, the timing for the ABC could not be better. 
when put in conjunction with the bipartisan infrastructure bill, um, we are we are enjoying support and enthusiasm from the Bureau of Reclamation, and I must say also from the Office of Management and Budget that we never dreamed of seeing. And of course, having a big pile of money uh, makes it easier for them to support us. But for every dollar that the state puts in, it, it, it's a strong signal that matches that support we have from the congressional delegation to encourage them to build this project, but most importantly, to build it faster. We, you know, we were looking at a 15 year construction schedule. And when we asked them to accelerate it and, and dedicate five years of infrastructure bill money to accelerate it and get it completed in, in six or seven years, no one blinked. So um, it, what you're doing as a partner in this project makes a huge difference on the federal side. So thank you. So I had to check with Chris to make sure I would be correct, but we'll actually be able to deliver clean water to the Boone and Avondale uh, areas in 2024. So um, we're actually hoping to be delivering water to the majority of the uh, participants in the 2028, 20, 29 uh, time period. Again, with your additional funding, uh, that will make that possible. So thank you. Thank you so much, Director Mitchell. Um, I, I get emotional when I talk about this project because I, I've worked in the Arkansas Valley. Um, and so this may not be the first time I've been emotional about this project. Um, on the sad side, this project's been in the works so long, I don't have any questions because we've been working on this so long and so long together. Um, and so I, I, I just want to make sure that the board knows what this project means, because I don't think everyone that's sitting here now knows was here the last time we had a, a, a big, big vote on this and really if if you haven't seen the areas that ABC is going to deliver clean water to you, you may not know how important this is and why um, these folks have worked on this project for 20 years. Um, you, you don't work on the same thing for 20 years because it doesn't mean something you work on something for 20 years because it's going to change lives and um, that is the case with this project. Um, I, I Kirk has invested a ton in this, but the people that we see you're 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 called to the hot seat because um, our work is not possible without those that are sitting there so. I need to tell you how much I appreciate um, the commitment that you all have had. Every basin in this state is important. Every person in this state is important. Every square inch of land is important. Um, and this clean water is um, definitely something that can make a difference in, in people's lives. And you can see the impact that it has when it's not available and you can see the impact that it has when it is and so I, I need to thank you um, for your work, I know that some of what we did helped loosen the purse strings on the DC side. Um, but it, it wouldn't be possible without the, the two decades of commitment of you all sitting there so um, thank you. And I'm, I'm sure Director Felt will have something to say too. Mm -hmm. Director Felt and then uh, Director Hawkins, I see that you have a comment as well. Well, I would like to start by um, thanking all of the board members who were on the board before I came on in 2020, who uh, during Jack Goebel's time, who had the courage and the foresight and the heart to commit a uh, hundred million dollars to this project that was truly a game changer and it truly took something that uh, over 60 years maybe was sort of this constantly receding horizon type of project to all of a sudden um, it's it's here and 
I'm extremely proud of our staff. And I guess I should disclose, I am on the board of Southeastern too, but <laughs> I'm very proud of our Southeastern staff, the way they have mobilized uh, in the face of this incredible surge in funding. I'm from the upper basin. We get supplemental water from the Friar project. We benefit tremendously from the voluntary flow management program. This project won't directly affect us in terms of uh, our day-to-day -day life, but I can tell you from people who are involved in water in the upper basin, uh, but there is tremendous support for this project there too. And in large measure, it's, I think, viewed as a moral imperative. And I think that's how the board um, in, in 2019, 20, uh, in there saw it as well. Um, and so I, I just want to add on to Director Mitchell's comments. Um, I have spoken to you at times about the impact that local funding that we've done up in Chafee County has had on our ability to fund landscape scale um, initiatives in our area in the upper basin. And this is another example, when you come to the table with local money, meaning Colorado money, how impactful that is. And when we had our um, gathering with both US senators um, a month ago or so, um, the energy in the room was, was really electric. And when you have the ability to invest in something that is really not controversial from a political standpoint, everybody's supportive we need to build on those opportunities that's how we get back on track for all kinds of challenges we face is to to support and engage in some of these clear and obvious pathways to success so i just want to support president long's comments christine's comments director mitchell's comments and say um, i really hope we'll support this tomorrow it is an incredible uh, turn of events for southeast colorado Thank you, Director Felt. <clears throat> Director Hawkins. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairwoman. I'm sorry that I'm not here in person today, but wanted to thank you for coming and talking to the board today. Uh, really wanted to thank you for leveraging the state's investment um, to bring additional federal dollars into this project. I think this is an example that everyone in the state should be looking to as we're looking at the next few years in Colorado. Um, and also just wanted to end with, um, I, I just wanted to underscore that I heard when we approved this initial round of funding a few years ago that there are families without clean water. And so it's not just about accelerating a timeline to get a project done, it's about bringing real families the the water and service that they deserve so thank you again this project can't happen fast enough and it's probably one of the more important projects i have approved in my tenure on this board so thank you thank you director hawkins is there any further comment from the board director anderson i uh I really salute your efforts. I remember when you were here the last time and and it's exciting to see it come to, to happen. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I remember hearing that the drinking water in that area was essentially, you couldn't drink it. And gosh, everybody in Colorado ought to have water. In a headwater state, we ought to have water that you can open your tap and make coffee and cook with and whatever so thank you folks thanks again i'd just like to echo the comments of my fellow board members um it it was an impressive lift in 2020 and it's no less impressive now and jim um you're one of my favorite water leaders your quiet mm -hmm. and effective leadership has really move the needle on this. And my dear friend, Christine, this is just phenomenal work. Um, President Long, Chris, thank you so much. We're so pleased to have you here. And uh, if there's anything you'd like to say before we move on, um, please go ahead. I just want to say thank you again. Thank you, thank you, thank you. 
Okay, Kirk, I if, think if I may. Oh, yes, please. Madam Chairman. Um, the energy in the room when Bennett and Hickenlooper were there after the announcement of the 60 million was really amazing. They're like a comedy act together. It was really fun. But um, more to come. There'll be a groundbreaking in the spring. The first um, contract has been awarded. And, and uh, we're really pleased that BOR made a special effort to get that awarded so that construction could start in the spring. And um, so stay tuned for that date, because we'd love to have you all there. Kirk, Madam thank, Chair. thank you for thank your you. work. You're not going to go unnoticed. It's been a career's worth of work. I think we can probably come up with an award for Kirk. <laughs> really? <laughs> just for this project. Um, but thank you. Go ahead. Um, I wanted to, uh, well, first off, I'd like to correct the record. Jim Broderick is not quiet. quiet. I don't know. <laughs> I would like the minutes to reflect that that was an error on the chair's part, but okay. Um, with that said, I wanted to, uh, you know, I introduced this item as uh, informational only so we could keep them bundled tomorrow, but I certainly, we can, we can do that different if you prefer. But one thing that I wanted to talk about tomorrow, and, and as I think about it, it's probably better to discuss it today with our guests. Um, one of the components of this uh, recommendation, when we originally did the $90 million, um, I'm sorry, the $100 million loan grant package, we did it to the Southeast District and it was in the projects bill accordingly. And so in this next, in this year's bill, again, assuming the, the board approves this and the, the sponsors agree to it, we need to uh, modify the last projects bill that this was in to direct this funding to the Otero County Enterprise. And that is, it has to do with Tabor and the district's um, needs to, to use the money in a different way in order to get it to where it will be used. And, and there's still probably some work to be done. They do have an agreement with Otero County to utilize their enterprise fund. But I think if the board had any questions about that component of this while our guests are here, there, it could be beneficial. But I, I believe we'll be able to work through those details in this project's bill as well. Thank you, Director Felt. Oh. Well, does anybody have any questions on that second part of the fiscal agent element? No. It sounds like not. Well, Madam Chair, I and Kevin uh, Kirk, I would ask. Um, I know Kirk recommended that we take this in order tomorrow, but we have our guests here today. We have a Southeast board meeting tomorrow. I don't know if you know all know, but I basically miss every other one because of CWCB. Um, I would love for them to be able to go home with good news uh, today, and so if. Nobody objects. I would like to move the staff recommendation for item 15B. Seven. 15B7. 15B7. Yes. Uh, the two staff recommendations for the $20 million in severance tax funding um, and the change to the, uh, the previous arrangement allowing Otero County to act as the fiscal agent. Thank you. I'm seeing that that is possible from the head nodding and uh, Director Dutton has snuck in there with a second before you're even finished with your motion. So I'll ask, <laughs> are you, is that that motion still good for you? Yeah. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, please indicate by saying nay. And the motion carries. Thank you so much. Madam Chair, Madam Chair. Yes. Before Director our guests Sikata. go away, um, if I could, because I really respect you guys a lot and all your involvement in water issues, and I'm going to put you back on the hot seat, especially since I haven't heard anything from Mr. Broderick. Um, what advice would you give us for the next 20 years? I mean, what, what do you see going forward and what things should we be watching out for? Um, <clears throat> well, yeah. yeah. Um, so thank you for saying that I'm quiet. I've never heard that before. You didn't uh, say a word until now. So I don't know what all these people are talking I, about. I, 
I don't either. When you have a, a solid team, you get out of the way and let them do their business. Uh, that would be the first thing I would say to you uh, from a perspective of continuing and never stopping. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example so you can understand creativity as well. A few years ago, we were uh, before the Bureau uh, in DC and they were talking about, well, we had to put a zero in your budget. Um, and for us, that was devastating um, from, a, from a standpoint of moving the project. However, we did make a point that zero is a number, <laughs> just in case if they forgot, and that please keep this project moving because just because zero is today, doesn't mean the project won't get built in the future. We work very hard as a team. There's no one person. Um, whether you know it or not, Kirk is part of our world. We love that. And, and so we work really hard to talk about what we need to do, how we do it from different perspectives. Um, we work really hard at that. Um, we ask for people to help us. We use skill sets everywhere. Um, we use CWCB all the time. You have a, a, an unbelievable staff and have had an unbelievable staff for many, many years. Um, um, I, I think the main thing is to look to the future because you're not, you're not taking care of today. You're taking care of the future. The, the people that we represent and people we're working for now are, are the next generation. Are, are, we're standing on the shoulders of the people before us that put a piece in and said, this should help. And your obligation now is to say in the next year, what do you really need to do? Because we might need to look at it differently. I would say, don't be afraid to change. Don't be afraid to and be creative. Um, and um, I guess that's all I would say. It, it's it's to us when you guys talk about this project. Uh, it's hard for me to maintain my composure, um, but we all feel the same. So it, for the Arkansas Basin. Uh, the Arkansas Basin Roundtable, it's their number one project, so thank you for that. Uh, we thank you. You don't see that part of the basin much, uh, pretty far down there, and I, I can just say to you, they all are very appreciative for your efforts to bring a project that's taken 60 years uh, to develop. We're all old enough that we were all sitting in or near um, the stadium when President Kennedy announced the project. It's kind of ironic, to, I hate to say that, a long time ago. Um, and, and, the, and the represent the people we represent, I think it's time to build it. 60 years is an awful long time to wait for a project. So thank you. I hope that answers your question. I was explaining this project to someone the other day, and I said Kennedy, and they said, like, the president that long ago? And I was like, yeah, that long ago. So again, kudos. I think Christine has one more. Of course. <laughs> Question, Bob, by saying partnership. You, you go so much further down the path to yes if you don't try to go it alone and you bring everybody you can in. And, and, you know, that never, I've been involved in several projects and this one's controversy was money. Not, not necessarily any easier hurdle to, to clear than environmental opposition or some of the other things, um, in some ways harder. And so we're blessed by the, the action of the infrastructure bill for sure. But that path to yes, 
is takes hard work and partnering is the way you get there. Okay, unless there's anything further, thank you so much again. So we're going to have a check in real quick. It is my experience that um, no one likes to have the middle of the day hungry and already getting a bad start on all of the important things we have left to do. So um, it is now 20 minutes until our lunch break and we have three, four agenda items remaining. Can we look at taking a shift here? Uh -huh. I yeah we can we can um, we can take a shift I would I would suggest us see how far we can get before the noon hour um, and go from there. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, agenda item seven. All right. Good morning, Michelle Garrison, CWCB staff presenting uh, agenda item seven, a Colorado River hydrology update. This will be just a really quick informational item. Next slide, please. In fact, next slide, please. We'll go a little faster since, <laughs> since I'm standing between us and lunch, we'll go faster. All right, um, so precipitation um, for the basin. On the left, you'll see uh, the precipitation for water year 2021, which was below, well below average across the entire basin. Water year 2022 that ended at the end of September um, was a little better. You see it coming out pretty close to average. Um, but of course, with the dry soil moisture, um, that didn't mean that the runoff was close to average. It was quite a ways below average. Um, and now you see the beginning of water year 2023 on the right. Um, that's the month of October where some parts of the basin, um, particularly some lower elevation spots, uh, ended up above average, but a good chunk of the basin is still at or below average. Next slide, please. Um, soil moisture. So um, a lot of the struggles with the really poor uh, ineff inefficient runoff um, started uh, after 2020 when it got so dry. So on the left, you'll see the soil moisture from fall of the modeled soil moisture that they used to make their runoff predictions. Um, on the left is uh, 2020 after that really, really super dry summer and fall. Um, and it takes several years um, to come back from that, which is what we're seeing with the continued inefficient runoff. Um, in the middle, you'll see um, the estimated soil moisture from fall of 2021, a year ago, um, with some improvement, but still in Colorado in particular, um, quite a bit of the basin was below average. Um, and now on the right is their initial estimate of um, the soil moisture going into November of 2022. Um, which still for quite a bit of the basin is below average. So I think we're gonna continue to expect um, the, the runoff forecast from our snowpack will be a little lower than usual um, given what holds. So some of those areas haven't seen that much precipitation. It's only that it hasn't melted and it's still sitting in some places as snow. Um, uh, for Colorado, that was blue after one of the storms. And then as we continue to go into the snowpack accumulation season, um, we're quickly approaching um, average. Um, which is what you'll see on the right. And just a reminder um, on the graph on the right um, that you're looking at um, the black that you can just barely see um, is this year um, and the pink was um, last year. And I can't control those colors. I'm sorry, those are really hard to see. Um, so we started with a couple of good storms that put us above average and now we're kind of looking at, at close to average. We're supposed to get um, you know, a little bit tomorrow and then um, maybe a dry period for a few days. And can I actually advance the slides? Have I been, sorry. <laughs> All right, runoff. I'm not paying very much attention here this morning. Um, so runoff, um, has been below average, but a lot better than um, we started last year. Um, so we're running just, just a little below average, but not nearly as low as we were in 2021, um, which is a little better start to the year. But again, most of the season is ahead of us. Uh, so climate forecasts, um, you'll see on the left, the predictions for November, um, which um, show an increased chance at least parts of the basin, a slightly increased chance of um, 
above average precipitation, um, and for the southern part of the basin, an increased chance of, of higher than normal temperatures. Looking out into December, January, February, um, the basin shows an increased chance of above average temperature and below average precipitation. So again, not expecting necessarily from these forecasts a banner year, but but these are out quite a bit, and um, the El Nino and La Nina for, uh, signals that these are based on aren't very strong for Colorado, so um, it's not particularly meaningful at this time of year. Um, storage conditions, um, you'll see continue to be poor in the upper basin. Uh, Blue Mesa is only 33% uh, full, Navajo is only half full, um, and Lake Powell is at 25% and will continue to drop over the winter. Um, this is a time of the year when there's not much inflow coming in and the releases are larger, so uh, we always expect Lake Powell to drop during this time of, this time of the year. Flaming Gorge is sitting at 71% full and will continue to drop as the DROA releases from Flaming Gorge uh, for this year continue. So they've released only about half so far of the DROA releases that they're expected to make. And on the right was just a reminder of um, where we ended up in, in terms of runoff, which for Lake Powell was about 63% of average out of 100% of average precipitation. So uh, expecting some more of that this next year. Um, and so right now, if you look at, if we were to get roughly average precipitation for the rest of the season, um, we would expect runoff to look more like 80%, uh, which is a huge improvement, but is not enough to recover the reservoirs. Um, so in terms of um, forecasts at Lake Powell, I apologize. Uh, the graphic on the left is a little bit outdated. This is the, the one that came out in the middle of September. Um, the October, um, and the October one looks um, similar. We have not seen the November one yet, um, but you can see the big spread <laughs> at the end. Um, but, but except for an exceptional year, we're expecting below average for next year. Uh, is is that and on the right, you can see a reminder of where we've been in terms of releases um, sometimes we get that question, so where are we at Lee ferry uh, flow um, that average 10 year uh, flow at Lee ferry is still over 85 million acre feet so. Um, the lower basin has continued the upper basin um, and Lake Powell have continued to provide water. Um, to the lower basin and to Lake Mead in terms of drought activities the upper basin drought contingency plan components. Um, continue to move along. We're still operating under the uh, May 22 to April 2023 um, drought response operations plan. Those those releases from Flaming Gorge are occurring as expected. Um, weather modification and demand management feasibility investigations are the other two portions. Those also continue. Um, and for the lower base in Mexico, continued DCP conservation. They're still operating this year in tier one shortage. Um, and working on um, their 500 plus plan. Um, going forward, um, we've been over some of this. Um, we had the emergency releases in 2021, plus the planned draw releases in 2022. We are now working on, as Commissioner Mitchell said, the, the plans for 2023 and probably an update for 2022 in terms of looking at um, changing the monthly releases from Lake Powell in early 2023 to hold back more water during that time of year when it usually drops and release that later in the year. Um, in terms of what this means for the lower basin, um, you can see um, the red arrow indicates uh, the 2022 operations in tier one shortage um, plus DCP contributions, which are made by Arizona, Nevada, and Mexico. Um, for 2023, again, they're in, they will be now in tier 2A shortage, um, which again impacts um, Arizona, Nevada, and Mexico, um, and um, at a slightly higher amount. So between um, actual delivery reductions plus the ability to recolor some previously stored ICS water will be 720,000 acre feet. Um, and then um, California starts contributing under these things under the DCP um, at shortage 2B. So there's still no contribution from California at this level. Um, in terms of updates to forecasting and modeling, um, Reclamation will be releasing a new version of CRSS soon. Um, 
including some important updates for the upper basin that better represent um, shortages and demands in the upper basin. Um, Colorado and the other up in the Red basin states worked quite a bit with them on that, um, as well as um, some updates to reservoir capacity curves and some other things, trying to get ready for the post 2026 modeling that'll need to occur later in the year. Um, a quick update on the 500 plus plan and where they are. Um, the original goal, I think, was a million acre feet by the end of 2023. Right now, the cumulative total for the, the end of 2023, um, as modeled in the August 24 month study, is about 318,000 acre feet. Some of the plans they put in place have been offset by uh, ICS deliveries to certain entities. Um, those can change throughout the year. So this is what was projected in August, um, but they have until the end of the calendar year to figure out exactly where they landed. Um, just a reminder, uh, Commissioner Mitchell gave an update to you on this, um, continuing to work on the Upper Basin Five Point Plan. So a lot of hard work on trying to get the system conservation pilot program reauthorized and up and ready to run as quickly as possible. We will quickly run out of time to um, have have enough time to get proposals in and reviewed and back to this board the role of this board in that process uh, under system conservation pilot program has been um, to uh, approve those as part of a, a state approved conservation plan so that they get the protection um, from uh, from uh, losing that water that that HCU and water court that's the, the role of this board so stay tuned we will be back to you um, the 2023 doubt response operations plan. Um, we're, we're starting to work with uh, reclamation on that, but again, the final plan does not come out until next April. Um, the demand management feasibility investigation. Um, Colorado has, you know, done a lot of work on that. Um, and then uh, the UCRC is starting to summarize the work of its contractors. And so we'll see some more information from that coming out later. Um, we continue to work with the UCRC and reclamation on plans for the bipartisan infrastructure funding uh, for the upper basin that's going to mean a lot of um, additional equipment measurement equipment um, because. Uh, because SCPP and other things in the upper basin uh, have to consider return flows and other things that they don't in the lower basin it takes a lot more equipment a lot more monitoring to, to make those things function, and so that's where we're focusing that. Um, and then, of course, the Strict Water Rights Administration, um, Colorado has always <laughs> um, done priority administration. Um, and so um, that's been a big piece. Uh, and in addition to the interstate conservation efforts, UCRC is now trying to put together a little more information about all the things the upper basin states do in terms of conservation. And Colorado has been a leader there. Um, so trying to get that message out a little more about the things that Colorado does do. Yeah along with its upper basin neighbors. Um, and just quickly, uh, Commissioner Mitchell <laughs> mentioned, um, there are gonna be a whole lot of NEPA processes going on that people are gonna have to um, uh, track. Um, they'd already kind of started their timeline for the post 2026 one in terms of um, the, the initial um, notice of intent just to get kind of general comments back. Um, and then later in 2023, we expect the actual process to kick off. But in the interim, <laughs> they just announced that supplemental EIS for the current interim guidelines to look at some flexibility to release even less from Powell and Mead. Um, so that's kicking off kind of immediately with a very short time frame. In addition, they announced uh, one for Glen Canyon Dam short term operational alternatives to try to prevent um, the establishment of smallmouth bass below Glen Canyon Dam as Lake Powell continues to drop. Um, the the warm water at the top is getting lower and lower and closer to the turbines. And so um, you're starting to see um, an increased likelihood of passing warm water sports fish down below. And so they're, they're looking at whether or not they can do some short term things um, within the current interim guidelines, but just some short term actions to try to prevent some of that, um, as well as the post 2023 um, NEPA for the Upper Colorado and San Juan River recovery programs, we're getting close on determining kind of the funding and structure of those going forward. Um, and uh, they've been told by ecological services that their NEPA for the programs is stale and they'd like to see a new one based on the post 2023. And then there are some other ones that will um, that can impact some of these things, including uh, the Wolf Creek Reservoir uh, NEPA. Um, 
and uh, the White River Management Plan, um, the actions there will will be um, considered as part of that post 2023. There was appeal 566 for small watersheds. So uh, and paradox. So there's a bunch of those that we'll be tracking. And if it, if there's anything important, uh, we'll get back to you. And that is the end of my presentation. Are there any questions? Thank you, Michelle. I have a question. Um, just clarification sure. on the drawer releases uh -huh. <clears throat> out of the what six 61 total that we released from 2022 mm -hmm. to 2023 how much of that has been released to date do you know all right so um the 161 plus about 250,000 of the um 500,000 that's supposed to come from Fleming Gorge so Fleming Gorge is about half so we'd be looking at um 410 out of the 661 and by March we will be at the full 661,000. Okay, thank you very much for that clarification. Um, and I also wanted to note one of the great things about director Mitchell's uh, director's report is that she had written on there the inflow. Um, versus the use of the lower basin. I just wanted to make sure that everybody caught that. Inflow is 6.084, use is 6.680. Um, really appreciate you keeping us up to date on this. Um, and my final question to you was regarding that last NEPA, who said that this was stale for the recovery program? <laughs> um, Fish and Wildlife Service Ecological Services said they would like to see a new one on the programs themselves as Fish and Wildlife Service signs agreements with the state of Colorado and the other states and, and participants. Um, that would be the, the trigger for just updating as a, an uh, environmental, as an EA um, okay. for the programs. Thank you. That covered my questions. Yes, Director Felt. Madam Chair, I, I just wanted to check your figures. You made it sound like the outflows we're bigger than the inflows. That doesn't make sense. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you heard me correctly. It was not my error. Yes, Director Sakata. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Michelle, this is probably a dumb question, but what is the, what acronym ICS? Intentionally created surplus. Okay. So the lower basin can, entities in the lower basin can purposely tell reclamation we're going to save this much water don't deliver it to us they get credit for that in lake mead to take at a later date and so one of the things we're seeing is when it's really critical to protect lake mead if they're having a bad water year otherwise they can ask for that to be released and actually draw lake Mead down faster while they're also trying to help do things to prop it up thank you mm -hmm. um any other comments questions from the board I guess I'll just say something else because I was going to save it for my director's report tomorrow, but um, we're on the agenda item and I know I'm the one pushing us to move faster, but um, yeah. uh, no one's hungry. Um, anyway, you know, when we were on the lower basin tour a couple weeks ago, it was not lost on me the connection that the water users we met had to um, their operations and their water and how um, similar that is to our producers in Colorado and the connection that we have to our land and our water. Um, and I think all of us recognize the importance of bringing some of those water users up to the upper basin as we watch um, thousands of CFS in full canals in November uh, pass by, and then we get on the bus and we have conversations about the importance of 1.7 CFS traveling down a ditch and how that is the difference between a good year and a bad year in some cases. Um, and so even though we poke at these reports, um, because I think we are all offended by uh, the ability of the lower basin to comply with the goals that they've set for themselves and, and their participation in the basin in general, 
<clears throat> I think we can all feel for the individual water users and the importance of us trying to find uh, areas of unity and respect and, and that should carry forward. Um, and so I hope that as part of our role that we can look at educating some of the lower basin uh, water users on how we use water and and though those amounts are are very different, um, I think that could go a long way. And so thank you for letting me take up a few minutes uh, on this item by mentioning that. If there are no other comments, we'll move forward, but it's okay if there are. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Great report. All right, we're moving forward into, um, oh yes. Agenda item eight, Colorado Airborne Snow Monitoring Funding Request and Update. And we have with us yeah. Eric Sky online. And then I believe in person, Emily Carbone and Scott Griebling. Is that correct? Hi. You're welcome to sit down or you can come to the podium, whichever you feel comfortable with. But Eric's gonna be introducing you. Mm -hmm. I'll do my best to introduce them, Director Mitchell. <laughs> well, well, good. I don't want to keep you from your uh, jam band that you have going. <laughs> so I hope that this is going to be the best introduction of the day. <laughs> oh, I should have thought of that. I should have grabbed one of the guitars for this. <laughs> They're right behind you. I know. <laughs> Well, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the board. Um, for the record, my name is Eric Skye, CWCB staff, and I'm just going to be introducing agenda item eight today. Um, I do apologize for the misnomer on the agenda. It does say funding request, but that won't happen until tomorrow for agenda item 15B1. This is an informational only item and a follow-up from the July 2022 board meeting where the CHASM group was before you previously. They discussed a WSRF study looking at expanding airborne snow observatories work throughout the state of Colorado. And one of the requests from the board during that meeting was what would it take to expedite expansion of that program? So today we have Emily Carbone with Northern Colorado Water Conservancy District and Scott Griebling with St. Vrain and Left Hand Water Conservancy District. They're both incredible members of the CHASM planning team, and they're going to follow up with you all today and discuss what it would take to expedite this program expansion and what we're doing now to work on that. So Emily and Scott, the floor is yours. I still can't get over your background. Can you send that to me so that can be my background on Zoom <laughs> on? I'll take a picture of my office and send it your way. That would be, that'd be great. Welcome, Emily. Thanks, and thanks, Eric. I always enjoy your background. Um, but yeah, thanks for having us. Um, and uh, as Eric said, I'm representing the CHASM planning team, uh, Scott and I are, and um, the CHASM planning team has been, been around for a few years now. We're a statewide stakeholder group to increase the availability and utility of airborne snow measurement. Um, as a quick reminder, ASO is a technology that uses LIDAR to uh, retrieve high resolution full basin um, snow water equivalent, the snow depth and snow water equivalent data. Um, and this is an invaluable complement to station based snow measurements. Um, and then, oops, wrong one. Um, so we'll just do a really quick uh, program over overview and look at 2023 activities, and then Scott will talk about some priorities for program expansion. Oops. Uh, this is just an example of what the ASO data looks like. Um, this is in the, the Blue River Basin. Um, and these are some images from a, um, an ASO report. Um, and this is a, a table um, from the WSRF report that Eric was talking about um, that was produced this past year. And uh, this was produced by Paige Weil, who's the um, consultant that's been working on this project with us um, on facilitation. And it shows it's a roadmap of um, how we expect and propose um, for the growth of the CHASM uh, project to move forward. Um, and that starts with uh, 2022, this past year, where we had a record of 14 snow measurement flights. 
um, as well as experimenting with uh, incorporating ASO data into the forecasts um, and also working on testing the flight planning coordination group. Um, and then moving toward the full um, program build out, which um, we hope would include um, sustainable federal and state funding um, and uh, flights in all of the high elevation basins um, the, uh, at whatever the necessary frequency we determine, we determine to be is or the, that is determined to be necessary. Um, and uh, so I'll focus on the 2023 program expansion really quickly. Um, so this year we're looking at uh, starting to um, expand the program and we're targeting 24 surveys across 11 states that's increasing from the 14 this past year and also we're working on improved streamflow forecasting and also increasing engagement with water users from different sectors so if any of you do have feedback about um, for example engaging more with the ag sector we'd definitely be Welcome to any feedback on that. These are some maps of what was done in 2022, thanks to the water plan grant that we received. Um, these are the snow-free flights. Um, and the snow-free data is a necessary um, base data for getting snow measurement flights. And um, it just needs to be flown once or if the land cover changes, uh, but it's necessary before you can get the snow measurement flights. The gray areas are the areas of the state that are generally covered with snow on April 1st. The um, dark tan areas are where we already had snow free coverage. And then the light tan areas are where um, we had snow free data um, that was funded by the 2022 water plan grant. Um, and so you can see we've expanded that area significantly. So we have much more opportunity for um, airborne snow observatory uh, flights um, in Colorado than we had before. There are also multiple benefits of the snow-free data. Um, for example, we flew in the Colorado headwaters, which was impacted by the East Troublesome Fire. And so this uh, snow-free data can be used for monitoring the, the impacts of the wildfire. This is a map of the current and future snowpack measurements. Um, the dark blue areas are where we flew in 2022, again, thanks to the water plan grant. And then the light blue areas are where we're planning to expand um, for 2023 measurements. So we'll be flying the, the um, dark blue and light blue areas. And then the, um, the red and green areas, we have this snow free data as the base for the snow measurements. So they're, they're ready for flights but we don't have funding for 2023 yet, but we hope to fly those basins in future years. And um, so, yeah, thank you again uh, for your support for the water plan grant and um, I'll pass it on to Scott Griebling to talk about priorities for exp expediting our program expansion. Thank you. thank you. And just to be clear, if you'll move back one slide, so today, are we going to talk about the basins that are ready for flights but lack funding and what Scott's going to discuss? No. Okay. <laughs> I don't believe so, at least. We can well, it's, feel... It's part of it. It's, but, it's um... all part of it. I'll, I'll talk about some of the barriers and some of the opportunities that we could focus on to expand the program, and those will be indirectly covered. Thank you. As far as expansion, so what would it take to, if you remember several slides ago, Emily showed the table of where we are now and where we want to go to that program expansion and ultimately uh, widespread adoption. So what's it going to take for, to get from where we are now to that place? So for 2023, our current funding, so the map that Emily just showed, she indicated what we are going to fly this year. And then to, to do that, we've raised across the state uh, in collaboration with a number of local agencies, $2.4 million. And uh, the bulk of that comes from the state of Colorado. So you can see the breakdown up there, just about a million dollars in local agency match, over a million dollars in state funds, 
and about a quarter million dollars in federal funding. There's 23 different agencies that local agencies that are contributing to this effort. And I'll talk more in depth about our experience on the North Front Range. So several maps ago, that chunk um, kind of from Clear Creek North up through the Pooter, what it took to get to this place so that we could actually fund flights in 2023. Full program expansion is estimated to cost about 6.3 million. So we aren't quite there yet. So we have some work to do primarily on the funding side to be able to actually pay for flights each year. And this is these are annual costs. And you can see the costs associated with increasing the program beyond that. The maps that Emily showed with grade areas, it would include covering the existing areas as well as expanding into those gray areas. And to expand into those gray areas would take um, expanding our snow-free coverage. So at the bottom there, you see there's about 10.3 million acres that still need to be flown with the initial flight to gather the baseline topography data that's needed to then um, the subsequent year fly snow on flights and capture the snow depth. Another key piece to all of this is the contracting mechanism. To be able to actually fly these flights, we contract with ASO Inc. For the flights this year, there will be multiple different contracts for each kind of individual flight area. And local agencies are setting up those contracts with ASO Inc. and coordinating the local funding for each basin. That puts a fairly significant administrative burden on some entities that are quite small. And it also prevents certain areas from potentially increasing the number of flights that they can do and even starting off flights because those local entities aren't, or there aren't local entities in place to support those flights and to, to take on that administrative role. So our experience on the Northern Front Range saw some great success this year. As a reminder, this area was flown with the, it, Snow free data was collected from in 2022 with the water plan grant, so we are very grateful for that this effort in 2023 wouldn't be possible without that baseline data. There was a lot of enthusiasm for gathering that data, certainly the basin roundtable the South Platte basin roundtable is very excited about this opportunity and a few local agencies committed funds for the 20 matching funds for the Colorado water plan grant in 2022. Moving into 2023, we were looking forward to the possibility of getting snow data and actually getting seeing what the snowpack would look like with um, having had that snow free data fly collected this past fall. And in talking with the state and the chasm work group, we realized that there would be a significant funding gap to actually be able to fly these flights. And so that led us to talk to the South Platte Basin Roundtable and to a number of different entities. And we said, we've got about, we're, we're shooting at about $700,000 worth of flight costs. We've got about a hundred of that coming from the state. And so that left a significant local burden. The Basin Roundtable suggested we move forward with a WSR grant and was hoping that we would find about 50% match on um, to, for that grant. And so we talked to a number of different entities throughout the base, and you can see their logos up there. And it's a wide variety of entities, everything from municipalities, water conservancy districts, to some local ditch companies. Everybody was very enthusiastic about this work and really wanted to see it happen. And we were able to raise, uh, I believe, 200, just shy of $250,000 from 13 or 12 different entities to meet the water supply reserve fund match requirements. And the Basin Roundtable just has um, said that they want to move, they, they are um, going to be presenting that WSRF grant to CWCB in the coming month, I believe, or coming two months. So huge success. And in all of our conversations, there were multiple times Many entities said, we, we really value this work. We want to see this work happen, but we can't do this every year. We can't commit to this level of funding every year. Many entities communicated the notion of this is a great, we, we want to invest in this. We kind of see this as a down payment, but 
we need other funding mechanisms to, to be able to successfully fund this moving forward. And similarly, with the contracting mechanism, my district, the St. Fran Left and Water Conservancy District, is taking on that role this year. Uh, Northern Water took on that role last year for the water plan grant. And it is a, a good chunk of work just gathering all the entities, figuring out the contracting, the invoicing, and all of that. We've got a staff of four, and so it's uh, a lot of work for us. We're happy to do it on the short term, in the short term, but would really love to see other opportunities presented moving forward. That's all I have. So, thanks. There's a more contact, and as a reminder, if you visit the Chasm website, there you can see the the planning report is up on that website. Thank you. Um, is this presentation on the website, or can you forward it to us? Yes. The slideshow. Yes. Yes. Yes, you can. Believe or it. yes, it's on the website. Eric, can you help with that question? I I don't know the answer to it. To so while the presentation is not on the website, I I can forward you that presentation right now while we're thinking about it, so you can have it while you're eating lunch today. Awesome. Um, so, do you have any recommendations for us? on how we can move forward. I hear you. Thank you so much for volunteering your time to work on this, first of all, both of you. Um, do you have a, any suggestions of what we should do? Yeah, I think I, I would say finding sustainable funding mechanisms would probably be the, the, biggest, uh, the biggest ask or the biggest suggestion that we would have. And looking at, I know, the ASO Inc. as well as the CASM work group is looking at federal partners as well. And certainly there's increasing widespread consensus that this is one of the best tools that we have for managing our water as our snowpack is one of our business, biggest reservoirs in the state. And so understanding it's critical and the more statewide funds as well as federal funds that can be allocated to it will put all Colorado water users in a better position. That's great. And thank you. I, I definitely see that the funding mechanisms are the most important but as far as the work that chasm has been doing is that something that really needs to have a um does that need to be through the state do we need to be having conversations about that role and the work that you've been doing voluntarily be taken on um within the state there's it doesn't sound like you want to do this forever i mean well, I, I love the project and really appreciate the, the data. I think having a centralized staff person, a state employee that would help with that, the contracting side as well as the administration side would be a valuable resource to the state statewide. Yeah, Eric and Andrew have been a great, a great help, um, but I know they've got other things to do too, um, but they've been... <laughs> Yeah, they've, they've been uh, great through this process, but um, yeah, I, I think that's another thing that could be helpful as far as, you know, CWCB being involved in the, the program, just maybe more staff time and the contracting mechanism that, that Scott um, pointed out, which maybe comes with getting the, if the funding is coming from the state, then it's, you know, this this year we're doing, we're using water project, um, uh, projects bill um, funds and also two different WSRF grants um, and also funding from a bunch of different entities. So it's just, you know, a little bit complicated. So a more centralized system um, could be helpful. Thank you. I'm sure there's other questions. Go ahead, Director Dutton. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, thank you both for being here. And thanks, thanks, Eric, for zooming in. Just want to say thank you guys for your work on this. Um, it seems like those chasm calls, for some reason, the first Wednesday of the month seems to be really challenging for those of us in the Rio Grande Basin. I'm, I'm not sure why, but we struggle with that date. But I appreciate you guys continuing to carry it forward and just wanted to note for the board that I've been um, really impressed that that you guys haven't been selfish about it, that you've still been willing to fund and, and work on and, you know, push forward these efforts for the benefit of all these basins, not just the basins for the people who can regularly show up. So thank you for um, for thinking about the whole of Colorado when those of us that for some reason can't show up on a Wednesday. I really appreciate it. And um, just 
I think I'm I'm a little fuzzy on maybe if we could put the map back up and, and if it's you guys or if it's Eric, can you help us understand if the map is based on um, funding levels right at this second, like right this moment to now today, <laughs> or yeah. if this how this would change with the inclusion of increased funding as discussed in the agenda tomorrow? Um, this is uh, what we currently have funding for. And uh, the project's bill funding included in this, I believe was um, from this past year. So it's not what we're talking, what you're talking about tomorrow. Um, what you're talking about tomorrow would be for, um, I think any potential snow-free um, flights this coming summer. Um, and then uh, snow measurement flights uh, for next year, the, the following year, 2024. Yes, yeah, so this map is purely for this coming winter season, what we have in our pockets right now to conduct flights for both in snow free data and in the budget. So as Emily mentioned, um, this the CWCB funds going towards this particular map are from last year's projects bill, the funds that became available July 1st. So do you have a follow up? So my follow up and sorry if if I'm not communicating this question very well, but is there a way it says many basins are ready for flights but lack funding so is there still a possibility that we can find funding to do the flights in 2023 it sounds like i'm hearing the projects bill funding in 2023 will not allow for that so we would need to come up with different money is that correct that is correct, and that's what we're trying to do, as Scott said, through all of these local stakeholder meetings and reaching out to folks, is we're trying to find that funding that we weren't able to get this um, upcoming winter season through the local stakeholders. And as far as trying to get additional funds, they've really been leaning into the WSRF, so you will be seeing some WSRF applications coming up in December and January. Um, that's kind of filling the gap for a significant number of basins as well that can't get that local stakeholder match available for the CWCB projects bill money we have allocated for this winter that has we've tried to distribute that as much as we could on a statewide basis but there, that's already all accounted for. We only had 450 in the last projects bill and there was a little bit left over so grand total of $492,300 from CWCB projects bill available is going towards this winter. Thank you. Are there totals of the per basin, what the cost would be to do the flyovers in 2023? Yes, and I am opening up that funding spreadsheet at the moment. Um, so Roaring Fork and Frying Pan has been one of the ones that we've been trying to get an additional local match. We're about 50,000 short in that basin to get it done. Um, we're still in conversations of getting that funding secured. Uh, as Scott mentioned, the Front Range has really stepped up and was able to get a whole lot of local match secured, so they're good to go. Um, that little bit just northwest of the um, Dillon Reservoir, that blue there, that we unfortunately couldn't find anyone who was willing to um, bring the money forward. You know, we've got Colorado River District who's going to be funding the Roaring Fork and uh, potentially Upper Arkansas as well. But it just, there were certain basins where we couldn't find a local stakeholder to come up with any sort of interest or funding there, even if we have the snow free data. Interesting. What about the Yampa and Elk? So Yampa and Elk, we do have that entire snow free done. That one has really come down to trying to find funds for this coming year snow on. And from the conversations that I've heard have been happening, we weren't able to get any funding secured for this coming winter for those basins. So while they're ready to fly, if we can get that funding this year, we could do it. But um, we don't have enough CWCB projects bill this year to spread over into that basin. And it doesn't seem like they'll be able to get anything for this winter locally either. Would you mind sharing that spreadsheet with the um, 
board today, maybe during lunch would be fine. Um, thank you so much for moving the needle on the basins that are able to move forward. Um, I think that this board has been really clear about this being a priority. Um, I'm, I, th I think it's probably time for us to take it upon ourselves to figure out how we can get creative and get this done because while um, the agencies in Colorado that work with water need funding for FTEs as per the budget uh, that we saw this morning, which is awesome, this remains one of the most important tools that we have, as you said, to borrow your words. And so I think, um, I think we're hearing that we need to be actionable on this somehow. I don't know how, but maybe the spreadsheet's a good first start. So thank you again for all of the work that you've been doing. And if there's, yep, Director Sakata. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for taking the time to come to, um, you know, and when we, I think for us in the, the water business, uh, we see the intrinsic value of this, but are any of the studies looking at the economics of this, of, you know, what it's worth, the information that we're gathering? I mean, you know, I've seen the presentations, especially from Denver Water, how they were able to adjust then their storage that they had because of this, but can we put a dollar value on it when we make that argument, you know, that this is worth funding? Yeah, that's... Um... We haven't done that yet. I mean, we've done the case studies like you, you mentioned, um, but that's in our plan for, I don't remember if it's next year or uh, future years, but it's it's in our kind of uh, build out plan is to do economic case studies. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think that would be really helpful because, you know, again, from water managers, we can see the value, but for everybody, we need to explain the rationale and, the, and why it's valuable. Yeah, Thanks. it's a little bit difficult to quantify sometimes, but but uh, yeah, that's definitely something we're working on. Director Boucher. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> and I apologize, but I think that based on the direction that uh, Director Brown was just going, can you make sure that I understand the difference between the full program at 6.3 million and then the widespread adoption at 8.6? I have a little confusion there. It's a great question. Let me back up. Widespread adoption, from, from my understanding, and full disclosure, I'm new to the planning committee, so I'm still learning some of these details. <laughs> but the program expansion phase was kind of starting with 2022 being almost like a pilot and then moving towards getting statewide coverage. Um, the widespread adoption would be getting the majority of the state covered with snowpack, with snow-free data, and with some degree of flights on a somewhat rotating basis throughout the state. And then I think the, the program build-out would be essentially flying all snow-covered areas um, that were shown in the map, uh, two flights every year. So... That, that whole gray area, essentially. And the, the 6.3 million is just to cover the, the areas that we have the snow-free data on, uh, two, two flights per year, um, and just the areas that we currently have the snow-free data on. Thank you very much. Um, Jen, can I ask a question? If these guys were to put us on their mailing list for the Wednesday morning calls, is that a problem? Not as long as what they were discussing CWCD business. I okay. think that's fine. Okay. Can we, Eric, can you help that happen? And sorry, any board members that don't want to be on there, you'll just reply to that and tell them <laughs> you don't want to be on there, but it's better than doing a straw poll now. Um, can you help facilitate that? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, any further questions? All right, you're off the hot the hot stand. Thanks so much. We really appreciate all of your support. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so we're going to move agenda item nine uh, to before agenda item thirteen, and um, we will go ahead and uh, Jen, when you're ready. Sorry to catch you off guard there. If you're ready for. Um, Agenda item 10, we'll have that and then we'll break for lunch.
Thank you. Uh, and that is Scott Steinbrecher's agenda items. Thank oh, thanks, you, Scott. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Jen. Um, like Director Gibbs said, I'm certainly happy to have the election behind us and to know who my boss will be. Um, and I will share with you something that um, the AG shared with me and he has shared with others, but he really felt the weight of this election more than he did when he ran um, for his first term. And I think that's or he has said that's because over the first four years, he really um, understood how important, began to understand how important the work is that the office does. And he really came to care for and appreciate the people um, within the office, as well as people in state agencies and people on this board whom he works with, um, and really wanted to be able to continue those partnerships and continue to lead our office over the next four years, and um, that really weighed on him during the, during the election. Um, so we're excited to have him back. Uh, we're also very excited by the governor's investment in the Colorado River, um, and we look forward to helping implement that program, and we will continue to invest um, in the Colorado River ourselves, as we have done bringing in Emily, Luke, and most recently Andy Neshevitz, um, to work on the Colorado River team, so we're excited about that. Uh, also really excited to uh, begin thinking about the AG's priorities over the next four years. Um, I won't spoil it too much, I won't steal his thunder, but I'll tell you that we're, that he is looking um, at scarcity, and we know that the situation that we're in won't be fixed by a winter or two, um, and so we're really focused on scarcity. Uh, trying to develop or find innovative tools to deal with that scarcity in Colorado for the benefit of all Coloradans, and then to develop strategies to, to cope with the increased pressures and conflicts that will arise as we, as we deal with that scarcity. Um, and again, we look forward to working with the board, staff, um, and a lot of other partners in Colorado and around the West as we develop those tools. And I know that Phil personally is excited to get back um, and join the board for meetings. He's trying to, he'll, he will try to get to all of your basins next year um, and join you for these meetings. He's excited to do that again. Um, and then I'll just add one personal note. Um, please extend my thanks and congratulations to Bill Tyner. In addition to all of the great things that, that you said, he was also a really good water lawyer and taught me a lot about being a water lawyer. Um, one of the first trials that I did was with Bill and Steve Whitty down in Division Two, and I have really fond memories, and they taught me quite a bit. So tell him I said thank you and congratulations. Uh, you do have the Attorney General's report in your briefing packets. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer those now. Questions? I just have one question uh, regarding to the Navajo Nation versus the U.S. Department of the Interior. The time frame after the uh, October 28th conference, what do you see looking out as how this will unfold, if you don't mind answering that? Time frame has been accelerated. Uh, okay. Since we sent the report, the court granted cert. Um, so the case is now before the court. We have a brief due on December 19th. And reading the tea leaves based on how the court, um, when the court granted cert, we are expecting argument to happen as early as February in that case. Thank you and thanks for including it here. Any other questions? Okay, uh, would you like to do the spiel? I would, <laughs> thank you very much. This is Jen Mealy. We're going to have a vote to go into executive session. During executive session, we will consider agenda items 11A through 11C. This executive session is authorized pursuant to sections 24-6-4023A2 and 3 of the Colorado Revised Statutes. And we're now ready for a motion. Thank you. Director Dutton. I move we go into executive session. Thank you. Director Bruchet with a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, please indicate by saying nay. 
motion carries uh we're going to shorten lunch up so take a half hour please and we'll see you back here about 105 110 that work for you yeah all right enjoy
Okay. Uh, go ahead, Jen. Thank you. This is Jen Mealy from the AG's office. This is the report from executive session. The board went into executive session to consider items, agenda items 11A through C. Discussion during executive session was limited to those items and no formal action was taken and we are out of executive session. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. And we have special guests here <laughs> at Denver Water. He's trying to escape, but he can't. Uh, Jim Lockhead, welcome, and thank you so much for letting us use your space today. Thank you so much. It's a great honor to have the CWCB here at Denver Water. I really appreciate your, your being here. Um, I'm going to date myself a little bit. I think I was first appointed to the Water Conservation Board in about 1988 or 89, something like that. I think I was in high school. Uh, <laughs> I was pretty young. I got some looks when I first, my, my first board meeting of like, who is this kid? But um, no, really a pleasure to to have you all you all here. Um, this is a facility that Denver Water is really proud of. Um, when we first conceived of the redevelopment of this campus, we wanted it to be reflective of the future of water in Colorado. I know the board is going to take a tour, but for the public who may be listening in. Um, this facility is the most sustainable campus development that's yet been accomplished in Colorado. Um, net zero energy, lead platinum, rainwater capture with a water right, um, a, an in-building wastewater treatment system that treats wastewater and uses it for toilet flushing and, and irrigation, um, total native ve vegetation around the campus. Um, again, a facility that we're extremely proud of and hopefully reflects um, the values that we're going to have to bring to Colorado um, as we meet the water challenges of the future. I also wanted to really quickly um, mention, I'm sure the board is aware that a few months ago, Denver Water and a number of other municipalities entered into a memorandum of understanding um, committing to uh, a sustainable future on the Colorado River, and that involves um, redoubling our efforts to water conservation, redoubling our efforts toward recycling, and meeting a target to reduce the amount of non-functional uh, bluegrass turf within our service areas by 30%. Uh, I'm really happy to um, tell you that today uh, we released a, a press release and a commitment from 25 additional municipalities in the Colorado River Basin to commit to that MOU. So a total of 30 municipalities in the Colorado River Basin, um, including in the in the LA area, uh, in Arizona, in Utah, in um, uh, um, Albuquerque area, Santa Fe, uh, throughout the basin. Um, when you look at any individual municipality and the idea of reducing 30% of non-functional turf, that individual contribution to the river may not make a huge different difference, but when you look across the basin, 30 different municipalities, um, it's going to make a real difference um, toward our commitment toward a sustainable future. Um, it reflects um, the municipal commitment um, to a solution on the river to reducing demands um, and our commitment that all sectors in the basin are going to have to participate in a solution um, to the future of the Colorado River um, and dealing with the crisis that we're facing. I want to emphasize as well that um, removing turf sounds easy, but it's very complicated. Um, first of all, we can't destroy the tree canopy uh, in our cities as we remove turf. Secondly, I want to emphasize there are a lot of underserved communities within our service areas that don't have functional turf, much less non-functional turf, and we need to um, provide opportunities for those communities as well. Um, next, it is extremely expensive. Um, when we talk about shared sacrifice on the river from an economic uh, standpoint, um, our estimate is that turf removal in our service area is going to run about $10 per square foot. Um, not cheap when you look at that. It's politically complicated. Um, people are um, attached to their green spaces within their communities. And so we're going to have to have um, conversations with local leaders, local communities, um, city council members, city councils within our service area um, to be able to implement this. But we already are proposing um, money into our budget for next year to begin this program, and we're committed to um, reaching that 30% target. 
um, as, as a contribution to this solution that I know uh, our commissioner and your director, Becky, is working very hard to, uh, to help solve. So we support her efforts. Um, she's been very good at outreaching to Denver Water and other water users in the state. Uh, we support the board and, and her efforts and the positions that the state has taken to date on the Colorado River and, and stand together, uh, both East Slope and West Slope, um, together um, on uh, Colorado's position and protecting Colorado's interests on the Colorado River. So with that, I won't further take your time and appreciate the opportunity. And again, welcome. Thank you. Oh, I stay think up we're at probably... that podium for a second. <laughs> <laughs> Director Mitchell has some. Since we put you on the agenda, oh, you get to be a part of the formal I agenda. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge Jim's leadership and Denver Water's leadership for that matter. Um, in, in terms of this MOU, it was no small feat. And um, they really pulled not just Colorado along, but the entire basin. And so that that came from Jim, just so you all know about that MOU, that really was um, a Herculean effort. And so I wanted to thank you for that. And when we talked about um, you know how we are leaders in the Colorado River Basin, it's because of things like this. And it's because of the pulling together of the East Slope and the West Slope and, and utilities and agricultural um, water users being innovative and thinking outside the box and being committed to doing something differently. I, I find it ironic that today we're sitting in the Denver Water Boardroom and next door One Water folks are, are meeting and I'm, I'm thinking about um, how much we are moving Colorado forward and it and I wanted to thank you for your leadership in that and and your support and the free advice that I get <laughs> continually <laughs> daily. <laughs> There's plenty of that. <laughs> and I'll, I'll say you get what you pay for. Too. <laughs> Thank you Thank so you. much. Um, can I ask you sure. a question? I'm sure it's in the memo and it's been a while since I or the press release that you all had a while back. Um, by when is the 30% reduction in non-functional turf? Did you have a goal date? in that latest press release? We don't have a, a goal okay. date. We're gonna, um, obviously, um, each municipality is at a different level in terms of their maturity on this program. Obviously, Las Vegas is really far along uh, in terms of their program. We're really just standing it up uh, in our service area. Um, you see separate efforts by cities like Aurora, Castle Rock, Colorado Springs, um, all have ongoing programs at various levels. So kind of hard to articulate a target um, across the board across 30 municipalities because everybody's situation is a little bit different. Thank you. Maybe we can have you back sometime to talk more about that. I know um, we've seen some cool presentations from some some of the lower basin uh, from at well no not from them uh, Colby came oh, and, uh -huh. and spoke and uh, I think I'm sure we'd love to hear what that looks like for you guys when when you're moving forward with the project some other time. Great. Not today, because we do have this water plan thing we're supposed to do, but <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for joining us. Anything else for Jim? All right, awesome, it's great to see you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, great to see you all. Okay, well, I guess we'll take another break, right, Russ? <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Thank you all so much for being here for the Colorado Water Plan update. Um, before you get started, I just, there are not enough words in the English vocabulary to thank you all for what you have done um, over this time frame. Kat, you've kept the wheels on, um, you and Russ. There was a time when I saw you guys in the lobby of a hotel working while everyone else was having fun. Um, I'm sure that that was one of hundreds of times. I can't imagine going through every comment and writing them into the Excel spreadsheet and coming up with the matrix that you did. I mean, it's truly amazing. You've just done an outstanding job. And Matt, thank you. I remember, I don't even remember actually when it was that we sat down in Silver Silverthorne and and went through the first iteration of this update together, but um, I just you all have done an impressive job. And so before you know we get into what's what could be improved or what's right or wrong. Um, just 
a round of applause for the work that these folks have done already. Okay, and I have a quote for you. It's, oh no, I should have written it down, <laughs> hang on. It's never the same river, you never step in the same river twice. It's never the same river and you're never the same person. So I think that applies to the water plan because it's the second one. It's never the same water plan twice, right? We're all different people, it's a different state, it's a different plan. And that's, th and thanks to you all for that. So, all right, without further ado, let's do this thing. Thank you so much. Uh, Russ Sands, um, CWCB staff for the record. Um, we have decided that to be more strategic because we're gonna play a little bit of musical chairs with this presentation that we're gonna sit over here. So I will just tee things up and then kick it over to Kat to get us going. But um, thank you so much for the kind words. Um, it has been a lot of work, um, a lot of late nights of late, um, specifically as we have processed public comment uh, and a lot of good things coming out of that. So our goal for today and maybe, um, I do have the clicker. I thought I already took it over there. Look at that. Obviously, haven't slept enough. Oh boy, it's just the story of my life. You getting anything? Any clicks? Oh no, we gotta get fancy. <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay. So um, this is kind of out the window because um, when we thought we had three hours and hopefully we don't need that full time, uh, we're just trying to truncate. We thought, oh, we'll build in a break, but I'll just defer to, um, to you, Director Brown, on when we need a break. Um, but our goal is to loosely break things up into initial outreach takeaways and framing. That is the longest part, just FYI. So if you're flagging through that and you're like, oh my God, is it all this long? It's not, it gets quicker as we go. Um, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about public comments specifically that we got and our sideboards. Um, uh, have you guys discussed just an open discussion on board letter? Um, I think we have maybe five or six people now signed up for public comment, FYI. I don't know if they'll all be here by the time we get to that section, but um, we do have some public comment and then we will um, just briefly talk. I think we just have one slide on next steps and then ask for uh, approval of staff recommendation. So with that, I will turn things over to Deputy um, Cap Weissmiller. So okay. before we get started, I'll just, if anyone needs to take a break, please just go ahead and take your break. Um, I probably won't give you one. And we'll try to um, be respectful of the day ending around 5.15, 5.30. Um, whatever we can do on our end to uh, move this forward, please let us know if, if we're getting too far afield and you have a lot more material to cover. Um, also know that each of these directors has read, have read the comments. Um, I've been hearing that, that people have stayed up late, so please don't feel the need to go over the materials that you have presented we were to us. <laughs> right, maybe just read half, you know, that's fine. Anyway. <laughs> maybe, Director Dutton, if we have time. <laughs> All right, Kat Weissmiller, uh, CWCB staff for the record, and I'm going to walk us through just um, briefly some of the outreach that occurred uh, as part of this plan. The 2023 water plan can be celebrated as one of the longest running and most robust stakeholder engagement efforts in Colorado. The 30,000 comments that were received on the 2015 plan came in, and from there, the stakeholder engagement never really stopped. As you can see here, uh, through grants, roundtables, interbasin compact committee meetings, technical advisory groups, and more, the water plan continued to gather comments that helped refine and inform the successful, successive steps in our update process. And this really helped us realize that the water plan update is not one thing, it's the sum of a multi-year effort to update key components that build to the holistic plan. For this update alone, there have been Vigorous, there's been vigorous outreach to let people across Colorado know about the, out, the updates to the plan. Through various media channels, we've reached upwards of 130,000 Colorado, Coloradans, including through three Spanish radio programs and 30, with 30,000 listeners. Uh, through our own podcast, we had 165 downloads. Uh, counting our news coverage, we believe that news about the water plan may have reached over 
a readership of over 4 million. This has all been really amazing and we're excited about all of that. But one of the things that we are most excited about is that CWCB and our contractors hosted or joined over 140 events um, in local communities around Colorado. And we've been talking with local communities throughout the summer and throughout the public comment period about the water plan. We got to every single county, 64 of 64 counties in Colorado. Uh, it was a big effort. We also had hard copies at every single, every single county in the county seat. Um, and all of this work has helped us build personal connections across the state and make the plan real and accessible. And it's something we're really proud of. So that's our 64 counties. Um, and these are some pictures from our outreach efforts. And we're, we're really happy uh, to have gotten out there, as Greg Felt says, the magic happens at the local level. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Russ. You have any clicking tips for me? Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I will just frame up a few takeaways um, as we've been around the state and thinking about the outreach period and then really want to um, talk about context because I think that this will be helpful background before we kind of go into comments and sideboards. Um, as Kat noted, we are, have been working on some version of the water plan for, for many years, honestly, since uh, 2015 when the first water plan came out. But we started the contracting process and really immediately moved into all the pieces um, that are part of the update. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in detail. But um, here are some kind of just general thoughts that I've kind of been chewing on. Is that people are really passionate about water, but they're often motivated by very hyper local issues. And I mean, that's a great problem to, for us to have. When we've gone out and we've gone around the state, we hear a lot about sometimes very localized issues about somebody's individual uh, water right or how they feel about a given topic. At the same time, we sometimes get very high level comments. So we made a lot of expansive comments about uh, things like climate change. So these are all very pertinent topics. And on some level, you know, we have, you know, a, a a boot, a boot in both camps, but uh, a lot of the work that we do is, is arguably somewhere in the middle of that. Um, to that to that end, uh, few people know about the water plan. <laughs> uh, despite all of our outreach over all the years, um, you know, our process has been growing. I'm, I'm, I don't know that we've seen any clear trends of a, a larger increase in numbers of more uh, readership or understanding, but we're certainly trying. Um, but about 17% of the, uh, in our public survey that we did in Spanish and English, um, the end of or beginning of this year, um, time is very elusive. At the beginning of this year, um, you know, we we are seeing about three percent very familiar with the water plan. I don't have stats on who knows or doesn't know CWCB, but I can just tell you um, that the first question we get is who are you, and then to the second stat, which I just think is funny, is then we say, oh, we're with the state, and they're like, oh, great, we don't trust you. So <laughs> um, anyway, just food for thought. Uh, you know, we're trying to get the word out there, um, but you know, a lot of what we do really ends up in a specialized space where a lot of the deep learning we do, a lot of the good work that we do are through iterative engagement with stakeholders, especially when they come in for grants. Um, so when we go out and about, I've, I've learned in some cases the hard way, we are just the state. Um, nobody is probably interested in, you know, the, the various 200 different agencies. So it is, um, you know, CWCB is often asked or the input that we're getting is sometimes framed by what they think we can do as a state or how they think water works. Um, and, and they may not always, you know, know the details. And I can appreciate maybe more than anyone, you know, that needing to be simplified for people. And I think that's what we are trying to do in the water plan is just explain on a high level and make it an entry point for greater learning. Um, but I will say we get saddled with a lot of things that we can't do anything about. So stop letting people come here. Um, stop sending any water out of state. <laughs> There's just a broad range of input we get. Um, uh, some that, that go down dark avenues at times <laughs> in our public outreach. Um, what we can actually do as CWCB can sometimes when we explain, well, you know, we are a policy agency. We don't have authority to enforce or regulate. Um, can sometimes seem unsatisfactory to those we're talking to. Um, and our role is sometimes misunderstood, honestly, even in public comments by those who do work with us all the time and those who don't. And there's a beauty in that, right? I think we've learned the water plan is, um, you know, something to everybody. And, and I think that we don't necessarily want to lose that piece. But I think we're trying to be exceptionally clear about what we do. Um, and to that end, people are, are very, if they're not familiar with the water plan, even less so with all the other pieces that make it up. And so I'm not going to belabor all of these, but just to put it in context, we talk a lot about the work that we do really having its roots in the 2002 drought. 
Um, certainly, if you just think about that work since 2015, it's not even just the sum of those documents, but it's all the myriad little processes, and these are just a handful of them, but they're no small feat. We are doing a lot of work a lot, all the time on iterative engagement, and you know I, I'm showing you pictures of the volume one, right? Volume two of the tech updates, like a thousand pages long. <laughs> There's a lot of work that goes into these, and a lot of public input along the way. Um, so, I think a, a theme you'll hear from us today is this is not, uh, you know, the last bite of the apple. In many ways, it's it's just I think, you know the first bite of the next cycle of work. So with that in, everything ends up into the water plan. We kind of fold all of that iterative engagement, the things we've heard. You know, we we got 200 pages of edits or notes on the front end for our scoping it phase, and then you've all started to uh, sort through the 516 pages of letters. So on a plan that's 245 pages, we could probably write it two or three times over. There's no shortage of input or opinion. We have a lot to draw through and or draw from, and our goal is to really you know thread that needle and find the middle. And I'll just say that, you know, while we've been doing all this work, we're not the only ones, right? These are examples of other documents that I would say are state plans. Uh, they are our state plans, and some of them are state water plans. Um, you know, CDPHE's 10-year roadmap is a good example. Um, you know, the CPW has a strategy. OREC has a strategy document. We have a new uh, natural working land strategy document. CDA has strategies. We have the state climate plan. We have forestry plan. We have um, power, resource, um, power and Water Authority, um, we have GOCO. Um, all of these documents in some ways touch the water plan and our job is to not necessarily interfere with those, but we serve as an integrating role. And, and probably the most one-for-one -one document in this bunch is the state resiliency plan. Um, it's very much similar to how we see the water plan and what we've learned, honestly, through the water plan processes. Yes, it's a state document. Um, and yes, we, we have to view it through the lens of what we can do, um, just like DOLA does with the resiliency strategy. They play an integration role of bringing other agencies together, um, but the document is still a state plan, the state plan for resiliency in that case. So it brings to the, this, I know you've seen this slide before, but what, what is a water plan? We talk about it on these kind of serving this dual nature. It's an opportunity to partner um, and shine a light on critical water issues. And on a simple level, it's a strategy document for CWCB. Um, just like a lot of those other state documents are strategy documents for their respective agencies. Um, a simple way to think about that and using the nomenclature and the water plan is to think about that as partner actions, the things that others can do that we're trying to guide them towards, maybe the things certainly that we can lead through funding um, and convening, collaborating, and then the things that we can do as an agency uh, with collaborative buy-in from other, depart uh, other um, collaborating agencies for sure, but only where they come willing, right? Well, that's a theme we'll hit on and come back to. So as Kat had noted, you know, when we we recognize now more than ever after having lived this for, um, you know, for me, the last five years, for Matt, certainly the last seven years and and um, Deputy Director Riss, but, um, you know, the water plan is the sum of multiple parts and specifically on a high level, it's the technical update, it's the BIPs, and then ultimately the comprehensive update itself. We know that that is about seven to eight year process. And so in the um, draft of the water plan, you see you've seen these kind of projected timelines for the future. That is uh, in some ways to honor that that takes time. It's in some ways to give a little bit of a pause. Not that I think that we won't be busy. I think we have to immediately get to work on some of this. But what I think we've heard a lot about um, both from stakeholder groups like the, the roundtables um, and even from this board is to not continually be in a planning process, right? So we have uh, at least a couple year reprieve maybe on that effort. but. Um, I want to highlight for you how to, to get where we need to be for even the tech update, there's a lot of work that we need to do. So one of the things that we hear a lot about is um, this, the time, you know, you, you don't have clear time goals associated with actions in the water plan. Um, we are intending to do those 50 things over this next decade. And let me just kind of explain what that might look like to get to the technical update um, about and, and just to really have a, a clear line of, of sight. Um, we need to complete about half the actions by the time we're in the technical update. To complete the technical update is one action. Um, but if we get to that point, we'll be about 50% of the way through the actions in the water plan in five years. So just to kind of scale that down in time, that's a really bold goal considering that's on top of all the other work we do. And the sequencing in the plan, I'll step you through here in a minute, how there's kind of a, a natural sequencing just when we build on those three pillars of what we have to do for tech update, BIP, and water plan. Um, but we need flexibility and we need flexibility because we have 50 actions, but we don't have 50 actions worth of funding. 
we don't have um, board operational plan yet that might say, here's how we want you to shift things. We need to have leeway for new projects that come to our plate. Uh, we've spent years, I think maybe longer than we thought in demand management planning, for example, big things will come up and we need to be flexible to them. So we're not trying to overly constrain um, ourselves as staff because we recognize this, nor are we trying to overly, overly constrain the board or future boards um, that need to dive into these issues. So um, this is, I promise you, the busiest slide. I know it's tiny. I will just step you through it lightly and you can read it at your leisure. But if we look at the technical update and count that as one thing, these are 26 actions that effectively are, are on some level of moving by the time we get to completing the technical update, right? So when I speak about a natural sequencing, there are things that we just have to do to be able to do the tech update. And they're big things. Um, I think we've heard some comments, well, this is gonna happen anyway. Nothing happens anyway, okay? It requires funding, it requires pulling some groups together, it requires a lot of deep thought. And often, you know, one of the first comments that we got on the 2019 tech update, I remember uh, Director Dutton, Aaron Citron, it was a, a joint meeting with IBCC, and uh, Director Gibbs had noted, why don't we include forest health modeling? Well, it's, it's not for lack of desire, it's just that we don't have a process to do that. And even though there are forest models, they may not integrate with how we do things in the tech update. So we need to take the time to do that. That is not a small lift, but that's one example of something we have to know, can we do it? Do we need additional research before we could do it? Uh, or can we just not do it to be able to answer by the time we get to the tech update? We heard a lot of input about just the scenarios that we have, right? Three of those have some level of climate change, two arguably do not, or just have kind of um, status quo of climate change. Some have suggested that's not right. I remember um, on IBCC, some discussions about, uh, gosh, under your scenarios, you don't have an event that captures what we just lived through. What's your black swan event? Um, we need to, you know, we need to revisit these things, things around conservation, storage. These all lead up to supporting the technical update. And most of these things involve a pretty intensive stakeholder engagement process. So a lot of the actions that are laid out in the plan inevitably have that attached to them. There's other things that you know all too well have an existing timeline. So when we think about Colorado River negotiations or demand management considerations, we are talking about the lead up to the 07 renegotiations. Those are things that are going to happen in this early window. Uh, I think the piece that's cut off on the bottom is the board's operational plan. That is a piece of this. And that, in theory, we would tee up for um, our next um, September discussion. But that is a piece that we know has to move sooner. Um, there are other pieces that are just already advancing and, and to get to remember that when we're talking about doing, you know, 25 things over the next, uh, you know, five years on top of our current workload, these aren't generally things that are tied to one year, right? These stretch across years. They're long processes, um, arguably because we build in so much stakeholder engagement. Um, but there's some things we just had the landscape summit and a director Sakata was there. Um, that's a piece of starting this larger discussion around transformative landscape change. Uh, we've already, thanks to board funding last May, started conversations about having um, some climate adaptation workshops. Um, Chris Sturm's great work on wildfire ready watersheds and the CORAF framework. These are things that are advancing, right? So, you know, these, the, and inevitably we are already making movement. And then I think that there's a large tranche of work that's just primed to start. Now, whether these are the things that you think are the top of the heap or not, or maybe things that we um, hash out when we have an operational plan or discuss more, but we're having conversations already about the roundtable handbook. We've been talking with Pepo about that for a while. And um, I think next step to kind of think about that with the roundtables and maybe get some contract support. Uh, we are clearly trying to focus on drought resiliency. Um, that's a big thing. So a lot of these things inevitably are up next, right? Uh, we know on the environmental justice mapping, that's stuff that CDPHE is helping us lead on, they're working on. Um, you know, we kind of need them to take the lead there, but that has been explained to us that in the next year or two years, that that is something that will be kind of front of the discussion for them. So um, there, there is a natural sequencing here. We're not trying to put it off, but I would just argue that even if we did and didn't walk through that, um, doing what we're talking about doing is really representative of a bold and difficult action for this agency of 55 people. Uh, and maybe that number is gonna grow, right? Um, I'm, I'm grateful for the governor's budget, but you, as it stands, um, you know, we have less people than we have counties in the state, uh, even with adding the board, you know, we, the, our agency does a ton of work and we're signing up to do a lot more because we know it's the right thing to do. Um, so it adds to the work we do, which is all the grants and loans that we manage, the ongoing roundtable and IBCC support, special events, creating new tools. When, when you look at these things, and I look at it through the lens 
of my agency and now or, or my section um, and think about just you know new things that have come to us like managing the turf program doing all of these things on top of just tech update um, the BIPs and the water plant that that is easily seven years of work right there right but we're talking about doing 50 things and luckily all these things kind of graph over what we talked about in workshops with the board um, back in January and March about the kind of work like this is fundamentally what we do as an agency we can fund projects we can convene and collaborate we lead and focus attention no better place to do that than the water plan and we support and develop tools that is effectively what we do as CWCB so having lived with the water plan for seven years we've learned a lot specifically about those you know the not just the components to update it but what it takes um, to really update those and how long it takes right um, reinventing you know what was just given to us in the original water plan as five scenarios that were you know no more than a couple of pages of paragraphs and, and putting that into numbers that we could model and come up with five scenarios it's a huge lift uh, and it really reshapes how we think about things in the future and how we think about future updates and it gives us a, a much better methodology for how we compare things moving forward um, so we have a keener sense maybe of what the water plan can and can't do um, I think we heard that feedback of who's responsible and the original actions in the uh, water plan. Some of the feedback was, we, we don't know uh, who, who is leading this. Um, and that was the question that would come to us. And inevitably, the answer always was, well, it's ultimately CWCB that has to lead. So we've tried to be more clear about that in this plan. And we'll talk about that a little bit more too. But we've made sure that on the front end, we did the homework and worked with our partner agencies to say, which one of these actions could you help support? Or do you have an idea of something you want to see and get that buy-in on the front end? But one of the comments I think we got is, you should include X or you should tell somebody some, something to do. We can't. We, and we just have to be honest about that. And I'm not implying that we weren't before, but I think that we've learned from getting that critique that we need to set ourselves up for success. Right? And I would argue that a lot of things in the original water plan were set up to do this enormous lift to get this out the door. But when you're doing something for the first time, it's not always on the forefront of your mind. Well, what does this look like to update? That's what we've all collectively had to wrestle with. What does an update look like? And we're setting the tone what future updates are going to look like. Um, so we know a lot more. Again, I talked about the methodology. We know how we track progress, and we're going to harp on this a lot, but the ways that we specifically do that are through our, our grant loans that we hand out. Um, we do that through, um, you know, we're going to be able to track our own actions that we're committing to, and then we're going to be able to look, again, better than we ever have before at analysis when we do subsequent um, technical updates to kind of see how trends are playing out. Um, so we know a lot about what did and didn't work in the original water plan, and I'll uh, kind of harp on a few things here. Visions from objectives. So in a, the new draft plan, we have these visions, and that's really paying homage to what I think, you know, really captured in this last bullet, the intent behind objective measures to have a visionary and motivational aspect of, of, of the objective. That was the, the, the kind of defining piece, was setting this vision and motivational piece that people could point to. Of what are we going to do? And I think we've gotten some good feedback in the plan about how we can maybe um, lead better on just kind of a focusing on water conservation first, for example. Um, but putting in big numbers that were never really easy to count is unhelpful. And in some cases, they may not be bold, right? A 1% GPCD reduction for somebody that's got you know, a 200 or 300 GPCD is not a very aggressive goal. Um, for somebody that, you know, maybe that's more on the Denver water side of things, it's already signing up for things that may just track with what they're going to do anyway, right? So it's not a one size fits all. I think we learned some of that. I think one of the comments we got is that by removing objective measures, that we completely removed our ability to count. I think absolutely not. We're more accountable than ever. Um, the way that we are signing up to count actions and making those clear um, serves that purpose and for the objective measures we have a lot of bold vision statements that people could point to so um, we noted early on in some of our workshops that um, the objective measures were helpful but not useful we have gotten several points of feedback that we need to add those in we've also gotten people that said that they appreciate that it's these non-restrictive numbers right it gives some flexibility there and I just want to be clear that we never counted progress towards those objective measures. When I first started working on CWCB efforts in the 2017 ripple effects report, that was kind of front and center. Well, how do we track where we're at two years on with the water plan? And what we realized is we really track it through our actions. So we're just being more straightforward about that now. And we're strengthening the way our actions are framed so we can better count those. Um, also, I just highlight that on the point of objective measures and going through this process and changing 
you know, from a point in time, maybe here's what we're going to need in the future to here. There's variant versions of the future. Even if we had an objective measure, it would probably be one person area. So just for one area, we'd have several. And we already had several pieces of input um, from from staff and others just in our initial scoping that did it make sense, for example, that the only objective measure for agriculture was ATM. So we got to this point very quickly. If we we're going to go down that road of adding things that maybe that was just a problematic effort because we need things for a lot of pieces that were never there. Uh, there's not an objective measure for reuse, for example, but a lot of our objective measures were never really defined in a way that we could count them. And that's a problem that we're correcting now and making it more clear and easy to check. So I will quote um, Director Hawkins because at the July board meeting, I think we had some discussion around this and this was what she said and I, uh, this really resonates with me but there's an inherent tension and conflict between creating something visionary and something measurable uh, when you're planning for something as big as the state you need to step back from something being measurable and consider the broader breadth of what needs to be done and i think that's what we're trying to do we're trying to step back and say what really makes sense i get that in changing anything we will always remove somebody's favorite something but we also have to deliver something that we can actually track. And the reason that I can tell you that we're gonna be 25% you know, or 50%, 25 goals by the time we get to the tech update is because we've designed these actions to have specific deliverables. So when Director Hawkins talks about what needs to be done, I think it's really clear that we know we need more water projects and we, we can track those now better than we ever could before with the investments we've made to modernize our system with a grant and loan portal. We need to evaluate trends clearly, and we can do that again better than we ever could in the technical update. And as we do that process, we will inherently have iterative stakeholder engagement um, around a variety of topics. And, and many of the things that were pointed out, maybe that they thought we could include or add, add more detail around or do new analysis around would fit there. And we need trackable actions. And so by design, this plan is delivering a version that's more streamlined and accountable. So to get to the actions piece, because this is really important, and we talked about this up front, that we have the 50 partner actions, the 50 agency actions. The partner actions, honestly, there's more than those. And you know, for the 50, 60 that are in there, the reality is there are hundreds. It's limitless. It's whatever somebody could come to a grant for us for. But I think some of the feedback we got from this board was to be clear about project level examples that we could do that tied back to and grafted to water plan grant programs so that people coming in for grants knew what to look for, knew what they could put, they could put in a grant for and would be accepted. So we've tried to hit a broad brush on that. We've gotten a lot of feedback. We also got a lot of feedback on agency actions, the things that, again, that we're going to do. And maybe that, to me, was a piece I expected a little bit less uh, attention around because that, in some way, is just so personally our piece of this that's the, um, you know, really our strategy document of CWCB. But in retrospect, it makes sense. Um, Making actions actionable was a real big piece for us. It sounds like an action would always be actionable, but we learned from the first water plan that when we say things that are very broad, like um, support citizen science, of course we want to do that. There's no end date. You can't track that. So as soon as somebody says, what percent complete are you on the water plan? And we say, well, we track our actions. And then we have to backtrack a little from that because we say, well, this action maybe isn't really an action. And that was confusing, right? So we're trying to be more transparent about what we're calling an action. Um, all the agency actions we have generally led by CB CWCB, again, where we had a coalition of the willing from our partner agencies and huge appreciation to CDPHE, um, CPW, DOLA, um, so many good partners across the state helped us do some good thinking here and signed on to support some of these actions. They were also very clear with us that they may not, in some cases, even when it's forward thinking, have budget or staff that they can promise to allocate. So us, uh, if they wanted to be listed as a lead, that was great. And CDA is a great example of that where there's several that they signed up for. Um, you know, on some of the others, they just felt like, well, we can't lead this, but we want to help you and we can dedicate staff. In some cases, they said, we can't do either of those things, but we certainly want to be involved in the discussion. So, of course, we will involve a group like CDPHE when we're talking about water quality issues. They just may not be listed because they ask not to be in that way. So we're honoring their feedback, but we also, converse of that is we have their commitment on a lot of these actions. So um, a few more things on the agency actions. So they're identified at the agency level. 
we do not attribute staff or titles to any of the actions. And there's a lot of good reasons we don't do that. I think one of the comments we got is, um, you know, on a specific topic, it says you're going to do this, but it doesn't say who's going to do it. Well, we don't say that about anything. You know, it's understood that our agency is going to lead on these things. And if we're writing it down, saying we're going to do, we're going to do it, right? And we know by this being such a public process, people will hold our feet to the fire. I have no, no fears about that. Um, our collaborating agencies, as I said, were only identified to the extent they wanted to be listed. CWCB can engage with any number of agencies as we move along, as I noted. And, um, you know, for us, the agency actions really do take on this uh, feeling of SMART goals. And, and we know when they're done. Um, we don't always maybe know what impact they had, but that's our goal is to design them in a public way that helps leads that helps us lead to impact. And then we measure impact generally by the uptake of those products. So when I think about things like the excitement around wildfire ready watersheds or Chris's um, fluvial hazard zone mapping and that getting uptake and maybe even putting it put into local codes, we know that that is valuable when we hear that when we see our stakeholders use the tools that we're helping create. I will also note, because we talked about this last May, and I think that this is an important point, but this 10 strategies um, for climate resilience in the Colorado River Basin. I, I, I like this report immediately because it reminded me, even in what it says, the report seeks to bring light to the potential for investigating, testing, and scaling up, right? That's very much what the water plan is trying to do for state of Colorado issues. And you see a lot of our same friends who have made comments on our plan here sign up for this, but what I really like about this report um, is that they outline 10 actions. These are the 10 kind of project level examples, very similar to how we're thinking about partner, um, partner actions that people should do. And I had a really great conversation with, um, with uh, somebody at, at the uh, Sustaining Watersheds Conference that talked about how they're actually looking in their strategy to say, are we funding things along these projects? Like, are, these, are we hitting all these? Maybe we're hitting seven of these, but we need to be thinking about others. So we know practically that you don't have to have a number to hit to, to make an impact. You can lead with project level examples. And that's very much how we're thinking about the water plant. So we we showed this to you in May, but when we think about what we do as an agency, we think about the tried and true versus the cutting edge. What we do as CWCB, we're in that experience space, maybe you know, leaning towards emerging, where we, you know, our programs are all based in that experience space. When we start to think about you know, merging trends and ways that we can push boundaries, we do try to do that through our agency actions. We're trying to get the next step in the process to push things a little farther to help define and bring groups together to help us refine that. So the things we do to have new studies, research frameworks, the groups that we bring together, like at the Landscape Summit, um, developing support tools, like this is very much in that space where we're trying to kind of push the boundaries and bring our stakeholders along with us. But where we really have the ability to work across this entire spectrum is through those partner actions. Our partners can do and come in for grants on any number of things that we've outlined or not that maybe push the boundaries even further or maybe work on the experience side of the spectrum, right? So what we can do through grant funding, through stakeholder collaboration and individual action, really our partners can work across this entire spectrum. Um, and you know, one of the things I think we say in the water plan, I think is just so important to, to note is that we meet this moment together. Local action is critically needed. Um, we can't do it alone. We can't do it alone as one agency. We can't do it alone as you know state versus right. It has to be together. It's it's about breaking down the silos. Um, so I will also note that there will be many moments, and we've lived through several of those even this last couple of years, right? So it's not just this moment. Again, the water plan being updated is certainly not the last bite of the apple. It's just the next phase of work and. A thousand things are going to happen outside of the water plan, just in the same way they've happened. We are framing up maybe a, a vision that's broad enough to house all of those things and not conflict with any of them. So I, I would just know, I think you know, maybe just to out of legislation, so much of what we can do, what our authority is, both as a staff board, um, you know, given to us by the legislature. But I think very few people would really just determine to that point of what's a water plan mean to me, but the primary purpose of a water plan is to determine the optimal amount of conservation and development of Colorado water's resources. Um, it, it's only a policy, it's not a rule, and it does not have the effect or force of law. So a lot of the comments we have are, you know, you must do these things, or you, you have to tell somebody they will do X, like we, we can't do that, and we're not legislatively authorized to do that, so we have to lead um, through the kind of soft power that we have of policy of convening groups of funding and push in a, in a very delicate way. And I would say as a policy agency develops developing a policy document for which we do not have 
primary responsibility as outlined in legislation and that must defer to local authorities, we're being very ambitious and very bold. So we have a role to play, so do other agencies, and so do local authorities. We need our municipal partners. We need our county officials. We need everybody pulling together. Um, we can act as an integrator and a thought leader, and I think that we, with your help, have set bold visions to do that in the plan. Uh, in a state that's local control, many of the state, the decisions that are going to occur around water are outside of what we can do or affect as an agency, and honestly, outside of what the state can do, as the state being the the state agencies, plural. Um, so we need to really build this collaboration. CWCB can inspire that. Um, and we do that through a lot of our visions in the plan. And we're gonna help do that um, with a lot of the, the work that we're funding as well. And see, see, we don't build water projects, but we fund them. So there was my point. <laughs> um, so with that, I think we can um, talk a little bit about what we heard in public comment, but um, Director Brown, if you, are feeling good, we can keep going, or if you want to take a break, or if you have any questions, we can do that. Thanks. <clears throat> Rock and roll. I think we keep going. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Public comments. So we won't walk through every single comment. <laughs> the public comment period was open from June 30th to September 30th this year. Um, at the time, the water plan was made available in English and Spanish on our Engage CWCB site. Uh, during the time that the plan was up, and it's still up now, uh, the site recorded over 3,100 visits to the pages containing water plan information. Um, <clears throat> the English language version of the plan was downloaded over 1,000 times. Uh, the Spanish version was downloaded over 40 times. And um, videos posted about the water plan briefing, stakeholders on the plan were viewed over 100 times. In total, <clears throat> 1,172 submittals were made, including 73 letters and 10 emails, which yielded more than 510 pages of input after removing some duplicates and erroneous submissions and 2,000 observations. After sorting through all of that feedback to identify where changes were suggested, staff identified that there's approximately 1,500 uh, suggested edits or revisions. <clears throat> Staff and our contractors have read every comment and reviewed those comments against a series of guidelines and sideboards. Currently, we think that about 44% of the comments we've received will result in modifying the text of the plan. Uh, about 16% of the comments and the suggested revisions were already captured in the text and may result in some revisions, um, but probably very minor to the plan. And about 40% of the comments we noted, but may, may not actually revise the plan to accommodate. So um, with that, that's just a brief summary, but I'll turn it over to Russ and Lauren to discuss our approach for reviewing these comments. So I'm gonna go ahead and tee up uh, Matt Lindbergh here, and he's gonna talk a little bit about some of the examples um, that we heard that we think we can include, and maybe a few examples of what we may not. Yeah, okay. So um, there were, uh, and Matt Lindbergh with uh, Brown and Caldwell, uh, for the record, by the way, uh, there were all kinds of different themes that came through uh, in the public comment uh, period that we've been sorting through over time. And I'm just gonna share with you sort of a sampling of the kinds of things that uh, we are including. Um, the first one, leading with conservation, there were uh, several commenters that said, you know, we really need to focus on water conservation. That should be our top priority. And certainly the water plan is supportive of that. Um, it has all kinds of actions, partner actions, agency actions uh, that focus on water conservation. And uh, so we're going to add some text to the water plan that really sort of focuses on that, um, you know, highlights the fact that when we have conversations about how we're going to meet our future water needs, Conservation should be the first thing we talk about. Uh, enumerating local tools, several folks uh, identified different things that we should put a spotlight on. For example, uh, financing solutions, maybe doing revenue bonds or environmental impact bonds, those kinds of things. Uh, we didn't really have anything in the water plan about that. Uh, we talked about uh, different ways to fund projects, but we'll include some of that information. 1041 powers, that was something we didn't have in there. Uh, a description of conservation easements as a way to preserve habitat, to um, 
increase the permanence of uh, collaborative water sharing agreements. We'll add those kinds of things as well. Um, and a lot of these things, we're just gonna we're gonna add uh, maybe a text box, maybe a highlight for these sorts of things. We're still trying to keep the water plan brief and consumable, uh, so we're not gonna write a book, but uh, we definitely want to put a spotlight on a number of different things. Uh, talk about climate change in the present tense. Normally, when we talk about climate change, it's through the lens of those future planning scenarios, uh, but we have problems now, and we need to acknowledge that and focus on that. Leaning in more on uh, recreation, you know, recreation, uh, we a lot of times lump that in with environmental needs, kind of under the umbrella of non-consumptive uh, needs, but recreation has their own individual challenges, they have their own individual water needs, so uh, we're putting more of a spotlight on that. Uh, the importance of return flows, we heard a lot from ag water users about the importance of return flows. So many of our basins, the water supplies are return flow driven. Those return flows can support environmental and rec attributes, and we need to tell a better, uh, do a better job telling that story. And then uh, reaffirming prior appropriation, the prior water plan uh, supported prior appropriation. This plan needs to do the same thing, and we will make sure that that comes out. So things that were maybe a little problematic, and I should preface this by saying that not all these things are bad ideas, uh, but it may be that uh, that this is not the right venue for incorporating some of these. Uh, there were several requests to add staff to the CWCB to increase spending in different areas to maybe reorganize the board or the board makeup or the IBCC. You know, those sorts of things are described in legislation. There are other processes for those. So we've uh, been hesitant to implement those types of recommendations. Uh, Russ mentioned that uh, you know we've gotten some feedback to create mandates, tell other agencies maybe to fund things or hire staff. Can't really do that. Um, in some cases, there were some rec recommendations to uh, have the water plan be stronger um, and take a stronger stance in some areas and incorporate language that almost would make it seem like there's a requirement or a regulation uh, where one doesn't exist. We're trying to stay away from that. Um, uh, the information in chapter four, there were several folks who commented on that information. Um, and that's really in chapter four, we're bringing forward the feedback that we got from basin implementation plans. We wanted that to sort of remain in their words. And so we're uh, a lot of times not um, implementing those recommendations. There were a lot of, uh, and I think probably good recommendations to add different studies, reference different studies, add different data sets. Uh, but they may not be things that the CWCB has had a chance to vet. And so it may be best to really bring those forward during the technical update. So those are some things that uh, we maybe not have uh, incorporated. And then uh, creating new objective measures uh, for the uh, 2050 planning horizon. I think Russ talked a little bit about why that's problematic and we'll unpack that a little bit later. But these are um, things that have uh, informed the way that we are responding to comments um, and some of the guiding principles or uh, sideboards that we'll talk a little bit about. Um, and I'll just uh, bring up that sideboards are something that we have talked about in the past. So back in January, we talked about some guiding principles for how we'll put um, actions together. So uh, one of the sideboards that an action is something under CWCB's direct control and Russ visited about that a little bit, doesn't speak for other agencies, um, does not needlessly create legal problems. So, you know, we wanted to make sure that the actions that were perf uh, proposed didn't run afoul of water law and, and administration, but that generated a lot of discussion because we didn't want to sort of miss the boat. If there are some challenges that um, laws could be introduced or regulations could be changed to address, we don't want to preclude that kind of thing. So we thought about that and we'll talk about that in a little bit. And then uh, the actions need to be completable uh, within this cycle of the water plan. And so those were some initial sideboards. We've been doing some additional thinking and I'm going to uh, turn it over to Lauren to talk a little bit about uh, the sideboards that we're using to uh, guide our responses and comments.
the microphones. Um, so I'm Lauren Riss, I am with CWCB staff. Um, and we're gonna now go through the nine sideboards that we um, have put in the memo for your review and consideration. And again, just to reiterate, these are really meant to be uh, the guiding principles for how we are responding to the majority of, of comments kind of within these parameters. So there are nine of them. We'll go through them fairly quickly because you have them in front of you. Um, and if you have any questions, um, please feel free to, to interrupt us. And we're gonna be doing a little bit of musical chairs with the microphone on this, on this item as well. So the first sideboard is um, that we are striving to use non-prescriptive language. Um, we received, as Matt just noted, a number of comments um, that the water plan should be more emphatic in terms of saying we must do something or we should, you know, we shall do something. Um, but we're trying to be, I think, very transparent and avoid confusion about the fact that, it, at least as far as CWCB's actions are concerned, you know, we are abiding by the statutory mission and authorities that have, have been granted us by the General Assembly. And so, in order to avoid confusion, we really are deferring um, to using language like should and can and may um, and uh, really acknowledging the fact that we're not a regulatory agency and we do not have the ability to uh, force um, stakeholders or other agencies to do to do anything. We're really um, sorry for my gravelly grandpa voice. I'm getting over um, I'm getting over the latest virus for my kids, but I assure you I'm not contagious. Um, <laughs> as I'm speaking into a shared microphone. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, so the first sideboard is really just trying to be true to um, the reality that we are not a regulatory agency. So I'll hand it over. Uh, our second sideboard is creating adaptive plans, actions, tools, language, etc. Uh, this sideboard is important because we know a lot of our work is fluid and shifts based on acute things like legislative priorities, funding, and other reasons. Um, putting hard constraints on timing can unnecessarily create issues uh, for us. We also don't have um, our funding fully identified or locked in for implementing uh, the water plan actions, so this is something we have to allow some flexibility for. Um, another piece of this is knowing that the board will be cre creating an operational plan. Um, that'll be coming and that'll help us de define our priorities, but at this point we don't know what those look like exactly at this point. Um, there are other considerations here too, a new, new legislation uh, that may come down the road towards us um, and other major issues can alter the course of how we proceed, um, as well as stakeholder input and processes, including research that may need to be fully vetted or can shift the course of the work that we're doing. Um, also, an important piece that we're considering is we don't really want to bind the hands of future decision makers and future boards by timing or other, other real specifics that we put into uh, the plan. So we want to leave it flexible and adaptive. Okay, I have number three. Thank you, Russ. Um, this one really uh, highlights the fact that we have a, a cyclical planning process. And as you know, it has three steps. The first step is the technical update. That's our foundational data and information and our projections of future water needs. That information goes to basin round tables in step two, and then they update their basin implementation plans. And then the third step is the uh, technical update. And that process and the things that we look at have evolved over the years. If you think back to the original SWAZI, we focused on an m &I gap, and it was a project gap. Do we have enough projects and enough yield to meet our future needs? In Swazi 2010, we looked at agricultural on-field shortages. We also looked um, closely at non-consumptive needs. We broadened uh, our view of the things we were considering. With our last technical update, we implemented the planning scenario methodologies using CDSS tools, looked at our gaps in a little bit different way. We looked at the risk that we're gonna have shortages and not enough water to divert uh, for M&I and ag uses. We also developed a flow tool that helps us look at risk on the environmental and rec side. So trying to uh, produce data and information that can spur discussions on projects and strategies to help us mitigate our risks. The next uh, best time to make some uh, 
big adjustments to how we look at the future is the next technical update. And as Russ said, that's uh, the next step in the process. And during that time period, we're gonna look at trends in our water resources drivers. We're gonna recalibrate our planning scenarios um, and we're gonna rethink about our methodologies for how we look at the future. And so um, you know, I think that there are a lot of comments that we received that really are best addressed during that technical update. We had folks say that we should look at climate change in every scenario. Well, we can consider that. And we're not gonna redo our analyses at this point in the game, um, but that's what we could do at the next stage. Uh, other folks thought that um, we needed to update our data sets to current time frames. You know, our data sets went to 2015 when we completed the last tech update. Well, when we do the next one, we will extend those time frames. Um, some folks uh, suggested that we should include an environmental and rec gap in this uh, water uh, plan update. And that's the kind of thing that we would talk about uh, during the, the technical update. And so a lot of these things really um, are great ideas um, and things we should be considering, but it's not something we can include in the water plan at this time. Uh, there were also uh, you know, several studies um, and, and uh, data sets that folks thought we should include. Again, not a bad idea, but uh, things that we can uh, consider down the line. All right, <clears throat> again, the next one here, uh, apparently same frog in my throat. I'm blaming <laughs> Lauren. <laughs> um, okay, so just as we've talked, and this is, a, you know, did that long tee up to really kind of enforce why we went through this process. Because again, been thinking about these things for so long now and have been ingrained in it, but it, it's helpful maybe to step back through this background. So as I had noted, the way we track, we track progress is through our actions. One of those actions, as Matt just noted, is the technical update. So number three there, um, completing the technical update is when we are going to look at new trends. I, you know, so, some of the things that we're asked to include, and like we haven't even had time to vet, and it's incumbent upon us to make sure that we're comfortable with those things, that we agree that we're getting broad agreement. And especially after a public comment period, we don't want to add something in that you know we're always trying to mine the middle, right? We don't want to exclude anybody or or put somebody on edge that was comfortable before, right? We're really trying to be thoughtful about what we integrate. The right time to have robust decisions is when we do that tech update. Our partner actions and the investments, again, that we've made, not just in the grant and loan portal, but also the project database, are helping us to have a better understanding of the need that's out there, a much better understanding of costs that we had in 2015, and an ability to um, track those better and, and probably more easily mine some of that data than we ever had been able to before. And then on the agency actions, it, again, in, in addition to our day jobs, Right? We're committing to 50 actions that are big things, right? Uh, and we've talked about three of those being BIP and tech update and the next water plan. But there's a lot more that are in there. They're really designed to kind of set that stage moving forward. Completing those are, are something that we will easily be able to track now. And that is another way that we track. So either way you slice this up, whether it's partner actions, agency actions, or a specific action, we are now tracking progress through our actions. So when we get feedback about you know, different ways or being accountable, uh, we think we were being exceptionally accountable and more transparent uh, in that process. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so sideboard number five is really the sort of the tandem sideboard to the first one I discussed, which is we're not going to use language that implies we have some authority that we do not. This sideboard is really uh, we're not going to incorporate actions for which we don't have the authority um, to implement. And, and that, that really um, is framed by comments that we received that requested that the water plan recommend adding additional staff, for example, staff that focuses on recreation or focuses on um, equity and outreach issues. Um, we had some comments that uh, requested that the water plan include um, alternative funding sources to severance tax, um, also changing the, the makeup of the, the board, as Matt noted, um, changes to roundtables and IBCC. Um, all, of those, all of those issues, um, while they, they may warrant additional conversation, um, are, are really not, <clears throat> the, the venue for accomplishing those changes is, is really outside of the water plan. Um, there are established legislative 
processes um, for adding new staff to CWCB, um, as we've just seen through the governor's budget, um, which will now go through the, the joint budget committee and, and the general assembly, um, uh, you know, making uh, alternative funding sources to severance tax certainly falls um, outside of our out of our scope um, and is, is something that this board and agency really cannot accomplish single handedly. Um, and any any changes to statute um, again, well, while, while there there may be good ideas that weren't conversation, it's not something that we can put forward in this water plan because of the, the processes that exist through the governor's office working with stakeholders and the general assembly so. This sideboard is meant to uh, just be very clear that um, while there may be a number of good ideas out there and things that uh, we might accomplish through other avenues and venues, it really falls outside the scope of the water plan. The sixth sideboard is striving for brevity and readability. Um, during the scoping and between papers submitted and 15 workshops, we gathered 200 pages of notes. And then during this public comment period, we gathered over 510 additional letters and comments. And this is really great, obviously, because our stakeholders are extremely knowledgeable and engaged, but we can't include every suggestion we receive uh, verbatim. Uh, from the outset, we've set out to make the document shorter and more accessible and make it readable. And we've even, even with doing that, we've gotten comments that it's still too long. <laughs> Um, so we've had to strategically apply this sideboard um, when suggestions, even really good ones, uh, would add complexity and length to the plan. Um, on the topic of accessibility, we set a, an early goal to write this plan at an accessible kind of early reading level. Um, we haven't always hit that goal, but we've tried very hard. And to that end, we sought to kind of eliminate jargon from the plan. And I'm talking about terms and acronyms that are not found in the general vernacular. TBR, NBS, distributed storage, that kind of thing. Um, I do want to note that we will be adding a glossary to the plan that was not in the draft, which I think will help um, to that end. Um, but throughout, we've been trying to balance brevity and clarity at every turn um, and doing our best to find the right balance there. Um, and we also got very specific edits um, in the areas of reuse and land use in particular. I can think of some of those that were um, really helpful and um, really good information, but we may not have taken them verbatim. So we may have, we may reword those or, you know, adjust them to fit within the plan. Um, but we're, our goal is to honor the intent of those edits uh, where possible. So we may shift language to, to make it work. Um, and I think that's kind of the, the full scope of uh, sideboard six, but really striving for brevity and readability is the key there. Okay, lucky number seven. So looking for uh, creative solutions within Colorado water law. This one recognizes and I think uh, supports Colorado's existing framework for water law and administration. Uh, we work with the state engineer's office and the um, attorney general's office to do the technical <laughs> update to the basin implementation plans. And in this uh, update to the water plan to avoid language that would unnecessarily complicate legal issues. And we had a lot of feedback from commenters supporting uh, prior appropriation, um, but we also had uh, feedback that uh, was not so supportive of prior appropriation and in you know, several cases uh, suggested uh, changes in law legislation. Um, and so our approach on those uh, has been to highlight the flexibility within our existing legal system, not necessarily uh, suggest things in the water plan that would run afoul of water law, but also to point out that we have tools that uh, we regularly use. Uh, as Lauren pointed out, there are legislative processes to make changes to how we, um, how we operate. And um, in fact, if you that, that's one of the tools that's outlined in chapter five, if you go to chapter six of the agency actions, you can see where uh, each action has a connection to uh, policy and regulatory changes. So uh, we've tried to take that approach uh, to addressing those kinds of recommendations. All right. And this one, you know, we, we uh, I'll go quickly because we talked about this earlier, but uh, just acknowledging that we are a local control state and that local control, you know, local, hyper-local and sometimes decisions 
are really going to drive a lot of the decision making. So, um, you know, again, our, our goal to kind of identify those optimal levels of conservation and storage um, is, is probably a some level an impossible task of what the water plan is supposed to do because I think what Russ George would say is it's in the eye of the beholder, right? What's the optimal level? Um, what we do in the tech update, I think we've identified in uh, volume two, you can look at the storage plan that there's as much as, you know, maybe doubling almost the amount of storage in the state. I don't know that anybody wants to see that or <laughs> maybe some do. Uh, we certainly have some, you know, strong storage components and there's arguably storage as a part of the solution. For conservation, I think that we see, um, you know, some of the goals that we're doing in the technical update around, you know, that um, in our in our hot growth scenario and the difference of the, where conservation can make a difference in the scenario below that of reducing things is about, about 300,000 acre feet in the state um, as maybe being on the upper end of what's realistic to achieve in Colorado. So we do our best to kind of frame that discussion. Um, but, you, you know, just even judging by some of the comments that we got on very specific issues like um, Bear Creek Lake Park, you know, these are very personal and deeply important issues. And what the water plan gets right, I think, is providing a space to say, <laughs> We need to bring all these people to the table and that wasn't always the case right and maybe it's still not but we're trying to push to bring more inclusive approaches and the water plan is something people can leverage and point to around those decisions we can't ultimately in most cases make those decisions for them but the water plan sets up a framework and i think that we've we've seen that be pointed to as um, successful in some of the other bigger state discussions we've had when things get really contentious so um, this is again is just kind of acknowledging we can't tell um, local water utilities what to do uh, or county officials um, you know we are a local control state we have a role and a lot of that role is in a kind of a guiding or um, collaborating way and we do find a lot of collaboration and um, good solutions in that space but we have to stop short of saying you know thou shalt okay so this is the last sideboard item uh, for discussion um, and maybe this one is best summed up by um, saying that, that this board is open to uh, new ways of innovation and thinking. And just because it's not in the water plan doesn't mean it does not warrant discussion. Um, perhaps it just needs additional vetting or conversation. Um, but it's really, I think, our commitment that we're open to new ways of advancing thinking, to innovative ideas, and an acknowledgement that conversations will evolve and we will continue to think about the best way to address issues. And we expect those conversations uh, to start um, as soon as you all adopt the water plan um, in January. And that will be a process that is iterative and, and um, ongoing. So with that, do I turn it back to you, Russ? You up? Okay. Click and find out. <laughs> um, so but just but really briefly, since we are tracking really well with time, <laughs> we're catching up, I think. Um, I, I just did want to say, you know, none of these sideboards are meant to come off as us being dismissive or anything less than appreciative of the hard work and time that people have put in. Some of these single letters that we've gotten have been 100 pages. I mean, they're like half the length of the water plan. And uh, we intimately know how hard it is to write something like that, especially when you're trying to bring people together. Um, but at the end of the day, they're meant to kind of share maybe some insights of how we've been thinking about this for a while and you know provide some standardized language i think when we first got at comments we thought well here's what we would say and then i was like wow that's it's really problematic because we may not say it uh, the exact way our legal counsel would want us to for example and we're kind of handling these one-off it's better to bucket these things and kind of get a standardized response that just shares greater insight into what we can and can't do and how we're thinking about things so um i also will say and this is the reason we do public comment we got uh, a fair amount of um typos <laughs> that were caught and just kind of um you know areas where i think we did get some very specific edits that we could take we talked a lot about um you know we may not be able to take verbatim edits but i think in the area of like um, you know thinking around some land use and reuse discussions i know we got some very specific edits and we kind of vetted those internally said but well, these these all make sense this is arguably makes it stronger so we'll include that um so i just wanted to say that and then um you know, I, I guess, again, Director Brown, do we want to pause here for questions before we go to board letter or, or so they keep rolling? Are there questions? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> look at that. Go ahead. I'm sorry, we had asked for the mention of one sentence out of that um, reference to the regarding the Indian Trail Project and the Can you use your mic? 
I'm sorry, this is Jen Mealing with the AG's office. And actually, maybe this is something we'll, we'll talk about later, but there was a, a line in the, um, regarding the sideboard for water law that we had talked about. Did you consider deleting that? I, believe, I, I don't think it showed on there, but I hope it didn't. Oh, but I it, saw it in the packet. Maybe we can oh, chat okay. about that yeah, later. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, sure. thanks for us. Yeah, I think it was just a specific reference to where we get our legal guidance, <laughs> and it didn't make sense to be that detailed about it. So, yeah, you can fix that. I think four to head. Okay, great. Well, this one. Oh. Sorry, just before we leave this this item, I think um, maybe we just ought to acknowledge the time and work that it took for all of the commenters to read the plan and put words to paper and send those to us. Um, it's not 30,000 comments, but it has been an ongoing effort. And I think, you know, we really value the time and the suggestions that we received from all the various stakeholders and just an acknowledgement that we know that reading all of the, the pages that we put together took a lot of time and effort. So thank you to everyone. And please rest assured that I saw all of the process um, that went on in the agency and we read all of it. So thank you to everybody. I thought you were gonna say it wasn't pretty. I saw it and it wasn't pretty. It also was not pretty. <laughs> no. It was as pretty as it could have been. Unfair. Um, yeah, very true. And I would just, yeah, there were a lot of really excellent and thoughtful comments that we got from our, a, a range of stakeholders. And I think what we tried to do is just generally find the synergy where it wasn't maybe a, a political position or, you know, something that was pushing us to be over our skis in ways that we couldn't, but what are their commonalities? So a lot of the things that um, Matt talked about of just, you know, uh, things that we had not intentionally and just maybe omitted around 1041 powers or um, just, you know, how we could better it was certainly never our intent to um, be dismissive of recreation. I think our general thinking is if stream flows are bad, it's bad for a variety of things, but to, to better enumerate the ways we hear about recreation. And, and again, to Matt's point, you know, none of, it's not even to say that the ideas that we just noted and, and may not be able to take now are bad. I mean, I, I think we're hearing a lot of good input and kind of innovative thinking and, um, you know, on that recreation gap concept specifically, I have a meeting this Friday, so it's not even about pushing these off till whatever we're starting in 2025, 2026 with tech update, it's, you know, it, it's immediately, we're always accessible to people. In fact, I would encourage anybody to just pick up the phone and call us. And I think on the front end, some stakeholders felt um, maybe more empowered to do that than others. And we had a lot of good, I mean, not just the 200 pages of notes, but I can't, countless meetings, some on very discreet issues. Um, and sometimes we, we can't always find that middle ground or it's not the right time, but I think generally we get to a space of shared understanding and what our limitations are. And we always, I think, are receptive and open to trying to push where we can and where it makes sense. If, if anything, sometimes I think we also take the opposite stance of not pushing too far too fast so they won't get in the way of something or disrupt or there's a lot of, uh, you know, I think various versions of this comment of not um, presuming that something would be a certain outcome and kind of softening the language around that. So I think we're very receptive to that. So with that, I will turn it um, over. I, I think it's probably best for you, Director Brown, to lead, but I, I, we do have a letter that has been drafted by the board that we wanted to include in this packet for those who read it. I did not plan to read through it. Um, I'm hoping you're not about to ask me to do that, but I can if you'd like. Um, but it, there's an introductory level, a letter that we would um, you know, recommend be put in the front of the water plan. I think Director Felt had initially suggested it would be very powerful that to, to carry the signatories of the four, full board on it. Um, it is shown in attachment B for those that are listening in and want to read it. Um, but we thought we would open this up for any open discussions of if there were additional edits or, or comments on that. Thank you. And thanks to the board members that weighed in on the letter. I think um, it was definitely a group effort uh, that we all did separately, not together, of course. Um, there are some typos. I think there's minor edits, at least if the board has any edits they'd like to discuss now. Otherwise, I think it'll probably take a spin around uh, via email before we finalize it um, in the appropriate and acceptable uh, ways that staff is so good at. So we can move ahead unless anyone's really chomping at the bit to discuss this now. All right, move along, please. 
All right, so um, I guess what we wanted to do, oh, so before we move along, I'm getting ahead of myself now. Go back, sorry. Um, I guess we wanted to check in, so maybe I will actually hand it back to you for any public comments. Okay, um, we have public comment. We have some folks signed up here today. The first person I have on my list is Josh Kuhn. Josh, are you, I don't know. Um, I can't see that. Okay. All right. Go right ahead. Hi. You have, um, we're going to keep it to no more than three minutes, if you don't mind. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Josh Kuhn. I'm the Water Campaign Manager with Conservation Colorado. Um, you may recall I spoke to you at the last board meeting and just wanted to provide some comments one last time before the update is finalized. So, First and foremost, I wanna thank you both um, board and staff for the tremendous amount of hard work that you put into this update process. Um, I've seen a ton of dedication and capacity spent towards this effort. So really thank you so much for all your leadership. Um, I know future generations are, are gonna benefit from all of that work. So um, I just want you to know Conservation Colorado, we're a member of the Water for Colorado Coalition. And we submitted um, some detailed recommendations, many of which were just mentioned by staff, um, and that we had several letters of support done by dozens of various partner organizations, as well as businesses throughout the state who supported our recommendations. So um, before I get into too much further, I also want to raise some interesting polling results that um, we saw from exit polls from last week's election in which 83% of respondents express they'll be concerned if the state does not take strong action toward addressing drought and protecting Colorado's water next year, which I found just to be really fascinating. Um, and so there's a lot of political will. And so I think there's gonna be support for implementing this plan moving forward. Um, so one of my top line messages is that while the plan provides many actions to increase conservation and efficiency, I think it lacks the same level of commitment toward ensuring our rivers and wildlife are healthy in a hotter, drier future. Um, I know I heard staff comments about the, the gap for environmental and recreational needs, but I think if we wait until 2029, when the tech update is scheduled to be finished, that we're gonna see irreparable harm to our rivers. We're already seeing fish mortality, algae blooms, recreational closures increasing scale and pace just over the past couple years. And I'm just really concerned what this means to our environment as well as to the communities that are dependent upon the $19 billion river recreation economy. I'm sympathetic to the concerns raised by staff. I, I hear all of that. We did, I just want everybody to know we mentioned this concern during scoping. And so it's, I don't feel like it's, we just mentioned it during the public comment period. And now we're being asked to wait until 2029. So I'm happy to hear that, you know, Russ has a meeting upcoming and I, I hope we can make some progress trying to identify a gap for recreation and environmental needs. Another recommendation is around nature-based solution. And so I'm, I was really happy to see this included in the draft. Um, it has a ton of benefits, but I hope that the final plan strikes the need for augmentation and restoration and instead incorporates language around the importance of naturally distributed storage and the benefits it provides. If augmentation is required, nature-based solutions will become way too costly and just simply those projects won't be able to move forward. So lastly, I'd like to thank everyone who included equity, diversity, um, and inclusivity in the, in the draft. And I believe the environmental justice mapping is an excellent identified action at a good starting point. Um, but I think we need to better understand the impact that dis disproportionately and historically underrepresented communities have incurred. For example, recently Adams County made a move to dilute its water supply to avoid impacts from PFAS by purchasing supplies from Denver Water. And then a lot of Denver Water comes from the Colorado River Basin. So I'm just trying to help, help um, crystallize the connection between the impacts of pollution and then the impacts in the Colorado River Basin and how water quality and water supply and the health of the Colorado River are all intertwined. So to help address some of these historical inequities, I recommend that the CWCB um, work towards establishing an advisory group 
to develop strategies and an implementation plan for creating greater racial diversity and inclusivity in decision-making spaces, which hopefully will ensure that diverse communities are properly represented and that the plan is imp implemented equitably. So I know many of the recommendations received will not make the final plan, but I encourage board and staff to not just push those recommendations to the, to the side, but instead think of creative ways to include them um, moving forward and how we manage our water resources. So Conservation Colorado, we're here to be an acting partner working to implement the plan, but also thinking about some of those creative solutions. So really thank you all so much for considering my comments and for your public service. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you, Josh. We appreciate your comments. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, we will move forward to the next public comment, which is Chris Jahula. Okay, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I am a retired um, aquatic biologist. I worked for 25 years with Forest Service and BLM in, in six Western states as a fish, wildlife, and forestry program manager. I live now in Western Colorado in Glade Park. And I've been concerned in the 10 years I've been here at the temperature increases and the um, historic drought conditions that we have here in the Western Colorado. I commend the draft plan and its recognition of climate change and its impacts on water. And I would just like to make two main points. One is to reemphasize the need for conservation first. Uh, water storage is not going to get us out of this problem of uh, water shortage and increased population. Lake Mead and Powell alone evaporate over a million acre feet of water a year and increasing storage is just going to increase uh, evaporation and especially with increased temperatures. Uh, conservation measures on the other hand mean more water in the streams which benefits all of us. Um, I really was encouraged to uh, hear the comments from the Denver Water Board on their goal of reducing um, non-functional turf. Uh, that is encouraging because there are very few communities in the state that have taken on that approach. Um, we live in a desert. Other than a few mountain communities, the majority of Colorado has less than 20 um, inches of precip a year and that's considered a desert. And yet we're trying to grow bluegrass as if we lived in the Midwest um, or in Kentucky where bluegrass is from. Uh, just one point, converting 45 acres of bluegrass lawn to buffalo grass or another um, species that's more drought tolerant would save 100 acre feet of water a year. You multiply that out by the thousands of acres of bluegrass green space and, and parks and lawns that we have in this state and you could save substantial amounts of water at limited um, cost uh, to the homeowner or to the uh, uh, communities that are facilitating that. So I would encourage more emphasis on financial incentives to serve both in the municipalities and in the agricultural sector, uh, converting to sprinkler systems that use um, less water than, than uh, flood irrigation would be another um, area where we could save enormous amounts of water, uh, particularly in these agricultural areas of the West. Uh, the other area that I'd like to see the plan better emphasize is river health. Uh, more water storage means less water in our streams and rivers, and they're already at critical stages. Um, reduced water means reduced aquatic health, re reduced health of fish and wildlife. 70% of our wildlife in the, in the West depend on uh, riparian areas for their um, existence and more specific strategies for river health would be helpful to, to see, uh, to encourage uh, our 
ecosystem health and encourage um, support for the fish and wildlife industry that really supports a, a large uh, recreation industry in the state. Uh, so more specific conservation strategies uh, would be uh, very helpful. And with that, I thank you very much for the opportunity to comment. Thank you, Chris. We appreciate your coming and uh, speaking your concerns to us today. Next on our public comment list is Cody Perry. Welcome, Cody. You have the floor. Thank you. My name's Cody Perry. I'm testifying from my home in Dolores, Colorado. I'm a small business owner performing contract advocacy for land and water resources. I'm an avid river runner, a member of the River Management Society. I volunteer considerable time to citizen groups focused on localized water issues. I participate and engage with various basin roundtables and frequently interact with water users, wildlife managers, federal and state agencies. But it's my time out in the land and rivers though that most compels me to offer these comments after reviewing the update. The urgency, scale, and pace of the actions in the update do not meet the magnitude of our current water crisis. The 2015 plan detailed measurable objectives to meet a water gap by 2050, and the update lacks and should include more specific strategies to close this gap across all types of use. We must increase our commitment to equity. Equity language is used throughout, but the update doesn't spe specify who's leading the work or how it will be done. The plan can include how to bring a larger range of voices to work towards creating greater resilience for ecosystems and the challenges of our most vulnerable communities. Bring recreation to the table. Encourage, invite the Colorado Office of Outdoor Recreation to cooperating agency status. Create a dedicated recreation liaison to formally represent recreational interests for the citizens of Colorado. 19 billions generated from the state's rivers, lakes, and streams. And those interests, those interests need to be represented in this forum and in this update. Address recreational flows and temperatures. I've witnessed how climate change and aridification has contributed to significant temperature-driven river flow declines that disproportionately impact recreation and river health. And to me, this isn't some abstraction. And I've seen it over the years on every major river that falls from Colorado's western slope. The final update should include specific actions CWCB can take to better quantify the gap for recreational environmental flow needs. Include recreation into watershed planning. I recognize that the vast majority of Colorado subbasins have active and integrated plans that support environmental values, even though more public investments needed to implement those stream management plans. CWCB can also prioritize a similar effort for recreation focused project studies and these comprehensive planning efforts like evaluating boatable days or reevaluating environmental needs, enhancing river access, and so on. And finally, this is my last point, constructive approaches to storage and water development. The final update must include a framework to guide public investments and prioritize rehabilitation of existing storage infrastructure before committing, committing limited public resource to develop new storage or Trans Mountain diversions. I say this because the update specifically calls for these new investments in water development and storage projects. And while I recognize that Water storage plays an important role in supporting recreation and environmental flows. I seriously question the viability of using yesterday's ideas to address our future problems. Egregiously impacted rivers such as the Dolores reflect poorly on our collective ability to achieve balanced management of river health and recreational integrity. Other looming ill-conceived projects such as the proposed Wolf Creek Reservoir on the White River seem to be the poorest use of public investment to meet those future and current needs. Efficiency must be our guiding star is the main point. Thank you all for the dedicated, committed work you do and your enormous efforts with this water plan. Thanks. Thank you, Cody. It's great to hear from you. Uh, we'll move to Joshua Herr. Hi, uh, my name is Joshua Herb. Uh, I'm a resident of Westminster, Colorado, and I'm and I'm uh, very concerned with the effects climate change and drought are having on our state. <clears throat> we need bold actions and goals to address the serious challenges that Colorado is and will continue to face with respect to our water usage. The current plan does not have the fiscal capital necessary to accomplish any bold and actionable goals by the state, leaving an underwhelming and at least partially ineffective plan. 
But the additional funds from the federal infrastructure bill, I would expect the fiscal issue to be easily addressable. I also expect to see stronger objectives from this plan and solid quantitative data that's made publicly available so that the people of Colorado can track the status of these objectives and hold our state accountable for meeting these objectives. <clears throat> I also feel the plan strategy for prioritizing traditional storage mechanisms such as dams and reservoirs lacks innovation in a time where new ideas are essentially required to meet today's climate and conservation challenges. Last, I am disappointed that the plan fails to address the health of our rivers and bodies of water. As someone who has had the great fortune to grow up around nature, I would like to see a better plan to address the health of our rivers and lakes, which is critical to the continued preservation of our wildlife. I would still like to enjoy my nature excursions with lush wildlife, and that is only attainable if we care for the water necessary for that wildlife to thrive. Uh, thank you for all of your hard work and appreciate you guys taking the time to hear my comments. Thank you, Joshua, for joining us today. Um, Hattie Johnson, you're up next. Hi, thank you. That was perfect timing. I was about to have to run to uh, pick up my kiddo, so <laughs> thank you. Um, and, and thanks to you all um, for being here today and, and want to echo Josh's comments from earlier, just the, the work that staff and the board have put into this, uh, into updating the water plan. Um, you know, I had noticed all the outreach done prior to and, and during the public comment period for the draft, but it was really impressive to see in black and white and in the memo on this topic, all the meetings and the listening sessions that were held around the state are really commendable. So, so thank you to your dedication there. Um, as we heard a few times from in the presentation today, um, um, and, and American Whitewater is really happy to, to hear those, um, that public comments had identified a need for greater focus on water-based recreation benefits and actions. Um, I am the Southern Rocky Stewardship Director for American Whitewater. I live in, in Carbondale, Colorado, and and uh, explaining and discussing how uh, recreation plays a part in our communities across the state is something I do daily. So it's I, it's always enjoyable to hear it from others. Um, we also really appreciate staff including that as something that can be addressed um, and better emphasized and clarified as a part of this plan update. So thank you for that. Um, at the risk of repeating some of the comments I've made to the board before and, and those we submitted a part as a part of the public comment, um, I do wanna state here again, the importance that water-based recreation has on community communities across the state. Um, we would like to see recreation included as an important value as a part of the vibrant communities action area. Water-based recreation encompasses many activities um, that make our state such a desirable place to live and raise a family. From skipping rocks on the riverbank with our kids, catch a re catching a record-breaking trout, record breaking trout, or running an adrenaline pumping rapid, flowing rivers provide a host of social, cultural, and economic values for our communities. We feel that including recreation water uses as a part of the vibrant communities action area, in addition to its appropriate inclusion in thriving watersheds, will encourage actions that quantify non-consumptive water uses and support multi-beneficial water sharing projects. We also hope that going forward, there can be broader inclusion of other partner agencies. Um, as we heard here today, um, there is a recognition and, and an attempt to not create work or responsibility for those for other state agencies. Um, but we encourage CWCB to reach out to other offices like the Outdoor Recreation Industry or Tourism offices that can help CWCB quantify outdoor recreational values. We think this will be very helpful in addressing the unique challenges and needs facing the recreational community. Additionally, we do understand that these are substantive changes are often made during subsequent cyclical updates and hope that the comments received receive during the part of this water plan update can lead to efforts supported by the state that will better quantify the water supply gap for recreational and environment, environmental water uses that you reference, referenced here today. 
It's important to better understand how non-consumptive water uses are currently being impacted by reduced water supplies, as well as how they could be under future supply scenarios. We recommend that these gap analyses do be distinct from one another. The needs and values um, for water for the environment and recreation are informed by vastly different data. Importantly, however, meeting those values can often complement one another, so it remains important to always look at them hand in hand. For this update, we do ask that language could adhere to the sideboards that are presented today and address some of the comments received by identifying an action item that could be addressed through the technical update. We understand that those analyses cannot be incorporated by the end of next month, but we hope that defining actions to quantify non-consumptive water uses, use gaps can be included in this water plan update that will then go to support the next te technical update. Russ mentioned earlier the number of actions identified that will help inform that update, and we hope that this can be one of them. American Whitewater, um, along with our partners and consultants, are committed to continuing to engage in the water plan and hope that we can be an integral partner um, to better include rec recreational water uses. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Hattie. <clears throat> Thanks for joining us again. Appreciate it. Uh, final public comment is Alex Kim. Hey, thank you so much for having me. My name is Alex Kim. I'm from Westminster, Colorado. And obviously, everyone should care about how much water we have and are projected to have, no matter how old you are. But being 27 years old, I've hopefully got a long time left to live on this planet. And so the current historic drought in Colorado and across the rest of the West is acutely concerning. And I'd like to speak briefly to two parts of the 2023 water plan. And the first is on use reduction. As we know, agricultural uses in Colorado comprise, what, over 90% of water use across the state, and that remaining 10% for municipal, so, so you know, that remaining 10% for municipal conservation industry are important. Um, but let's not pretend like shaving around the edges is where all the focus needs to be. This plan needs to focus heavily on agricultural conservation, because that's where the bulk of use really is. And speaking in terms of actual physical water, a 10% drop in agricultural use saves almost 10 times more than a 10% drop in municipal use. And the second part I'd like to speak to is on accountability. I'm a small business owner, which in some ways is the ultimate form of personal accountability. Everything I do well reflects on me directly. And of course, so does everything I do poorly. There's nothing to hide behind. And when it comes to water, eventually, there will be nothing to hide behind either. Accountability is good and specific benchmarking and targets along the way are critical to figuring out how things are going and how to pivot when things aren't going so well. So to be blunt, a plan without much accountability is, in my opinion, useless. Measurable goals and benchmarks along the way are non-negotiable. Thank you all for your hard work to make sure that Colorado will have sufficient water for generations to come, and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Do we have anyone else signed up for public comment? Is there any public comment in the room? Okay, great, thank you. Um, we have come to, it looks like, the end of the agenda as it sits in front of me. Are there other things that you would like? Otherwise, I'd like to give the board an opportunity to comment or ask questions um, on your presentation today. I have one slide on next steps, but I think it makes sense probably to wait for the discussion and do that. Okay. All right. Um, I see, I think that's Celine. Director Hawkins, did you have a comment? Not at the moment, thank you. Okay, great. Um, comments in the room, Director Brody? Thank you for the great presentation and, and more importantly, thank you to CWCB's amazing staff and our consultants for all the work to get to this point. Um, and in particular for, for um, digesting all of those many amazing public comments. Um, I think it's really both a testament to all the outreach um, that you've done and also how fortunate we are as a state to have such an engaged public um, that you've gotten uh, so much feedback and I um, really appreciate the way you're taking it to heart. Um, I've raised this directly with Steph, but, but I do want to say it on the record. I, I think we need to continue to challenge ourselves in terms of sideboards. I realize that CWCB by statute has a limited scope, um, but ultimately 
some of the problems that we need to address as a state are broader than what any one agency, what any one board can do. Um, and in particular, and, and we heard this from one of our commenters today, um, we've, we've got this tension between um, wanting to make sure we're protecting water quality um, and also um, recognizing that we've got a finite um, source of, of, of surface water. And we're going to need to think more collaboratively and more creatively about how do we how do we balance the, the many competing demands on our water resources in order to ensure that we're um, stewarding them and protecting them, not just for for today, but for future generations, which is in essence what this board is all about. Um, and so whether it's reflected in in the current water plan, I realize it may not we may not have any type of specific action around it because it may not be something within um, this the CWCB's purview or control. I do think we need to acknowledge the need for collective action and for collaboration across the state, across the agencies, and and frankly, potentially across not just the administration but also the legislature as as we think about how to tackle some of these larger thornier problems. So thank you. Thank you, Director Brody. <clears throat> Any other comments from the board? Director Sakata and then Director Phil. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, again, thank you, staff. You did a wonderful job. Um, I would also actually want to make the recommendation that other people read all the comments. I found, I thought there was a lot of opportunities for partnerships when I read through them. Mm -hmm. It was like, wow, this is a great idea. I, you know, I saw, I, I hate to use a personal example, but I thought, oh, Kawa should contact this group and say, can we work on this together? So, uh, you know, I, uh, I'll make that plea because I think that would help us uh, progress on meeting the needs that we want to. So um, I think this process leads to that and those opportunities. So thank you. Oh, but I was one more thing, sorry. I think there's a lot of hope and optimism too, because we have an 11 year old water ambassador out there that's ready to go. And so I'm really <laughs> excited about that's that. I, I know all of us were talking about that as we read those as those plans, you know, to have an 11 year old say, I am your water ambassador. That is, I mean, what what hope and optimism we have when we have the, that kind of that kind of citizenry people in, in the state. So thank you. Heck of a job application to just say, you should have this job and I will take it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, we like her already. Yep. Uh, Director Felt, go ahead. Um, yeah, I don't know if I have the, the answer to what I'm going to just bring up, but it, it really, it struck me just now. Um, I think most of the comments we just heard included a plea regarding recreation and certainly seen a lot of written comments that spoke to that and you know i've been just sort of wrestling with that a little because I, that, you know i think many of you know that's how i spent a lot of my time that's what drew me into this situation i'm in and uh and so it's very it's very front and center for me but i also really clearly recognize that it's a non-consumptive use. It's, it's not an end use, it, it, and it shouldn't ever be sort of the end use or the probably the primary driver. Um, and it's also not an essential human need. I mean, a lot of people in this earth never recreate in their whole lives, or if they do, it's in their head or whatever. But, um, you know, we have, we're, we're fortunate to have the recreational opportunities we do and but as I thought about it I, I, I don't want to take anything away from their points because um, I think we've all <coughs> probably everybody in this room has had good experiences or at least memorable ones uh, recreating <laughs> on water in Colorado and so you know I was thinking back about gosh I want to say it was about 12 years ago or so I think it was sort of in the Swazi context but there there was a, a one pager that came out that just listed a whole series of bullet points of sort of qualities or attributes that a good proposal for funding 
should have. I mean, or you should try to hit on some of these, or maybe even all of them if you could. And you know, recreation was in there, environment was in there, fisheries were in there, these non-consumptive benefits. And when we met in it was the I think I want to say maybe it was in July or May. I'm not sure, Russ, but it was. You know, we, we did a big water plan discussion and it yep. was a little rough. I talked to you on the phone afterwards yes, and stuff. That was me. Um, <laughs> I'll never forget. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, at that time, I think we did talk a little bit about, as a board, about, you know, could we establish priorities or for funding, you know, and not just take things as they come, but try to put some, maybe some stakes in the ground out there that helped people think about how to make a good project even better. Um, conversations they might add to their, their work on, on proposing a project. And I, I just wanna reiterate that. I, I, and what I'm getting at maybe is, I don't think the answer to the recreation problems that, or concerns that people are raising is necessarily the water plan. I think it's good to catalog it there and highlight it, draw, shine a light on it, but the real solution, because recreation doesn't have the water rights typically, and it doesn't have the money, uh, doesn't have that political center of gravity, um, and maybe doesn't address an absolutely, you know, sort of survival-based need that, that we can, I think, I mean, I don't know if we ever really get the legal answer to that question, but we have, I think, the ability to help drive, whether it's formally or informally, um, more inclusion and help these people, help all of us achieve those benefits without actually causing problems for anybody else necessarily or harm for anybody else. Um, but th that's a kind of leadership that probably will come more from the board and from funding decisions than it will from what's in a plan, a, a written plan that's not regulatory, right? It, as you've pointed out. So sorry to ramble as usual, but um, it's just, I feel like I need to say something about it because a lot of people have mentioned it. I think they deserve, I feel like they were deserving of some sort of answer. And I also think, so there's a verbal answer, but I think that, you know, it's up to us whether we want to try to do something along those lines. Um, but I think it's, it's, it is needed. Thanks. Thanks, Director Felt. As I mentioned before, it's so nice to be the chair and go last because your topics get covered, but um, just wanted to add a plus one to the conversation on quantifying um, and I think defining the desire for the recreational gaps. Yes, we're hearing a lot about it. Um, I receive comments in my inbox for the state um, email address regarding um, recreation environment, I think it's very obvious that people in Colorado um, prioritize healthy rivers, um, and I don't think that it needs to wait for a technical update to address these. We have many grant programs that cover these. Um, Chris Sturm's programs uh, come to mind, but I know that they fit into our other grant programs and we have an incredibly collaborative water community and, re and growing recreational community. And to Director Sakata's earlier point, we see the folks listed in the comment period, there's more than enough stakeholders to have these conversations. And in addition, we've done the good work at our basin roundtable level to build the relationships within our basins where you don't just have to be a recreationalist, you can um, you know, now have these strong relationships with agriculturalists, with municipal providers, energy um, pro producers, et cetera, and, and continue having these in-depth conversations to get us where we need to go. And so I would encourage the folks, uh, many of whom I know personally, Cody, um, Hattie, Josh, you know, I'm glad that, that Russ has these um, meetings scheduled, but these are things we can accomplish. We do not have to wait till 29. 
Um, so let's, you know, use the tools we have to to inform the board, to inform our other stakeholders and the state of what what the recreational community needs and means by these gaps and what how these gaps can actually be filled in the future to uh, keep our rivers healthy. Any further comments or questions? We are just doing so good on time. Oh, Celine and Director Dutton. So, uh, Celine, uh, God, you're still Director Hawkins when you're on the screen. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> Go right ahead. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to speak now. Um, just wanted to thank everybody around the state who submitted public comments, who emailed us, who appeared today. Um, I think that a couple of things are really telling to me. It's just so clear to me reviewing and hearing these comments how much water means across the state. And so I think that's really to our advantage and to being able to tackle some of the challenges that are set forth in the plan. Um, and I'm really looking forward to seeing sort of the split out um, between sort of how the staff is looking at responding to some of the comments. Um, it was really helpful to hear that presentation today. Um, I did want to say just something about, um, you know, I appreciate it being quoted and I am going to double down and talk about this tension between vision and accountability. I can I, I know that I was one of the board members that really pushed for the um, sort of the big picture vision to be ambitious and to not focus on a sole measurable outcome such as, you know, progress towards ATMs or towards stream management plans. And I still continue to think that we need to be visionary within the sort of big picture ways that the work is being framed because we have a lot to do in the state. I don't think that that precludes measuring progress. Um, I do think that this board and agency will be measuring progress, whether it's something that we are directly advancing as an agency or through um, the collaborative work that will largely come in front of us um, through the grant portal, which I think will be able to um, sort of track what we're doing. And so I don't see these things as being mutually exclusive. I absolutely think that we will be tracking progress. I think the annual planning process will allow the board to have a regular time to sort of course correct if it looks like we're really not on track to accomplish what's in the plan. So just wanted to say that I hear that, I continue to think that there's tension, but I also think that if we focus on too few very measurable outcomes, we are going to miss the opportunity to, to really address the scale of what we're facing through drought and aridification in our state. And thank you. Thank you, Director Hawkins, Director Dutton. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Um, I just want to pile on here because this feels like a pretty historic moment you know, getting to this point in the plan. And so thanks again, you know, the whole team sitting here and then everybody else in the audience and everybody that isn't here today that was part of it. I, I just want to commend you on getting to this point and all the hard work. And especially want to thank you guys for distilling down the comments. We all, you guys know I love a spreadsheet, but just being able to scroll through and, you know, collect and, and be able to see common themes. I do have to admit, I, I would have probably petered out and not made it through every single letter. And so I appreciate you making it to where we could we could digest it and see things that way. And so thank you so much for doing that. That was really, really helpful. And 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 I like the other uh, directors really enjoyed getting getting a flavor, getting to see what people said. And you know, I, I did key in too on this this tension between water quality and water supply and and you know as our as our rivers are drier we're seeing these water quality impairments be it temperature or um, total dissolved solids or or just not enough water for for fish to float and so i that's something that similar to this recreation conversation i was i was struck by and i would encourage our partners to think about you know coming coming back to us with some ideas here because i don't think these things should wait and um, I do really appreciate your leadership on on this, Madam Chair, in encouraging our partners to come forward. I, I love the slide about the 50 partner actions and 50 CWCB actions because it's 50-50. You know, we're in this together. We're a partnership with the water community. And 
I think we really got to see that in full force today with the Arkansas Valley Conduit Project that, you know, we are, we're a, a board that brings together ideas. We put forward, you know, this, this vision, but really we're only as strong as, as the rest of Colorado who's willing to come up with and lead and champion projects. And so we're, where we can be a catalyst for funding to move things forward. I think that's where, you know, where we shine and where our opportunity is. And so um, thanks again for everybody that made a comment. And I would hope, hope that if you're listening and you hear this kind of, um, I mean, we have a ton of grants available. So <laughs> please come and see us because these, we, we need to keep moving. And again, just so, so proud of staff's leadership on this. I thought it was really telling Russ that you highlighted the, the forest health conversation and that yeah we didn't have enough data to include it this time but Kara's already putting together a meeting in December uh, to get it going for the next one and so I think that's another example of how this board is committed to continuing to build on data and move things forward so thanks um <clears throat> thank you and, and thanks to all of you and I think some things came out of our conversation today that at the least could definitely be included in the board letter. Um, I really like director Brody's comments around collective action and the reminder that um, director Dutton just touched on as well that you know collective action with the agencies and with the legislature. Um, to all the comments about you know having this plan be strong. We can only do so much. And um, if this is something that needs to, that the, the Coloradans feel needs to be legislated, then our job is to educate our legislature, as I know Deputy Riss does on an annual basis to come back and talk about the work we do. And we can do more of that. Um, we can work with WECO and we can continue to make sure that we are educating folks out there. And I think think that um, Colorado has done a really impressive job of doing more education, including folks like Denver Water, um, Southwest, Southeast, each of our individual water conservancy districts across the state uh, through PEPO funding at the Basin Roundtable level or through their own dollars coming through the mill levy um, has really stepped up in the last decade of educating people about water their local water supplies and um, collectively what's important to the state. And so that is something surely we can continue to do because education, you know, moves the needle for um, our future water um, liaisons that are 11 years old out there. And um, maybe, maybe we do create junior water liaisons. I don't know. Um, and then <laughs> In addition to that, the comments uh, from Director Sakata on the partnership examples in the comments, I think is really ripe to include in our letter too. It's a great update. Um, that letter was compiled over the end of the summer. Now we've seen the comments. There is a way to um, talk about some of these actions in there as well. So I think we can follow up with you during that process and note all the important things including uh, director hawkins comments just now as well and make sure that that we don't drop the ball on this last little bit and that's our job as a board not necessarily your job as staff so all right we've talked enough we've had enough fun there's nothing else all right next steps so let's hear it awesome and thank you all so much again i, I really just appreciate the breadth of comments there and I think was mentioned on several times, but I will just, I think it bears reiterating that not only are there great opportunities for collaboration, but come in for grants. Like, I, I think we had talked about that, Director Boucher, but some of these ideas are great and they don't have to wait. They can happen now. <laughs> Bring in a grant to us. That's what it's there for. I think I'm reminded the, the other public comments we got in July of, of uh, the young gentleman that spoke, he said, you know, what do you what do you want to say to your kids? Do you want to say that you made this plan or do you want to say that you funded this really cool project? Right. Help us with those cool projects. We need them and we have more funding uh, than ever right now across all our various grant programs to do that. So thank you all. And maybe I'll oh, back to oh, one more. Sorry. <laughs>
Uh, I'm, I'm back in the click breaking. Nick. We know we're going to celebrate get a click? in January. <laughs> Nope, yes, oh, there we go. There we go. Perfect. Here we go. Okay, so um, I just want to make the note again, and I'm reminded of this because a comment even when we presented to the legislature, I think there was questions about equity, and it just really dawned on me that equity is a topic that doesn't have an end date. We're always working on these issues, and I bet for every issue you could identify in the water plan, that's true. When do we stop solving the egg challenge? I would say never. We're just moving the ball further down the field together. So again, this shouldn't be seen as the end or something that missed very much immediately even we're already seeing things are already running to ground before that this before this is uh formally approved so I, I am very hopeful that we can nobody sees this as a barrier to implementation or to closing down any of the great ideas we've heard um final board approval will be set for january 24th i you know when we do that i'm very excited just to announce we're going to have an event at the csu spur center we are going to be space limited on that so we'll have to just be Careful, but very much see this as a re-envisioning of kind of the C9 Summit night, the first night that we had of that from back in 2019. Um, imagine we'll have a, a, a little bit of um, small speaking engagement pieces and then uh, really want to revisit this Basin Hero Award. So we've been talking to the round tables and also in addition to that, have a kind of a public facing piece of that too, because I think increasingly it's important to recognize new leaders in our community that are stepping up. So um, we will be getting the word out about that increasingly. Um, so pending approval, just wanted to set the stage. We are going to, we have to um, make edits immediately. I think we have some pretty good direction of where we, we think we want to go. If you are uh, uh, taking in again, the things that we, uh, even outside of public comment period, but it specifically heard tonight, I think will shape how we amend those drafts. Uh, the goal is to really have a final draft that is done by the end of December because we, we really need to hit that in order to do all the other work that comes along with this. So uh, posting everything online and revamping two websites, not just one, um, making the final edits to the document. We have some other tools and I think increasingly resources. Um, one of my just minor pet peeves in the original plan was just broken links. So just trying to make sure that the links aren't just in the plan, but resources online that people can access. Um, translating the document, especially the executive summary. Not that we won't do the full thing, but just because we're pushing the line, we may have uh, you know final full text of the uh, final document out a little bit farther, but at least getting the executive summary, which as Director Felt told me when we met in Salida, will probably be the thing that most people read in Spanish and English um, will make a, a lot of sense. And really using that as, as a catalyst to kind of codify a lot of the great comments that we heard and make people feel heard in this executive summary um, is really a goal of ours. So, you know, kind of reiterating things we've said, but adding some of these emphasis, not just on page 97, but in the executive summary. Um, and then we uh, hope to have a final printed version of that, uh, at least executive summary that we can bring to that board meeting. Um, so we are very much on track to do that and um, hope to have at least an internal final for kind of red line review uh, for the board um, uh, early uh, December. So um, just wanted to kind of note that. And with that, um, Director Brown, turn things back over to you. I think the approval recommendations, especially with regards to uh, recommendation two, may change or need to be amended. So I'll leave that to you. Thank you. Um, well, this is really up to you, board. Uh, here we have the staff recommendation. Are there comments, questions, anything online? Okay. Okay, Director Fels. Just quickly on this second recommendation, it sounded like Director Brown, you had you called out some things that we might be able to work into that that would reflect the latest conversation. So maybe we can say uh, amend and approve or something like that yeah. on that one. Obviously, we, we need maybe we just need a little plan or a review committee or something to get that finished and get it to you. Is it necessary that we? approve the board letter into the plan? Is that a necessary action? It seems a little maybe far afield from what we need to do. That sounds I would say my personal opinion is that you don't have to take action on that, but it, I would think it would be important to all of you to agree. But I think however you accomplish that is probably up to you and just fine. <clears throat> okay. Um, I think we're hearing that we do need to uh, have some edits, so I think the board is perfectly capable of meeting your deadlines as you laid them out. 
Um, so if we can, if someone wants to put this into a motion or I can, I can try though it's okay. So we're going to, um, thank you, director Brody. <laughs> I'd like to, um, uh, move that we approve staff recommendation, uh, number one and table staff recommendation number two, pending further revisions to the letter by the board members. Thank you. Is there a second? Thank you, Director Dutton. Sorry, Director Feld. Um, I always feel bad when there's two seconds. <laughs> um, any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, please indicate by saying nay. The motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you all so much. Uh, before you leave, Director Brody has an announcement. So just a quick announcement. Um, we are so honored and thrilled to have you all here uh, today and to be able to share our space uh, with the CWCB staff and board. And in honor of this occasion, uh, Aurora Water, Denver Water, and Hazen and Sawyer are hosting a reception just outside. So I hope you can all stick around for a few minutes, grab a drink, grab a bite, um, and just chat and mingle. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to go ahead and move that. Uh, um, wait. <laughs> till <Bye>. tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> Um, thank you for the reminder. Both of the items that we asked to move, including nine. Um, number nine, we're going to go ahead and put those at the beginning of the day prior to the basin directors reports.